Hello, and welcome to the Actual Tech Media Megacast. My name is Jess, and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information to cover with you. Let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. Now, if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Also, keep in mind that if you have any tech issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's megacast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all of your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentations. And if we do not get to your question during the webinar, don't worry, because the awesome experts that we have here with us today will be following up with you after we wrap. All right, next up on our tour, there are going to be lots of cool aha moments in the megacast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there in your audience console and the hashtag for today's megacast will automatically get added to your post. And our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection of solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. And if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes we will be giving away throughout the Megacast today. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. You do need to be in attendance here live at the webinar in order to qualify to win a prize, and we will follow up with all winners after we wrap the Megacast today. Now, all winners must submit an IRS Form W9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, hey, if you're not sure what those are, no problem. You can find the full T's and C's in that handouts tab. Again, just click into the handouts section, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find the full T's and C's waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember here today is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. In today's Megacast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all the questions asked after the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about winning and we will get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the Megacast today and we wanna keep that good feeling going. So let's connect on social. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and LinkedIn. We have lots of great content and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content right away after we wrap, you wanna jump right in, make sure that you subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and to grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or coworker to the Actual Tech Media webinar series. Now, you're gonna find a link to do that right there in that handouts tab, and you will also be automatically redirected after we wrap today. Now, both you and your coworker, your friend could win a prize, and we actually hold those drawings every month. So be sure you refer somebody awesome before you head out today. It could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab and fill out the application. Then the actual tech crew will match you with some vendors that we think you should be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you can choose to join in, like surveys or test running new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you will learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply or, hey, send that link to a decision maker in your team. Now, I want to take a quick minute here to remind you about one of my favorite resources, and that is ransomware.org. You can find everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, how to prevent and recover. This site is jam packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. So go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books are gonna work on your Kindle, your mobile device, and they are completely free, super easy. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide, and there's a link for you in the handouts tab as well. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of important things already, and I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get rolling. All right, folks. Well, it is time to jump right into the good stuff here today because we are talking about devising cloud strategies and solutions. This is going to be a truly exciting day because not only do we have an absolutely all-star lineup of presenters for you, we are talking about cloud. We're talking strategy, optimization, scalability, innovations. I mean, literally just all of the best things, right, in one day. We're going to be hearing from top experts at Rubrik, AppDynamics, Nutanix, Palo Alto Networks, Gigamon, Cisco, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Lacework, Okta, and precisely these innovative humans and industry leaders are going to help us explore some of the most exciting tools and solutions in the cloud ecosystem, which means that wherever your organization is at in your cloud journey, so maybe it's early days for you, maybe you're just getting started, or maybe you are all in and you're enhancing and building, but there is going to be something for you in the conversation today. Now, if you notice from that lineup of speakers, it is also going to be a big day, lots of presentations ahead. So I hope that you all have you know, stretched out a little bit, stand up right now, shake it out, get, get all the wiggles out for a bit there. Uh, make sure you've got your coffee with you, your tea, whatever you've got on the go, and then settle in for a day that is going to be absolutely packed with cool tips and takeaways. You're not going to want to miss a minute of it. So like I said, get, get all those wiggles out now as we get rolling here. All right, well, if I haven't met you already, let me reintroduce myself. My name is Jess Steinbach. I'm a moderator here at Actual Tech Media. And my fellow moderator, Scott Becker, is going to be joining us just a little bit on here. And Keith Ward is with us on live chat. So you've got the whole awesome crew. Now, speaking of awesome, I do want to talk to you about prizes because I said I would come back to those. So, dun, 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 prizes. Today on the Megacast, you could win one of five Kindle scribes. Just imagine all the strategizing, all the cool strategies you could build on that new Kindle Scribe. So get excited for those. And if that wasn't enough, we also have a $300 Amazon gift card that we will be giving away every 30 minutes to some lucky winners who are here live and present with us at the Megacast. Now, as I mentioned in the housekeeping chat this morning, you can find the full T's and C's, those full terms and conditions, linked for you in the handout tab. So if you have any questions about whether or not you qualify for a prize, please feel free to go check that out. All right, well, with that, we are all set with our housekeeping. We're ready to get rolling on this mega cast. I can't wait. Uh, because, as you can see, to start us out here, we have a keynote speaker who, let's be honest, in this cloud fan club that we have here with us today, really needs no introduction. And that is Ned Bellavance, Ned in the Cloud, Plural Site author and MVP. All right, Ned, I know you have some hot tips, your, your top three, in fact, for success to give to our audience today. So let's jump right into that. Take it away, Ned. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining today. I'm Ned Bellavance, nedinthecloud.com, and today I wanted to talk about three tips I think are essential to a successful cloud strategy. Now, I've been working in the cloud since about 2015, more or less, and in consulting since 2013. So I've seen a lot of companies attempt to make the transition. And here's what I've learned. First and foremost, applications are paramount when it comes to planning your strategy. As you think about adopting cloud native technology, whether that's on or off premises, you need to consider how you can best serve the needs of your applications. This is a shift in thinking for many organizations who are traditionally limited by the infrastructure available in their local data center. When all we had was bare metal, the applications needed to fit on that bare metal server. As we introduced virtual machines, applications now had more freedom, but they were still bound by that virtual machine unit. With cloud native technology, 
we, we have so many more options when it comes to infrastructure, from containers to serverless to managed services, and now the rise of WebAssembly. There are so many more options for deploying your applications effectively. But that means it's time to go back to the application owners and reassess what they need. Now, that's not to imply that every application you have should be suddenly transformed into a microservices distributed architecture running on Kubernetes. Far from it. One of the teams at Amazon Prime Video recently moved their stream monitoring application from a microservices architecture to a monolith because it was a better fit for that application. That's neither a condemnation of microservices and serverless, nor an endorsement of monolith applications. The teams assessed their application performance, determined the best architecture based on the data, and they were able to easily shift to different infrastructure because of the flexibility offered in the cloud. The point is, you need to consider the application first and then find the best fit for that application. Cloud simply gives you the freedom to pick what's best. Speaking of what's best, when you are designing a cloud strategy, it's important to be aware that every decision you make is a trade-off. Sometimes you're trading off cost for performance, or performance for security, or security for ease of use. There's no way around most of these trade-offs, but it's critical to understand the trade-off that you're making. For instance, when I was doing a lot of consulting, I would constantly run into folks who feared vendor lock-in with the cloud. They didn't want to consume the native services of AWS or Azure or GCP due to a fear that they would then be locked into that cloud. So instead, they would build their own services on top of the cloud provider's native IaaS infrastructure using an open source project like Kubernetes. Now, there's nothing wrong inherently with that approach. And if your priority is the portability of your application, it might make sense. But bear in mind, you're making a trade-off here. You're trading the ease of use of a managed service for the portability of your application. You're also trading the cost of the managed service for the cost of the infrastructure you're running on, including the cost of operations to maintain and manage it and you're trading the security of the managed service for the security of your own infrastructure that, again, you're going to have to manage yourself. Not only all that, but if you're forcing everything into Kubernetes, you're also forcing an architecture for your applications to meet the goal of portability, and that might impact performance and scalability. Again, that's not necessarily a bad thing if portability is the most important factor for you. But if you're simply doing it because you're afraid of vendor lock-in, you're making a trade-off that might not be worth it. If your application runs slower and you end up losing a competitive advantage, then all the portability in the world won't matter when you go out of business. The last tip I have is something I care deeply about, and it's an issue that I have also seen time and again in my consulting career. You need to invest in your people. I've seen so many companies that are willing to spend thousands or millions of dollars on cloud infrastructure, but they won't spend to train their own people. And that's a huge mistake. There's a quote, and I'm probably going to mangle it, but it goes something like this. Manager one, what if we train our people and they leave? Manager two, what if we don't and they stay? Hmm. So even if you hire consultants to devise and implement your cloud strategy, when they're done and that project is closed, someone will need to keep the lights on. New applications will arise, existing ones will mature and change, and you'll need to adapt. You could bring in consultants every time for a hefty fee. I know I charged a decent chunk. Or you could try and farm out your operations team to a managed service provider. But trust me when I say that investing in your own people is the best way to ensure your cloud strategy is successful in the long term. The highest functioning teams I've worked with have all been in organizations that took training and lifetime learning seriously. And it makes sense. Technology doesn't exactly stand still. AI is all the rage right now. 
WebAssembly is making serious inroads, and I've heard something about vector databases that I definitely do not understand, at least not yet. My point being, technology isn't going to stand still, and you need to give your people the time to learn and grow. And I don't mean sending them to a training once a year for a few days. I mean a regular amount of time carved out of their scheduler, schedule to learn and experiment. Time that is interruption free and not treated as a chance to squeeze in some other activities or work. It's dedicated time to learn and to grow. After all, your cloud strategy is only as good as the people executing it. The best laid plans will fail if no one can implement them. And even then, plans need to adapt and change over time. So invest in the success of your people and they will invest in you. That wraps up my three tips for a successful cloud strategy. They aren't the only ingredients, but I believe they are some of the most important. Applications are paramount. Everything is a trade-off and invest in your people. I hope you found this useful and I'd love to hear your feedback. Ping me on LinkedIn and let me know what you think. Thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of today's event. Well, thanks, Ned. I know that we will. And thank you for starting us out on such a great note here. I love that point, especially that last thing when he was talking about people uh, and, and really making sure that your team knows that when they're in that training, that's what they're there to do. It's not, it's not shoehorning it in in between other tasks and they've got one eye on you know, their email inbox and one eye on their training. And, and one of the things, I know it's tough when it's virtual too, and, and I'm willing to bet that a lot of you out there have you know, 15 additional tabs open in addition to this webinar, and I get that. <laughs> I really do. I hope that more often than not, your eyes are on our tab, but I know how busy things are. But when it comes to training and really giving yourself the opportunity for those learning moments, you know, I think it is really important to remind yourself that that is your job in that moment uh, and, and that nothing else is as important as paying attention, really getting what you can out of that one hour or two hours or whatever it is or 10 minutes that you're giving yourself to learn. So whether that's through training at your organization or because you're here with us, if this is the time that you've allocated to learn something, I hope that you do give yourself at least some chunks of the day today to really be 100% focused, if not all of it. But we'll, we'll, shoot for, we'll shoot for chunks of full attention, if not all. Uh, so that's your, that's your goal for the, for the day today. Find some time in our megacast here to really make time, make space for that learning. All right, well, a few of you have already figured this out, but you can see up on the screen here that we have a poll, and what we're looking for is what is the timeline that you are looking to make changes in your organization? Again, no wrong answers here. We're just curious where you're at. It helps us know what kind of speakers we should be bringing in, what kind of topics we should be bringing in at what time, um, because if more people are in sort of the early days phases versus the, the later days phases, then we'll try to make sure that we're getting you the information that you need. All right, so take a second now, click on that poll while you're doing that. And I want to say I'm seeing a few people chiming in. Uh, Venkat, I agree, always nice to hear from Ned. Uh, and Harold saying, so important to allow for training time. I completely agree with you, Harold. Uh, it really is something that I think often gets overlooked and makes a huge difference in the, in the success uh, of our teams, but also in how we feel as individuals, right? People like to learn things. We like to be informed. You know, things get stale if we don't stir them up a little bit sometimes in our brains. So uh, again, glad that you're all here getting that learning with us today. Speaking of which, let's move things right along. Let's get into some learning here uh, and start things out in our megacast. So I am very excited to introduce you all to our first, first of many expert presenter here today. And as you can see from the screen, we are in for a fantastic start. Now to kick things off on the megacast today, we will be chatting with Bill Gerling, go-to-market tech manager at Rubrik. Bill, so great to have you back here with us at the Megacast again. It is always a, a good time when we get to chat with you. I can't wait to hear what's up at Rubrik. So, Bill, I'm going to hand things right on over to you. Take it away. Hey, y'all. My name is Bill Gerling. Uh, as David said, I'm a technical product manager here at Rubrik. And today uh, we are going to talk about uh, the journey to the cloud, uh, hybrid cloud architectures, and how um, data protection can kind of act as a force multiplier as opposed to, to a boat anchor in these environments. Uh, so what I'm going to cover today is sort of how we got here, the, you know, the, the, the impetus for the, for the journey to the public cloud. I'm going to talk about some patterns in public cloud adoption, um, both migration patterns and architecture patterns that are pretty common. 
And then I'm going to talk uh, briefly about data protection, uh, how these patterns and sort of these uh, these value props that drive folks to the cloud uh, may apply to data protection efforts, and uh, how uh, we feel, you know, if we here at Rubrik feel like you can get more out of your data protection assets, especially in uh, multi-cloud and hybrid cloud architectures. So to begin with, uh, let's start with how did we get here, right? Why do folks adopt uh, public cloud platforms uh, to start with? So oftentimes uh, you will hear uh, the, you know, sort of the, the manufacturers, supporters of these platforms uh, advertise that uh, you can get speed to market very, very rapidly out of these platforms. They're API driven, ubiquitous resources that can be provisioned sort of on demand and, and readily and quickly available to you. Similarly, uh, those resources are available uh, across the globe, right? Uh, the smallest of small companies, a teenager in their basement even, developing an application can deploy that application globally on one of these public cloud platforms uh, with little to no effort. Scale is also important because scale brings resiliency and scale also brings cost economics. And so being able to take advantage of the scale of these platforms in some capacity offers up big benefits to smaller shops or even mid-sized shops these days. Uh, resilient, resiliency tends to come with scale, right? So you look at uh, like S3 as a service, for instance, uh, 11 nines, uh, that's pretty dang resilient and hard to reproduce on your own. And then pay as you go. Uh, the OPEX billing model, the sort of utility billing model can certainly be useful and it can reduce costs. There's the, uh, the asterisk on the end of that because you definitely need to be well architected and prepared to, uh, to architect these platforms to really get the, uh, the cost benefit out of it. Moving on. Let's talk about uh, the shared responsibility model. So in, uh, in these public cloud platforms, uh, while they are sort of architected, deployed, and maintained by the various providers, uh, it is a shared responsibility. And that means that as a consumer of these platforms, whether you're consuming uh, you know, SaaS, IaaS, PaaS, uh, some other <laughs> hybrid flavor, uh, at some level of the stack, you gotta take ownership for your resources. And most importantly, almost always uh, data protection is your responsibility. And so there's this, there's this constant dichotomy where you sort of trade, uh, you trade off responsibility to the cloud provider, typically in exchange for cost. But at some level, uh, there's consensus here across the big three that, that you know, you're responsible for protecting your own data. And that can be accomplished through a number of vectors, right? It can be accomplished with, uh, can be accomplished with, with native services. It can be accomplished with third-party services. It can be accomplished with sort of a, a heterogeneous mixture of the two. And, uh, you know, hybrid and multi-cloud is, uh, is almost inevitable. So this is, a, this is a quote that I like to use from an analyst who I, I follow and I, I like to read. Lydia, she's, she's super sharp. And uh, the, the premise here is that, uh, that multi-cloud is uh, sort of this lumbering gelatinous cube that is, uh, that is attacking organizations, right? And, and they've, they've essentially got the choice whether to plan for the attack and, and have a strategy to sort of adopt uh, multiple clouds and the hybrid cloud architectures, or they can they can kid themselves and and uh, and sort of let it happen organically as as this thing <laughs> eclipses them. And so uh, the point here being, don't be afraid of being hybrid. Don't be afraid of being multi-cloud. It it sort of comes organically in some capacity to everyone, and it's best it's best kind of to attack it on the front end through rigorous planning, dependency mapping, um, org structures, et cetera. And so that's what gets us into the, kind of the journey of the public cloud, right? Uh, we've talked kind of about the drivers and uh, and the fact that uh, that hybrid or, or, or multi-cloud may be some sort of in inevitability. But but how do we how do we adopt these platforms? How do we migrate to these platforms? What sort of patterns do I see in the wild? Um, and first, we're getting applications up into the platform to begin with. So this is predicated on the assumption customers got some workloads in the data center. I want to take some of those workloads. I want to put them put them in a public cloud platform, right? And so, uh, so this is actually this is actually a uh, an example of uh, the six R's from uh, Amazon, where they have a bunch of different paths that you can take in order to uh, move an application into their their cloud platform. And so, number one is rehosting, right? And so, this is probably uh, familiar to most: lifting and shifting the application in its current state into a cloud platform. Uh, generally speaking, you're thinking VMs here usually. Uh, another option would be replatforming, or otherwise known as tinker and shifting. Right, so the canonical example here is taking a database that's uh, in a VM or on a server on-prem and sticking it in a PaaS offering. Uh, repurchasing, I'm calling it SASifying because oftentimes SaaS is the is the alternative to you know the current application implementation. So you could think of this as maybe 
deciding that you're just going to migrate exchange into into O365 and buy a new offering to support uh, your collaboration efforts there. Uh, Rearchitecting, refactoring. This is actually peeling back layers of the application and, and building the application for a cloud native architecture. Um, so think taking like a monolith, decomposing it into microservices, maybe containerizing components of the application and putting it on a cloud platform. I'm calling this one the right way because it gets you all that agility. It gets you all of that, uh, the, you know, the cost efficiencies that, uh, that you're typically striving for in these platforms. And then uh, there's other options that are less migration-y and more just, uh, uh, you know, get rid of it or, or do nothing. So number one is retire. The application is going to go away anyhow. So maybe we just decide to decommon at some inflection point. And then lastly, uh, retaining, I call it sweet, sweet business as usual. And, uh, you know, you're going to likely have existing investments in some sort of infrastructure application architecture uh, outside of these migration efforts. And if those are sunk costs and the apps are running well, maybe you decide business as usual is okay uh, for the time being. The net of it is that uh, this approach is kind of the easy one. It's very, very simple to lift and shift VMs into the cloud platform. But this approach is what I'm going to call Nirvana. It's uh, the way to kind of squeeze good to the last drop out of your cloud pl platform. And almost always, there's a litany of these, these approaches employed uh, during a migration effort. So how do we bridge the gap? You know, how do, we, uh, how do we begin to prepare for cloud migration while not sort of over committing ourselves and, and foregoing uh, business as usual and keeping the lights on? These are some things that you can do when you go to adopt a uh, public cloud strategy. And you can begin doing them today in the data center and they're really, really good ways to kind of hedge and prepare for uh, cloud implementation or a cloud migration effort. Number one uh, piece of advice that I have is always start with visibility. Uh, you've had a lot of folks on the Ecocast today that can, that can help you with that. And that means uh, discovering and documenting not only your infrastructure and your applications and their dependencies, but also any third-party services that might be in scope, uh, managed services, so on and so forth. Also, you're going to want to create a plan to adopt cloud services. So that means that means having sort of a sort of a, a defined approach and, and decision-making process for deploying workloads onto various platforms for deciding what platforms uh, might be used, what, what sort of echelon or level of services might be used and supported. Uh, having, having a plan and a framework for making these decisions is very, very important. Otherwise, things are just going to kind of land where they land. Developers are going to stick stuff somewhere. Application teams are going to stick stuff elsewhere, and you're going you're gonna to end up sort of organically uh, sprawling. Build a team of stakeholders focused on cloud adoption strategy and governance, right? So we don't, we don't want to sprawl. We want to have a plan. You have to have the right people involved in building and executing the plan or else they will circumvent the plan. Uh, strive to be well architected out of the cloud. So outside of the cloud, I should say, outside of the public cloud. So there's these well architected frameworks from the public cloud providers. Um, they typically have five pillars. I'll show it on a future slide here, uh, examples. And uh, looking at those frameworks and some of the operating models and sort of technology deployment uh, lifecycle and management models that, that they suggest is a great way to prepare yourself to be cloudy. Because if you start doing infrastructure as code, if you start doing CI, CD, if you start, um, you know, instrumenting telemetry everywhere in your processes, then when you go to adopt the cloud platform, it's almost going to feel seamless because they're built for these operating models. Uh, and then once you've sort of achieved the above stuff, you can find low-hanging fruit, right? So uh, find easy projects where you can stick workloads in the cloud and begin to familiarize yourself. Typically, these are low-impact workloads with low complexity that, uh, that lets you get your feet wet with a high degree of comfort. And don't be afraid to experiment. If you've got cool projects, new applications, whatever, like once you've got the governance and the decision-making frameworks in place, uh, the cloud is meant to, to be a place where you can try new things, fail fast, and back them out if something goes wrong. Hybrid is the new normal. Uh, if you've got existing infrastructure investments, they don't all have to go in the trash just because you're using a cloud platform as well. Uh, even, even the big three have sort of acknowledged uh, that hybrid architectures are very, very common and will be for some time. Of course, they encourage wider adoption of their platforms. But uh, if you've got applications that run well, that are in a data center that's, that's well, well run, um, and you've got existing investments in skill sets and technology, don't be afraid to, to use both approaches. So where does data protection play relative to being well-architected? Uh, there's more to it, but I like to throw these bullets up there just because um, they were the ones that immediately came to mind while I was building these slides, and uh, they're fun things to talk about. So number one, defining requirements. Uh, from a data protection perspective, this is RPO and RTO. You know, know, know what applications uh, consist of what components, how they're dependent on one another, and what the RPO and RTO for each of these applications is. 
Uh, build flexible and automated deployment capabilities. So this is more sort of riffing on automation, CI, CD, Empress code, all of that. Uh, instrument for visibility everywhere. So it's way easier to build visibility when you start building a process than it is to back visibility into a process that's already been established. A lot of times you may think, uh, I'll work that in later on. It's most important that I get the core functionality out the door today. But uh, certain types of technical debt can be really, really difficult to uh, to make up. And, and instrumenting for visibility when the process is simple is something that I would highly suggest. Uh, plan and design for failure and re respond to failures and disasters kind of go hand in hand here, right? Like things will fail. Uh, you do have some responsibility when things fail to your customers, internal or external or both. And so having a plan for failure scenarios is, is sort of uh, table stakes, right? We talk about chaos engineering in the cloud all the time because we want to plan and design for failures. Then account management separation comes into play all the time uh, because uh, less mature cloud consumers may think they only need, you know, one cloud account or one subscription or, or what have you. But in all honesty, it's probably the most logical boundary right now from an identity and access management standpoint. And so it's, it's often the case where you see a cloud account for uh, each application team or maybe two or three for each application team so that they can have test and dev and prod and what have you. So let's talk about uh, Let's talk about data protection in the cloud and, and why it's it's tricky, especially in hybrid architectures. You've got all these silos here. Uh, these silos on the left, the, the remote office, the managed uh, data center, and the private cloud, those are probably pretty familiar. But you've also got you know now one or more, typically more cloud providers that you've also got to plan for how you're going to protect workloads there. Um, the policies tend to be different in the tooling that is sort of organic to each of these environments. Recovery can be a different process across these boundaries. Uh, Reporting and, and, and auditing can be very, very tricky because you end up having an ETL and normalize the data sets for reporting purposes. And then it, it gets exasperated when you zoom in. So you zoom in and you see that within each of these environments, there may even be fur further segmentation from a data management perspective. Um, you may have fragmented stuff in the data center for protecting various workloads there. Application teams doing things specific to their applications or their databases. Uh, folks on cloud teams running cloud native services or a hodgepodge of cloud native services and third party services to protect things that the cloud native services can't protect. And so what we say is, is that this is, this is a uh, not acceptable, right? Like operational backup and recovery is something that people feel like they, they need to have, but oftentimes don't even want to have to deal with. And that's just, that's just no way to live and no way to operate. And so what we say is let's simplify the stack. Let's, let's build, let's build an elegant modern data protection solution that is capable of traversing these boundaries that makes operational backup and recovery easy, and then that that adds uh, sort of an ancillary benefit of, of providing um, intelligence on top of your operational backup and recovery workflows. And you know that's that's what Rubrik is, is sort of here to position and represent today. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, first of all, we like to unify silos, right? So we are a single solution, a single pane of glass, and a single set of APIs for data protection on-prem, at the edge, and in the cloud. Uh, we protect workloads using what we call an SLA domain policy, which is, uh, which is a, a declarative policy or a policy document that just states RPO and RTO. How frequent would you like to uh, protect something? How long would you like to ret retain copies of that data? Uh, where would you like that data to live at various points in times? So when would you like protection to occur? So on and so forth. Uh, we offer up instant recovery uh, in the data center and then rapid orchestrated recovery for workloads uh, in the public cloud, instant recovery for certain workloads in the public cloud as well. And this is, uh, this is all driven through a simple, clean uh, UI with uh, API hooks underneath that you can latch into real easy. Uh, security, table stakes, right? Encryption in flight, encryption at rest, and uh, file system that, uh, that is immune to ransomware, so on and so forth. And then from a cloud perspective, just doing things natively and without infrastructure wherever you can, right? There are times that we need to employ uh, lift and shift models to protect certain workloads, but to, to be candid, uh, the, the vast majority of our cloud native only uh, API calls with, uh, with ephemeral workers whenever we need to run workers. And so we really, really strive when we operate in these environments to operate in a way that is, is native in terms of look and feel in each of these platforms. So what do we do? Uh, number one, uh, from a cloud perspective, protecting data center workloads, archiving that to a cloud platform for long-term retention. We've been doing this for a number of years now. We're quite good at it. Uh, we've got manners by which uh, we can extract cost, efi cost efficiencies from these workloads, manners by which we can uh, speed up, you know, uh, archive and recovery operations. 
and uh, it's it's really sort of a cornerstone of, of what we've been doing as a company in the data center since day one. Cloud instantiation, essentially listing and shifting uh, any VMs that may have been protected and archived as a part of the previous workflow that I described. This can be uh, this can be great for test dev, migration efforts, even as a component of a DR strategy. Uh, this is essentially a managed lift and shift of a vSphere VM or a Hyper-V VM into, into a, one of these public cloud platforms. And then as I just described, cloud native protection uh, through Polaris, our SAS control plane. Uh, this is our unified control plane where all of our capabilities are sort of uh, amalgamated together and presented to the end user. So uh, some things we do in pure SAS, right? The things that are cloudy and where it makes sense to do them in pure SAS. Some things we do uh, co-located with the workload with infrastructure, uh, for example, protecting on-premises virtual machines or physical servers. Uh, but then we, we sort of unify all this together in Polaris. And uh, Polaris is the control plane that, uh, with regards to cloud native protection, is responsible for uh, all of the, the operations, be it, uh, be it actual protection of things, recoveries, monitoring, reporting, et cetera, et cetera. It is, it is the, the brains of the operation when it comes to cloud native protection. As I mentioned, uh, with regards to cloud outs or the archive capability here, uh, this is something that we've been doing for quite a long time. Uh, it's incremental in nature, uh, data is encrypted before it's transmitted, metadata co-located in, in the archive. Uh, this is really just the best practices, sort of long-term retention in objects in the public cloud play. And it's something that uh, that we've sort of honed over over the years of producing it. Uh, we're good stewards of your bandwidth here. We are we are uh, we are always striving to do things as, as rapidly as possible through parallelism. And we are always uh, keeping things encrypted, both in flight and at risk in this, or excuse me, at rest in this architecture. With regards to the lift and shift, uh, like I said, it, it's sort of predicated on that archive workflow that I just described. It uses workers up in the in the cloud platform itself uh, to do incremental conversions and launches of VMs up into the cloud platform. So uh, the nice thing there is that we do have we do a first pull and then we can incrementally convert and launch uh, subsequent snapshots of the same virtual machine into the cloud. We can do this either automatically through policy or we can do it on demand. When we do it automatically through policy, we actually leave an image behind as opposed to a running VM. Uh, it's cheaper to store that. And then you can you know, instantiate from that image uh, at your leisure, either through rubric or organically through the cloud platform. And then cloud native protection. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, right? So we, uh, we do quick start here with automated account mapping and discovery. Uh, we orchestrate the creation of our service principles in sort of best practices manner. And then we automatically iterate workloads into our platform so that you can begin creating and assigning policies. Uh, our policies are declarative as stated before and can automatically be assigned to workloads as they're provisioned and built through tag rules or by assigning policies to whole accounts. They can also be assigned individually to workloads uh, as you see fit, either through our UI or our API. Uh, additionally, we've got, uh, you know, sort of orchestrated and rapid recovery is what I'll call it. So we can uh, replicate uh, across regions today. Uh, we can search within uh, cloud native snapshots and recover single files. Uh, we orchestrate recovery in place uh, for instances and we orchestrate recovery in place for volumes as well. Elastic compute. So when we do need to run compute in, the, in, in a customer's tenant for some reason, um, we seek to do so in an elastic and ephemeral way. And that's what this bullet means. Anytime compute is run, it is run temporarily, it uh, executes some sort of activity, and then it is torn down when that activity is done. Uh, this is converse to some other architectures that you may see in the space where uh, persistent compute is required running in the customer's tenant to protect workloads there. And then lastly, archiving your cloud. Uh, so, so in this architecture, everything that we do stays in your account or in your tenant. So this is the reason why we may run a worker there from time to time, because we are not in the data path in this architecture. Instead, we are just an orchestrator, a cataloger, a reporter, et cetera, et cetera. We're a control plane, a data manager. Uh, we're, not, we're not a storage uh, system, subsystem, and we, we don't really seek to be. Uh, instead, we seek to just use the best approach to manage operational backup and recovery, and then our ancillary capabilities. Uh, in whatever platform we're protecting. In the cloud, this, this is obviously uh, best suited uh, by API calls and platform native constructs. So yeah, just to kind of delve into the icing on the cake here, I know we've just got uh, one minute left, but essentially the, the net of it is, is that operational backup and recovery is the foundation for everything we do. We build a, a metadata ledger out of those operational backup and recovery activities. That metadata ledger allows us to build applications on top of the metadata that can add value 
uh, to your business and your organization outside of just backing workloads up and recovering when there's a failure. And the types of things that we can do here are pretty cool. Um, so we can do data protection, which is great since that's kind of how, how, what the company was founded on. But we can also run data governance workflows and, and detect whether or not data has spilled over some boundary by looking at backup metadata. Uh, we can run data assurance workflows or integrity workflows and ensure that uh, workloads haven't been impacted by ransomware. And if, we, if they have, then we can sort of identify that blast radius and help you orchestrate recovery. Uh, we can, you know, take data sets and, and move them across boundaries and rehydrate them into, into different architectures and things of that nature. Cloud on is an example, uh, being able to take on-premises databases off of physicals and stick them in IaaS is an example. So there's a lot of cool ways that we can move data around and allow you to get, get value out of these, these backups that are probably already going to a cloud repository somewhere anyway. And so that's kind of where the terminology comes from, where we call it, you know, multi-cloud data management or data control. Uh, we see ourselves as very, very good at operational backup and recovery, making that super simple for our customers, and then trying to build uh, intelligence and value on top of that. Uh, with that, I'm set. Bill, thank you so much. What a great presentation. Uh, lots of awesome information. And clearly the audience is enjoying it as well because we have a lot of uh, really exciting questions coming in. And I want to get to as many of those as we can. Uh, so, Bill, let's start with this one here. Now, you mentioned being well architected even before adopting cloud platforms. So, what are some of the techniques that you have seen employed to make that happen? Yeah, yeah. So, I, I think the whole idea of I, I come from an infrastructure background, so I'm going to give you so, sort of infrastructure guy centric answers to begin with. But I think the whole idea of of taking infrastructure deployment codifying it as code somehow, you know, take your weapon of choice. Uh, I'm a Terraform and Ansible guy personally, and, and sticking, you know, those templates in a repository with even some rudimentary CI CD workflows around them is, is a great way to get started. Um, it, can, it can begin as, as simple as when I build a VM or, or a set of VMs for an application, I build them in one template, and then I just commit that template to master and, and deploy that template uh, to my environment. Down the road, it can mature into a full pipeline of activities with uh, dev and test and prod and validations in between the gates and approval processes and, and what have you. And I think if you, can, if you can begin to sort of operate in that mode in the day-to-day -day and become comfortable with those technology stacks and those approaches to building and deploying infrastructure, then once you hit a cloud platform where, where they tend to be somewhat opinionated about elasticity and automation, you're going to find yourself in a much more comfortable position. Okay, some good advice. Uh, let's move on to our next question here. Uh, can Rubrics data protection policies be used across platforms or are different policies required for different platforms? Uh, they can be used across platforms. All right, short and sweet. Uh, let's get to our next question here. Uh, what sort of automation or infrastructure as a code tools do you see utilize when provisioning and managing cloud workloads at scale? Yeah, so I, I already uh, sort of alluded to, to what, what I personally use. Terraform is definitely an elf in the room. The, the HashiCorp folks are just absolutely incredible in that space. Uh, I like Ansible for configuration management. You know, you've got Puppet and Chef out there that play with Ansible. Uh, you've also you've also got uh, CloudFormation, Azure Resource Manager templates, sort of in the Terraform space. So again, I, I sort of come from more of an infrastructure-centric background, so I tend to think about building infrastructure and VMs. Um, but then, as far as CI tools that I that I see out in the wild, like like very very common. Again, this is my opinion, and less so the company line. But uh, I, I personally I like to use GitLab. Uh, we've got a Jenkins environment, which is which is pretty widely utilized. Uh, Circle CI is another one that's pretty easy to get started with. Um, all of them, because of the way that this community kind of works today, all of them tend to be some open source and widely documented and pretty accessible. I would say find an infrastructure provisioning tool that you like, find a configuration management tool that you like, uh, find some sort of source control, and find a CI tool, and, and just, just you know, start off and run in, in, in the test environment. All right. Well, I think we are just about out of time now, but before we let you go, for anyone out there that wants to get started, they're ready to jump in with Rubrik, they want to learn more, what do you recommend as that first step? Yeah, obviously our website, uh, www.rubrik.com. There's also a, a sort of a micro site that we have. It is build.rubrik.com. So that's B as in Bravo, U as in Uniform, I as in India, L as in Lima, 
uh, D is in Delta, build.rubric.com. And that uh, houses all of our integrations, our SDKs, um, you know, infrastructure as code examples, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I would, I would check out the website, um, check out more events like this, check out build.rubric.com. And then as always, don't be afraid to reach out to local account teams or folks that are active on social media. We're all super friendly and passionate about what we do and would love to talk. Well, that's awesome. Uh, and we've definitely enjoyed talking with you today, Bill. Thank you so much for making the time to be here with us, sticking around to answer some audience questions. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Have a great day. All right. Well, and now we have some questions back for all of you out there. You got to ask some questions of Bill, and now it's your turn. What additional information would you like to get about the rubric solution? So there's lots of great info to, that we got today, lots more to follow up on. Um, and Bill just gave you some great kind of next steps and ways to learn a little bit more. An easy one right now is just to click on that poll. Let Rubric know what they can send your way, what they can put in your email inbox directly uh, so that you don't even have to do any digging and it just comes right to you. So click on that poll. Let them know how you would like uh, to be followed up with after we wrap today. I'm also going to suggest if you haven't already done so that you go over to the handouts tab. Make sure you download the white paper, Zero Trust for Microsoft Environments. Now, if you've been with us on previous events, you know that I love anything and everything Zero Trust. It is such an interesting approach, strategy, philosophy, whatever. It's all cool, uh, and this is a really neat read. So make sure that you've downloaded that, check that out, hang on to that for later. While you are asking questions, clicking on polls, and downloading handouts, I am going to give away a prize. This is our very first prize giveaway of the day. Now, I'll remind you that you do need to be here live and present in order to win. All right, so our first $300 Amazon gift card is going to Robert Max of Georgia. Robert Max of Georgia, you have won a $300 Amazon gift card, and we will be reaching out to you after we wrap. Congratulations to you, Robert. Uh, stay tuned. Lots more prizes to win ahead, so uh, fingers crossed for all of you out there. And there's that best question gift card from each of our sessions. So keep those questions coming in because again, we're evaluating all those questions asked after we wrap. So even if we don't get to your question live during a Q&A session, you're still entered to win that. So keep those questions rolling in. And I know that you are going to have a whole bunch of questions lined up and ready for this next presenter because we are about to jump into a very interesting conversation. So on that note, let me introduce our next awesome presenter here at the Megacast. Uh, a really cool expert who's going to be talking to us about what's up at App Dynamics, and that is, of course, Sunny Dua, Director of Product Management. Sunny, thank you so much for joining us here today. I am very much looking forward to getting into some of the exciting things that are happening at App Dynamics, uh, and I know we want to leave some time for questions. So, uh, without any further ado, Sunny, I will hand things right on over to you. Take it away. Thank you so much, Jess. Uh, I truly appreciate uh, you guys giving us time to talk about what we are doing here at Cisco App Dynamics so that our customers and, uh, the, and the cloud strategies they're making can really turn out to be extremely fruitful for them. So hi, everyone. My name is Sunny Dua. Uh, as just mentioned, I'm the Director of Product Management uh, here at Cisco App Dynamics. Uh, today, I'm going to take you through our journey of observability and talk uh, specifically around um, why are people devising cloud strategies, right? Why do they need clouds? And then at the end of the day, if you think about cloud, it is not a strategy per se. It's a plug to make sure that your overall strategy of digital transformation works. So I will take a twist to the story and talk about, yes, cloud is important. However, the most important thing is the digital experiences which you provide to your end users um, for, from your businesses. And that essentially makes it important that you have the right cloud strategy and you are able to uh, do backups or do observability, right? You heard about backups or rubric. I'll just take another twist to it to talk about what is important uh, or why it is important to have Hawkeye into your cloud infrastructure uh, right from your business transactions where your user are, users are interacting or your customers are interacting with your business applications down to the last piece of infrastructure which is driving everything for you. Um, at Cisco, um, we basically have been working on this vision of building full stack observability, and I'll be talking about why that is critical and how we are doing it. And at the end of the, the session, I'll also 
be brave and try a live demo. And if the demo gods are happy, uh, we'll see some things in action as well. Right, so I talked about um, applications. I talked about digital experiences. And I, I believe every country I go to today, whether it's, it's a first world country or a country which is developing, I've seen that applications are taking over. Right? Uh, last I was reading from one of the, one of the analysts, I, I saw a stat which was stunning, which talked about around 500 million applications which we will be built to support the digital transformation over the next few years. I mean, if you just think about 10 years ago, how many apps were there? I think net zero. Uh, there were not even smartphones uh, who were allowing you to have apps. So just within the matter of 10 years or so, you see at least 100 to 200 to 500 apps on your phone, depending upon how, how much time you spend on screen. And this is just not stopping. It's continuing to evolve. And it is important because these digital transformations which are happening are making digital as the first KPI or the new business KPI. The experience is the new business KPI. So while we all think about performance, availability, uh, compliance, and so on and so forth as KPIs of the infrastructure or the applications, at the end of the day, they're just there to serve this digital experience. And to me, digital experience is the key KPI which we need to optimize for to ensure that we are able to provide what our customers need at the end of the day. Now, if you think about digital experiences, um, they are provided through applications, applications which are the front door to your businesses. So any business which is trying to capture a wider audience of customers beyond the people who will walk into their stores, and you know that this is today every business, either making, making sure that people are walking to their stores or making sure that they're able to sell uh, whatever services or products they have to offer over a digital experience, it is critical that they're able to provide applications. And applications over a period of time, and I remember five years ago I was on, a, on, on this uh, platform talking about how application modernization is happening. Five years later, today, we all know that applications are being built and they are being rapidly evolved in terms of moving away from monoliths uh, to becoming a microservices-based application. And they're not just running in the cloud or public cloud per se. And the definition of cloud itself has changed, which started with just AWS. Now there are multiple public clouds, multiple service providers which are hosting, uh, multiple private clouds which have evolved, which, are, which have copied or emulated what a public cloud does. And then you've seen the power of compute being becoming micro and moving towards the edge and IoT devices as well. So because of that movement, applications are no longer just sitting in a box or in a cloud or in a location, but they're distributed. They're distributed and they are complex. And the bigger part of this complexity is that if these applications or the observability of these applications do not provide you a business context as to what is more critical for your business or the end user experience, then it becomes extremely hard to focus on what or prioritize what issues you want to take care of first, right? And while we talked about the, um, the emergence of DevOps, right? Um, IT shifting left, and developers shifting left and so on and so forth. Um, what has really happened is that you've got some new names to these teams. However, the practices are still not evolved completely. And there are reasons for that. And we went around talking to our customers to understand why your operations are still siloed. You have app ops, dev ops, sec ops, infra ops, net ops, and so on and so forth. Why are they so siloed? And what is causing them to be siloed? And while your applications and the landscape of your infrastructure is kind of commingling and merging, applications are no longer just Java applications running on a server, but they might be running on a serverless environment, which means that, um, for instance, Lambda functions become a part of your application. They're no longer a separate infrastructure thing like a VM, right? Now, with that, this context, when we go out to customers, we hear a lot of different stories. And I would like to kind of share some of those anecdotes today with you, right? In terms of what's happening, they talk about that when it comes to observability, uh, there's a lot of complexity. 
there is data overload, there are tools, sprawls, and there is a lot of friction between the teams. And just by looking at these numbers, this is a recent study which we did, we see that 56% of um, companies or organizations um, have more than 10 observability or monitoring tools. And in some organizations, uh, the usual answer when you ask them, what all tools do you use? They say, you name, them and you name that and we have it, right? So you, you will see uh, some of your organizations uh, facing the same problem. Even with that sprawl, right, um, what they are seeing is that only 60% or 60% of them say that even with all these tools together, we are still not able to get that last mile view which serves the use case of full stack observability or visibility telling us what's happening to our digital experience of a customer and where does the problem lies across the entire stack, whether it's in the cloud infrastructure or in the application landscape. And then at the same time, there are so many tools that you are struggling with collection of data, lifecycle management, you are struggling with transformation of data, and you're struggling with storing that data, and data storage in the cloud is becoming more and more expensive as well from a perspective of the growth of the data, the velocity of the data, and the amount of data which is being collected. And when we look at all of this, we still do not have a correlated view of all of this data together, and humans have to build that correlation in their brain uh, in order to ensure that they're able to get a context to troubleshoot or observe something. Now, these are all challenging experiences of the IT and operational teams who are trying to provide that best digital experience uh, to that end user who's trying to order that pizza on the phone. Now, imagine what the internal teams are going through in order to make sure your pizza comes out hot. And if you are getting a bad experience as an end user, you know that what could be one of the main causes um, of that experience being bad, right? So constantly CIOs, CEOs are thinking about how do I optimize internally so that I can provide the best experience externally? And today I'm gonna to talk about uh, a concept which we have been talking about at Cisco over the last couple of years, which is called full stack observability. A holistic visibility and analysis of applications infrastructure, user experience, and security, which empowers organizations to optimize for performance, enhance reliability, and ensure that they're able to deliver those exceptional digital experiences, which ultimately results in the success of the business. Right? That to us is the definition of full stack observability. Now, you may say that, okay, that sounds really, really far-fetched and uh, like Star Wars, how do you make it possible? And what exactly is Cisco doing or anybody can do in order to make it possible? What we have seen um, from an observability standpoint or talking to customers day in, day out, is that the only way to break down these silos is to help connect these silos with a common data model. The only way to deliver the application experience which you want to deliver to your end users, it cannot be that it's seen through a single lens of just observability, but you have to also bring in the lens of network. You have to bring in the lens of security. And network security and observability together comes and provides that unified experience which helps all the personas serve the end user and the digital experience their organization wants to do. In order to do that, it's critical that you're able to collect data from multiple operations domain and provide real-time insights for those user experiences. If I was in a room right now asking people, how many of your uh, organizations or how many of these are, are, are in your company have tried, how many of you in your company have tried building a common data lake where you can push all the data and then draw insights from that data? I bet you nine out of 10 in a room will raise their hands because I talk to customers day in, day out. And since none of the vendors have solved this problem for them in a cost-effective way, they look at building something in-house. And that building something in-house sounds like a very sexy project when you start, but very quickly you realize that you're deviating from your what, 
what your main business is and trying to build an observability capability, which is not easy. I mean, we over here have thousands of engineers trying to build this thing out and we know how challenging it could be. So it's not simple that so a customer can make this their primary business and build it out. And hence, what we have been working on over the last couple of years, something which is called the Cisco FSO platform, Cisco Full Stack Observability Platform. And when we look at building a platform, after talking to multiple customers, we've realized that there are certain key characteristics which are critical with, uh, for a platform. The first uh, and foremost, what is critical is it has to be open. So it has to be built on a foundation which is open to get and collect data from different sources uh, and not limit to what a vendor can build in terms of collection. The second thing uh, and the second key premise, is, as, they call it, as I call it, is it has to be extensible, uh, which essentially means that a customer who's trying to use this platform to meet their observability needs is not locked in by the capabilities of a vendor who's trying to build solutions for them. But the platform itself is extensible in various ways that they are able to extend it and leverage the ecosystem as well as their own developers to build what they want to build in order to meet that last mile use case, which none of the tools out there do. The third uh, is scalable. I don't have to explain scalable when we are talking about cloud uh, because we all need cloud scale and, and hence we have to build on a platform which can scale itself. And last, it has to be flexible. Uh, and of course, flexible, extensible sounds similar, but the flexibility is not just around uh, um, adding new things, but also to be able to visualize those things in the way you want. So it's not just a layer of data modeling, but also the UI components, which should serve your users as they come into the platform to experience what they want to experience, right? And again, cutting across business network application security infrastructure and cloud. So we are not just talking about cloud here, but the foundation of that cloud is built to ensure that you can build everything on top to ultimately help the business, which includes networks, which includes applications, which includes security and so on and so forth. So with that premise in mind, we built the Cisco FSO platform. And I'm very happy to share that um, last week at Cisco Live Las Vegas, uh, Cisco Live 2023 uh, at Las Vegas, we actually made a general availability of this platform. And usually when platforms are launched, um, you would basically uh, want to create a platform effect, which means you need demand and supply, right? Um, in, in case of an observability platform, the demand, of course, comes from customers in terms of what all they want to observe. And in terms of supply, it comes from the vendor who's trying to build different solutions for observability. What you see in blue over here, right, highlighted in blue, are all different set of use cases which we have solved through Cisco build applications and modules. And what you see on orange over here is a huge testament of the fact that we are we build an extensible platform where our partners are able to jump in and even before the GA of the platform, they have built solutions and they are now available for our customers to consume um, across sustainability, AI ops, and so on and so forth. Right? So my point over here is that ultimately the platform itself is built on open telemetry, which ensures that it gives you a single place to ingest metrics, events, logs, traces. It's able to correlate this data with real-time insights. And it's able to trans collect data only once, which means when you're using open telemetry as a standard for collection, you're using a single collector which can be picked up from open source market, collecting that data once, transforming it once, and storing it in one backend so that you can get rid of multiple tools multiple collectors and multiple agents to manage. And once that data is transformed and kept in a single store, you can start building different use cases through applications which you see over here. And then start extending those applications by using the extensibility of the platform. Um, now, I will quickly touch upon the extensibility of the platform, but I would love to kind of go into a live demo as well. I know my time is short here. 
So the extensibility of a platform essentially means that as a customer or as a partner, I'm able to add a new use case or a adjacent use case on top of what you already have to meet that last mile need. Uh, let me give you a single, simple example of what and how. Um, for instance, if you're a bank and you have certain payment um, trans or transaction trading applications, uh, which are ultimately being used by your users uh, on their cell phones or at the point of sale uh, a, at your bank, right? So if you have a bank and you have tellers and each of your bank branch uh, has those systems. Now, you want to make sure that you're able to correlate uh, your the footfall on your bank branch with the um, tellers uh, or the telling machines which you have with the applications running in a public cloud or a private cloud or hybrid cloud. And what is the interdependencies of availability of those applications and performance of those applications with the footfall in the branch, right? And obviously you want to optimize because you don't want to hire a bunch of people uh, to serve so many customers and you don't want to give a bad experience to those customers who are coming to your bank branch. It should be served as soon as possible. Now, usually if you pick up, and, uh, pick up a tool from market and say, I want to observe applications, you find one tool to observe applications, one tool to observe infrastructure, a separate tool to probably model your bank, if you can, I don't know if that's possible, or to monitor the point of sale systems or applications which are running there, right? So you have various different domains and each of them come with different tools. And you may or may not even find the last mile of modeling all your bank branches which might be running across the United States and you have 5,000 of those with 10 tellers in each of those branch. How do you model all of that data and bring on top of the application data and the cloud infrastructure data, which you've already uh, modeled in your platform through, let's say, out-of-the-box collectors. That is where extensibility comes in, where you as a developer or a partner as a developer can come in and can simply do a low-code configuration or config-based coding and simply push new entities to the platform, new metric types, new event types, log types, or traces types, and ingest that into the platform and add the context of that business of bank branches and their tellers, associate them with the applications so that now you know that if a bank is struggling um, with customer experience or if an infrastructure piece is down in your environment, then what all banks are getting impacted. So you can do a top-down or a bottom-up analysis, uh, infrastructure to your business or business down to your infrastructure and really in real time, handle those cases so that you can provide a better experience to your customer. Um, and that is possible because there are eight senses of extensibility in the platform, which allows you to add entities, add metric uh, events, logs, traces, build your own collectors, which can convert data into open telemetry, do RBAC, and at the end of the day, it's a React-based UI, which, which allows you to go ahead and change the user experience and represent the bank with the icon you want or put it on a dashboard the way you like. So all of that is possible because of the platform being there and you're not maintaining scripts or running some snowflake code outside. Everything is built in the platform for you to consume as that use case. All right, I'm getting some warnings. So let me just quickly jump across and talk about the first application which we built on this, which is called Cloud Native Application Observability. Um, now I'll touch upon what exactly it is. So as I gave you the examples earlier, um, out of the box, the FSO platform offers certain applications and modules. And I'm talking about the first application, which was formerly known as App Dynamics Cloud. We are calling it Cloud Native Application Observability now because it is purpose built for serving cloud native applications at scale. Uh, it can help correlate right from the business transaction down to the cloud infrastructure by collecting data through a standard of open telemetry, right? And as I said, it's extensible, so you're able to add modules and expand these use cases. Um, ultimately, if you look at any platform or any data platform, the pipelines within the data platform help you transform that data into key insights by using artificial intelligence in certain cases or machine learning algorithms in certain cases. And that's what we do over here as well, so that we can draw insights from all the data points, metric events, logs, traces, by correlating them, 
and provide an insight to a user so that they're immediately able to reduce the mean time to resolution, right? Now, last but not the least, uh, with cloud native application observability, we touch on four key use cases. Modern APM, which essentially means all the modern applications which you're building, whether they're built on microservices on-prem or in a public cloud, uh, and whether they're built on VM infrastructure or Kubernetes, we look at end-to-end -end experience uh, for the developers as well as for infra ops to provide you an end-to-end -end view. The second is the practice of Kubernetes. Uh, so as you become a Kubernetes or if you become, uh, as you evolve your Kubernetes practices, you're able to get the performance, availability, cost, and configuration of Kubernetes anywhere. And third is multi-cloud services. So when you say cloud, it's not just compute network storage, it's also messages, databases, and all the past services which come together and provide the cloud services to serve the business uh, um, at the end of the day. So that is where multi-cloud services comes in. And then cross-domain correlation is where we leverage the AI, AI, ML, and correlation tools to bring the experience together for the end user. Um, with that, let me give a very quick demo. I know I have less time, but I will try to optimize it as much as possible. Um, let me share my screen and refresh it uh, quickly. I know I've yeah, been we can it see it, Sunny. We got, we got your demo up. And I'm, I, I'll just let you know, I think what we're going to do is we'll switch our question and answer section to maybe some live chat, if you can stick around and answer questions over live chat. So we can give you about three to four minutes for the demo, and then we'll just we'll switch right into that, if that's okay with you, Sunny. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. No all right. problem. Um, all right. So as you see my screen, uh, what you see right now is the Cloud Native Application Observability uh, app, which is built on the Cisco FSO platform. You can see that we've instrumented the application layer, the Kubernetes layer on which the application is running, and then the infrastructure layer. Now, uh, all of this is simply done directly with open telemetry or by using cloud connections. For example, in this case, we have instrumented AWS services. You can instrument Azure or GCP, depending upon what is your choice of cloud, or you can instrument all of them together. Moving back to the observe page, Something key I want to highlight is that as OTL or Open Telemetry sends data to us, we are automatically able to extract something called business transactions from that data. Now, this is where the rubber hits the road, right? So imagine you're running an e-commerce website where you're trying to sell stuff. Um, then your users will usually go ahead and log into the portal, go ahead and go to your inventory, search for something, like something, read the reviews, add to cart, add their credit card, do the payment, and then go out of the funnel. Now, you can build any cloud in the best cloud ever, but if you're not tracking what your end users are doing uh, and are able to correlate that experience with your cloud, you literally will not be able to understand what the business priority of that transaction is, and you'll not be able to serve the experience which you want to. Imagine, and not imagine, you can see here that out of the box, we automatically find all the critical business transactions, auto-instrument them, and this is only done by Cisco FSO platform and cloud native application uh, observability in the market, which is great news for me. And you can see that my add to cart transaction has trouble, it's red, the health is not good. And I'm doing this live, so I've not recorded it, so uh, I can, I'm showing you the last one week worth of data, you can go and play with this time machine and go to any time. But off the bat, you can see that this business transaction is running on e-commerce blue service. It's running on multiple service instances. It's running on a Kubernetes cluster and demo vest. Um, it's are running inside a specific namespace, has multiple workloads, but around 135 pods, around 135 containers, four EC2 instances, and six load balancers. So all this context of what a user is doing on your app down to what infrastructure that transaction is being served on is in real time built for you out of the box with zero configurations which you need to do, which is absolutely fantastic if, I, if you ask me, because I've struggled for years as an ops admin to have this end-to-end -end full stack view out of the box. And as you add more modules, you're able to expand this particular, um, uh, expand this particular tree and add more context to it. From here, as a developer, I can go into the related traces to look at code level information to say, hey, what's happening in my code in individual spans 
where do I have errors, where do I have problems, and literally pinpoint at those errors by looking at individual traces or spans. So if you are a developer, you will know that you can instrument each of the function in your code and send a, tra uh, send a span which can automatically be combined into a trace to manage that end-to-end -end transaction. Here I can see the add to cart transaction, add item function. I can see that uh, we are able to find the, uh, or we can see the cart repository save action and then transact commit where I can immediately see a span error. And this is where add to cart could fail as a developer, I know that. And when I click on this, usually at this time the developer is kind of, I don't know if it's an infrastructure problem, I don't know if it's a code problem, and they have to go through metrics, events, logs, traces, and all different data types and they have to find rather than they're served with what exactly is the issue. Here, off the bat, if I click on that transaction commit span, I can see where in my code it's slow, and I can see the associated logs right away. If I click on the associated logs, boom, within seconds or within five clicks, I've started from a business transaction being slow to how it is a problem in the code uh, right off the bat. And again, this is a journey which I took in order to show you what a dev DevOps or a developer will go through. But if this problem is related to a Kubernetes cluster, for example, in the infrastructure, then I can jump directly into the Kubernetes infrastructure and start looking at health violations, logs, events, and all the metrics in just one place in the common context with that business transaction. Again, I know I can keep going on, but I don't have all that time, so I will stop here and say that Cloud Native Application Observability will help you to build that full stack, and obviously, full stack uh, observability platform allows you to extend that to the newer domains that you want to add to your observability lens so that you can provide that ultimately, ultimate experience to your users. Um, I'll stop sharing. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, what a great presentation. And, and the demo, I'm so glad we got to squeeze that in. Um, I am, I'm going to, normally I'd move right to the poll. I'm going to very quickly move over to this, this link slide that you have uh, because I think it does have some great information and then I'll put the poll up. But Sunny, very quickly before you leave us, uh, if somebody wants to jump in and get started uh, and, and you know, kind of move forward with Cis Cisco App Dynamics, what do you recommend as that first step? Um, just scan this QR code. So as soon as you scan this QR, QR code, you will basically be in our trial, and uh, we can start providing you insights into uh, by giving you a live instance where you can start instrumenting your application and cloud infrastructure, and immediately off the bat see what I showed you in the demo, showing value, not spending months of time to baseline things, but within a few hours you will start seeing and, inst and problems in your environment which you can start solving to provide that end user experience you want to. Perfect, okay, I'm gonna have to move off the screen because I wanna make sure we get that pull up. So if you haven't pulled out your camera and gotten the QR code, now's the time. Click on all the links real quick and pull. Okay, so we have a question for all of you out there. We're wondering what additional information you would like to get about the App Dynamic solution. Now is the time. Click on that poll. Uh, I want to let you know, Sunny, we're getting some feedback from the audience saying how much they enjoyed the presentation. If you have the time, I know we didn't get to actually get into some live questions. Uh, please do feel free to stick around, and, and uh, I know folks would love to chat with you over our live chat. Uh, and, uh, and either way, for everyone out there that did ask a question, we will make sure that that gets sent to the team so you will get responses back from AppDynamics. So keep those questions coming in uh, as we go here. Sunny, once again, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> all right. And I also want to remind all of you to head on over to the Handouts tab. Be sure that you click on the handout or uh, the handout link <laughs> for AppDynamics and, uh, and start exploring. They, they call it a guided tour, which I just love, and it kind of walks you through piece by piece as you get to know the cloud-native observability powered by the Cisco FSO platform. So open that tab. Hold on to that. Save that for after we wrap because I promise you, you are going to want to come back to that. Uh, but speaking of exciting things, oh, and even more high fives coming in. I love this. You guys are all primed up and ready. What great vibes coming from our audience today. Thanks, Catherine. She said great presentation to uh, to Sunny there. I agree. Okay, awesome. Uh, so speaking of awesome, 
speaking of greatness, let's give away some prizes. Right now, I have a Kindle Scribe, and I've got a $300 Amazon gift card. Uh, reminder that you do need to be here live and present at the Megacast, but really, folks, where else would you want to be? Uh, so our very uh, next $300 Amazon gift card is going to Lee Martin of Virginia. Lee Martin of Virginia, you have won a $300 Amazon gift card, and our very first Kindle Scribe is going to Jay Thomason of South Carolina. Jay Thomason of South Carolina, congrats on your new Kindle Scribe. All right, well, as always, to our winners, Lee and Jay, congrats, and we will be following up about claiming your prize after we wrap up the webinar. All right, well, speaking of webinar, I think we should keep things rolling here. Uh, we are going to move along with our next presentation. I'm stalling a little bit. I'm treading water because I want you all to have a little bit more time to click on that poll. So if you haven't clicked on the poll, and let AppDynamics know what you need. Again, this is the easy button. This is you getting the info that you need handed right to you. So click on that poll right now. Last chance, five, four, three, two, one, and we're going to move things along. All right, well, up next, I am very excited to introduce you to this expert speaker we have in the wings here with us, and that is Mark Trodrio, Director of Product Marketing at Nutanix. Mark, thank you so much for joining us here today. Now, I know that you have a very interesting presentation lined up for us. I can't wait to hear what you've got in store. We're going to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, so I'm going to hand things right on over to you. Take it away, Mark. Thank you for that introduction and welcome everyone to this session on how to save time, cost and energy in your cloud migrations with a consistent hybrid multi-cloud strategy. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to discuss some of the key challenges organizations face when migrating applications and data to the cloud and the benefits of a consistent hybrid multi-cloud. We should have a little time for Q&A at the end, so please ask your questions uh, you may have in the Q&A panel. So let's jump into this. The app explosion has been exacerbated by uncontrolled app development. According to IDC, by 2026, 750 million new applications will be created and 50% of data generated at the edge, leaving enterprise IT unable to keep up with the armies of developers, app builders, and volume of data. Garner predicts that of all workload placements made by 2027, 85% will be suboptimal, indicating that organizations will need to move or redeploy them in the future. IT teams, however, are chartered with applying security, sovereignty, compliance, and performance while managing costs across this new hybrid multi-cloud world. The need to rebalance data and applications across a hybrid multi-cloud will require a common cloud platform. Cloud can be a critical enabler for organizations seeking growth. However, digital transformation can lead to an increase in infrastructure silos, which in turn creates a new set of IT challenges. From a study commissioned by Nutanix, the data in the Enterprise Cloud Index survey shows that of the 1,400 plus organizations surveyed, 86% agreed that moving applications between environments is complex and costly, and 94% stated they require a simpler way to run and manage all applications consistently across their organization. Interestingly, respondents overwhelmingly stated that they have already started moving one or more applications to a different infrastructure. As new IT and cloud models are introduced to an organization, they often introduce new infrastructure silos. Architectures differ enormously between private on-premises environments and the public cloud. Traditional data center applications are designed in a manner where the infrastructure layer provides the performance and resilience expected by the application, whereas the public cloud expects the application to manage the aspects of performance and resilience by scaling out across multiple cloud instances. IT teams can't therefore simply migrate those applications and data as is to the public cloud. And as a result, they typically find they require different IT skill sets, tool sets, policies, and procedures to support their move to the cloud. Third party applications may need to be updated, replaced, and require more complex cloud integration. 
maintaining consistent networking and security constructs across an on-premises or multiple clouds adds further complexity and risk that slows projects and increases costs. This is why organizations often default to refactoring their applications as a part of the digital transformation and move to the cloud. It can seem like the best and only option available for moving existing applications. However, it's only when on that journey do many organizations establish all of the intricacies involved with the migration process. At Nutanix, we call these challenges the headwinds of public cloud adoption. As an example, we were approached by a large Japanese gaming company with a data center here in the US. They had a CIO mandate to exit a data center and move all the applications to the public cloud. They had already been working on this project for over a year, which entailed refactoring applications to run in the public cloud with all the expected performance and resilience they used to achieve on premises. During the year plus of working on this project, the organization had managed to refactor just two applications. Yet, by their own admission, they had hundreds. They clearly needed a new strategy. Now, this is not uncommon, and we've heard from many other organizations across different market verticals facing the same or similar challenges, in that moving enterprise applications and data from on-premises to the public cloud is not straightforward. I tend to also think of this approach of refactoring applications from another perspective. If your organization is devoting its engineering and development resources into refactoring, refactoring existing applications to get them to the cloud, for what amounts to be a technical debt, then those same teams are not being productive at moving the business forward on new IT initiatives. There are, of course, different cloud transformation avenues open to organizations, and Nutanix can assist in most of these. To touch on just a few, Nutanix provides the ability to run highly efficient private clouds on-premises based on its pioneering hyper-converged infrastructure, or HCI, technology. And it's available on all major hardware vendors. It provides the performance, resilience, and scale for all application types while simultaneously reducing physical footprint, power and cooling requirements compared to traditional three-tier architectures. Furthermore, the addition of IT automation, self-service and a fully automated infrastructure and application lifecycle management streamlines your IT operations. Hosted private clouds enable organizations to run their own data centers without owning their own data centers. With over 180 different service and managed service provider partners, organizations can run the same on-premises Nutanix Cloud Platform software with the same IT controls and processes, but in a co-location facility. This also offers different financial models that can include operational expenditure rather than CapEx models. For organizations that want to move to the public cloud, they should first determine which need to be moved and can't or shouldn't be refactored. Rehosting these instead of refactoring can help avoid the headaches associated with the increased complexity and cost. The Nutanix Cloud Platform, NCP, comprises of infrastructure services, app and data services, and multi-cloud management. Organizations can run any workload types they want, ranging from business critical databases to general purpose virtualized workloads, as well as desktops as a service and specific market vertical applications. Nutanix Multi-Cloud Manager provides a consistent way to manage your entire environment, wherever it may be, with data lens and analytics. File, block and object storage is provided through in a unified manner by the app and data services layer, enabling the one platform to provide all storage types, including database services across your multi-cloud. Nutanix Cloud Infrastructure, or NCI, is where the software-defined storage, compute containers, networking, and security reside. It's within here, in NCI, we find the Nutanix Cloud Clusters, also known as NC2. 
Essentially, NC2 is the deployment model for NCI, but in the public cloud, running on bare metal nodes in either AWS or Azure. The key point I want to make here is that it is the same NCP software layers that customers deploy across edge, data centers, service providers, and the public cloud. It's for this reason that organizations can easily migrate applications from on-premises to the public cloud with Nutanix. No changes to the applications are required as NCI provides the performance resilience in the same way as it would on-premises. Running Nutanix Cloud Platform in the public cloud for your enterprise applications brings some innovative features. To cover just a few of these, Nutanix enables organizations to extend their on-premises infrastructure into a global footprint using the public cloud without requiring the management of regional data centers. This is achieved with consistent management, network and security constructs across the entire hybrid multi-cloud. Clusters are typically built in under one hour on AWS and approximately three hours on Azure. And the NC2 control plane manages all the hyperscaler specific architectural differences, such as ensuring the correct node distribution across hyperscaler racks. This provides the required node and rack level uh, resilience for your applications and data. Scaling out and back is very easy via the NC2 control plane and can also be fully automated via the Nutanix Cloud Manager for both the infrastructure and application deployment layers. As important as business continuity and disaster recovery protection of production workloads is, organizations are asking for simpler, more cost-effective ways of protecting their environments. With NC2, organizations can now eliminate or reduce their secondary data centers with an elastic DR solution. Using a small NC2 pilot-like cluster in the public cloud as a target for data replication, during a, daily, a DR failure event, the cluster can automatically be expanded to support the required number of nodes for compute and memory. This minimizes the infrastructure costs and allows for flexible DR tiering scenarios that maintain effective RPOs, your recovery point objectives, and RTOs, recovery time objectives. Heterogeneous clusters allows organizations to mix different node types within the same cluster. As an example, a financial-based customer in India recently put this to great use in upgrading their NC2 on AWS environment by introducing new i4i.metal nodes into an existing cluster of i3n.metal nodes. They simply moved all running apps to the new nodes and then ejected the old i3en.metal nodes for an infrastructure upgrade process with zero downtime to the applications. Hibernate and Resume helps organizations save money by dynamically reducing their cloud footprint when it's not required. It can move all Nutanix cluster workload data and configurations to AWS S3 storage and then shut down the cluster. This reduces cloud spend by not requiring the bare metal nodes. The S3 storage is relatively low cost in comparison. When the workloads are required again, Nutanix can resume the cluster state back to where it was previously. This is ideal for temporary and seasonal workloads or dev test environments. Since the launch of NC2 on AWS and Azure, we found these three use cases are the most popular that resonate with organizations. Cloud migrations are usually when there's an executive mandate to move some or all workloads to the public cloud. Most often, this is driven by the desire to not own or manage data centers, and IT teams are working towards a deadline by when data centers need to be evacuated or consolidated. This may also include the need to switch away from capital to operational expenditure. Forestry and land is a great example of this, as they are consolidating several data centers and wanting to increase use of the public cloud. NC2 provides them with a fast, easy path to the cloud without any application code changes. Disaster recovery was just mentioned on the prior slide and has been increasingly popular use case for organizations that have no effective DR solution or are looking to increase flexibility 
while also reducing costs against comparable uh, on-premise solutions. Land's End is a retailer who wanted to make more efficient use of their IT resources by handling seasonal peak loads in the cloud rather than having IT resources in their data center sitting idle for portions of the year. This predefined elasticity is common amongst retailers, manufacturing and even finance for certain workload types. How Nutanix helps organizations in their cloud migration projects is with an improved time to value. As discussed earlier, to refactor or re-architect applications is a complex process that requires development teams to go through application development life cycles to re-engineer them for the public cloud before they can start to leverage cloud resources. Based on customer discussions, it's not uncommon for an individual application to take between 18 to 24 months to refactor, all of which slows migration projects down. If your organization has tight de deadlines to meet or cloud commitments, this approach may cause delays and risk not meeting those targets. By leveraging NC2, however, organizations can be up and running in the public cloud very quickly and migrating workloads in a fraction of the time, accelerating the overall cloud adoption process. Nutanix Move is a virtual machine migration tool that allows organizations to move workloads between on-premises data centers and public cloud locations. VMs can reside on three-tier architectures on VMware ESXi or Hyper-V hypervisors, or they can even be running natively in AWS EC2 or on Azure VM. A key advantage of this approach is that any, at any time an organization can choose to move workloads to a new cloud or even back on premises if required. The way in which NC2 can help organizations save money on the public cloud is through more efficient use of public cloud resources. When deploying applications in native instances on EC2, for example, IT needs to select the most appropriate instance size for their application in what we describe as t-shirt sizes, for example, a small, medium, or large sizing. The instance size is made up of CPU, memory, storage capacity, storage and network throughput capabilities. If the application requirements you have don't fit cleanly into those t-shirt sizes, then typically the tier up uh, of instance size is selected. However, that leaves an excess of other resources not required by the application. This is what we term micro waste and may appear very small when considering an individual virtual machine or instance. However, as those instances are scaled up, it can result in significant wasted IT spend. It's also important to highlight that once an instance has been deployed, its sizing can't be dynamically changed and would require redeployment to another instance size if a change is required. Furthermore, storage performance for most instance types is limited to hard disks or SSDs and provisioned IOPS. And higher performing storage types are either not available or can significantly increase the cost. Now conversely, Nutanix uses bare metal platforms with the Nutanix Cloud Platform software and CI deployed on them. All bare metal platforms use high performance NVMe based storage and workload sizings can be customized on demand. This results in an improved workload density of the host and greater cost efficiency at scale than using uh, native cloud instance types. So what if you could save time cost and energy on your hybrid clouds. I've mentioned already how quickly NC2 can be deployed in AWS or Azure. Having a platform up and running in a few hours and being able to simply migrate workloads to it or use it for DR protection or bursting requirements allows for a very quick cloud adoption process. With all the supply chain delays we've experienced over the last couple of years, this also provides a way for organizations to get moving with new initiatives very quickly without having to wait for new on-premises infrastructure to arrive. 
If required, those workloads running in the public cloud can then be moved back on premises once the new data center infrastructure arrives and has been wrapped and stacked. The NC2 consistent management, IT processes, networking and security constructs further simplifies hybrid clouds for IT teams. It helps to break IT silos, reduce complexity and increase IT efficiencies. By selecting to migrate workloads via rehosting versus application refactoring or re-architecting helps to increase the speed of adoption further and it can make a significant difference when trying to meet C-suite mandates to get to the cloud. Now HCI's ability to more densely pack workloads into a smaller footprint and thereby also eliminate the need for dedicated racks of storage and networking enables more efficient use of IT resources. Eliminating micro waste and innovation, uh, innovating features such as Elastic DR and Hibernate and Resume also enables organizations to run only the infrastructure resources they require. All of these efficiencies contribute to a reduced carbon footprint. Nutanix can be purchased via a few different methods and a unique capability that we offer is around Nutanix license portability that enables organizations to move licenses between on-premises and the public cloud without having to repurchase. Licenses can be moved and reused in the future based on where you want to run your infrastructure. This year may be NC2 on AWS, next year it could be in Azure or on-premises. You have that flexibility. We also have the capability to leverage Microsoft Azure Marketplace integration and will soon be launching our AWS Marketplace in integration. This enables organizations to leverage the cloud commits for both the underlying bare metal instances as well as the Nutanix software, allowing an organizations to start utilizing their cloud commitments much more rapidly. Getting started with NC2 is incredibly easy. We offer a free test drive of Nutanix Hybrid Cloud that enables you to experience how Nutanix Cloud clusters, NC2, may fit your hybrid multi-cloud requirements. From the URL you see on the screen, you can build a hybrid cloud with NC2 on either AWS or Azure. There are also a range of other test drives available, including modernizing your data center, ensuring business continuity, and burst Citrix desktops to AWS, to name just a few. Also, if you want to test this out in your own public cloud account, Nutanix offers a 30-day free trial. Simply head over to www.nutanix.com forward slash NC2 and look for either the AWS or Azure subpage links to then select the free trial. Thank you for your time during today's session. And at this point, I'll take a few questions. Absolutely. We have some great questions lined up for you, Mark. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, that was really interesting and, and a great way to kind of get to know Nutanix a little bit better. Uh, I'm excited that now we get to dive in even further. Uh, so we're going to get to some questions. Before we do, I just want to remind everybody that up on the screen right now is a question for all of you. What we are wondering is what additional information you would like to get about the Nutanix solution. So Mark just gave us a really wonderful overview. There's lots more to learn, lots more to get into. So if you are interested, click right there on the poll and Nutanix will uh, send you whatever follow-up information you are looking for. Mark, while they're doing that, you ready to jump into some questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, awesome. Uh, you were giving us some really good information about the, the speed of workload migrations, and we got a couple of follow-up questions to that. So I'm going to start with this one here. Um, can you talk to us about the level of automation and self-service capabilities that Nutanix offers to simplify infrastructure provisioning and management tasks? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I'm going to touch on a few here because there, there are different, there's, there's quite an involved answer. But if we go back to the founders of Nutanix uh, who came from Google and their initial um, vision was to create a, uh, the equivalent of a sort of Google type cloud 
um, on premises for enterprise organizations. Uh, and the way that, that these uh, public clouds are able to scale is through automation. So at, at the very foundation level, um, you know, automation and self-service has been a, a key part of the way that Nutanix has built its products. And, and what you can actually do through the Nutanix Cloud Manager um, is automate um, both the um, infrastructure scaling from, say, on-premises into the public cloud, um, and you can also um, uh, automate the uh, workload deployments as well. Uh, and there's a, there's a, a sub sort of product of uh, NCM called Orchestrator, and that allows you to um, essentially build blueprints for your workloads such that um, you can then um, set criteria on which um, the, uh, the blueprints can then be used to scale out workloads. Even if that workload may exist solely on premises today, a part of the, uh, the, the, the blueprint would be that you know, if I need more instances of these, scale this out into the public cloud as an example. Um, but there's, o there's other areas of automation that we do, such as control over how we deploy um, nodes across racks in the public cloud. Um, if uh, a host was to have a problem and need replacing, um, all of that can be automated as well, such that uh, you know, it's transparent to the, uh, the, the end customer um, that we automatically bring a new node in, move the workloads uh, uh, over to it, and take the old node uh, out of the cluster. So it's, it's automated in that fashion as well. Awesome, I like that. I, I like going back in time to the history of Nutanix as we go through that. Uh, this is an interesting question here. Does Nutanix have a cloud versus on-prem TCO calculator? Yes, we do. Um, there is, uh, it, it's available on, online. Um, you can, or you can talk through your Nutanix sales representative, uh, and we can schedule a, a TCO uh, analysis that's done that will look at uh, all aspects of what you're trying to achieve with your cloud strategy, um, what you're comparing against in terms of what sort of type of uh, cloud native solution. Uh, and then there's a sort of report that comes out there and it sort of shows uh, a, you know, a lot of details as to um, you know, where you're saving uh, and things like that. And, and you know, the, some of the numbers I showed, you know, we, we on average taking a lot of data from existing customers, um, we, we're seeing on an average of about 53% savings compared to uh, going cloud native in these sort of you know, migration projects. Hmm. Uh, well, on that note, uh, thinking a little bit about um, uh, costs and licensing, we did have a question that came in. Uh, how does the license portability work, and are there any restrictions that they need to be aware of? Yeah, another good question. So um, when you license uh, the sort of NC2 portion, uh, first off, I should say, uh, as, I, as I said during the uh, session, um, you're really licensing NCI. Um, NC2 mm. is the delivery model for NCI in the public cloud. So there are NCI licenses. Um, and there's two aspects that you need to uh, purchase as a, as a consumer of this. There's the Nutanix software piece and the hardware piece. Okay? If you're running on-premises, you need hardware to run in your data center on which you, you lay the Nutanix software. If you're looking at this from a public cloud perspective, um, you're looking at either sort of AWS bare metal infrastructure or the uh, Microsoft Azure dedicated to hosts. Uh, and each of these can be purchased um, you know, on demand. That gives you no commitment. You pay monthly, so lots of flexibility. You know, you're, you're only paying for what you consume. Um, but it tends to have a sort of slightly higher cost because of that flexibility. Um, you can also select reserved uh, instances. And these are reserved on a one or three year commitment. Um, you know, there's uh, upfront payments, you know, but they, are, they do offer convertible SKUs. So you can start on one type of platform and, and then change it. And that's just on the hardware layer. And then uh, on the uh, Nutanix software, you, know, you can either choose to bring your own license if you sort of purchase something already, um, pay as you go, which is again, the no commitment, pay monthly, or, or the cloud commit, which is a minimum annual consumption commitment. Uh, and, and the newer ways to pay are via um, the, either the AWS or Azure marketplaces. Well, uh, speaking of payments, uh, we, you right at the end mentioned a free trial. And we did get a question in from uh, an audience member who that may have uh, pricked their attention. They're wondering how they could get started. So what, what do you do to trigger and get access to the free trial? To the free trial, I say go, go to Nutanix.com forward slash NC2. Um, you'll see in there uh, an Azure or an AWS subpage link. 
Uh, and then in, the, uh, in that page, you'll uh, have an option for either the test drive or the free trial. Uh, and then once you start that, you know, the, uh, you'll actually get, um, with Microsoft Azure, um, they offer 30 days uh, free trial of the bare metal platform as well. Um, and we offer 30 days of uh, free trial on the software. So it's, it's very easy to get started. Um, if you've never touched this before, you may want to start with the test drive first, just to sort of understand more about the platform. Uh, and then I would suggest jumping into the sort of free trial if, if you're ready for it. That's perfect, Martin. That's a great segue because we have a, a link for the test drive right in that handout tab. So if you are, are looking to, you know, get, give it a little test drive. Test run, test drive. It's hard to say if you want to get a test drive for without using the word test drive. Um, if you want to take it for a test drive, that's the words I'm looking for. Uh, you can click on the link in our handouts tab there uh, and get started on that. Mark, I, I wish we could keep going with this because there's lots more questions, lots more to dig into. It's a really interesting topic. I hope we'll get to chat with you again. And I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. All right, and to everyone out there who clicked on the poll or asked a question, thank you. Now we are going to make sure that all those questions get sent to the Nutanix team, so keep them coming in. Uh, you will get answers back. Also a reminder that you are entered to win that best question gift card, even if we don't get to your question live, so keep those questions coming as well. Uh, and while you're uh, asking questions, clicking on the poll, opening that handout, getting that test drive lined up, I am going to go ahead and give away another prize. So we have a $300 Amazon gift card up next. Uh, reminder that you do need to be here live and present with us at the Megacast. So our next winner of a $300 Amazon gift card is Matthew Chung of California. Matthew Chung of California. I was going to say you get sunshine and a prize, but somebody said this morning that California is not actually that sunny today. I don't know if they're speaking on behalf of the entire state or just their area, but uh, Matthew, I hope that you're having sunshine, and if not, at least you have $300 from, uh, for Amazon right now. Congratulations to you, and as always, we will follow up with all of our prize winners after we wrap. All right, well, we are going to keep things moving right along in this awesome mega cast today, uh, keeping the good times going, because up next, we have the Palo Alto team here with us. So we'll be chatting with John Chavon, Senior Cloud Solutions Architect, Prisma Cloud at Palo Alto Networks. John, it's so great to have you back here with us at the Megacast. Now, I know you have some great info lined up for us. Uh, we're going to leave some time for questions, so I'm going to hand the mic on over to you. Take it away, John. All right. Thank you so much, Jess. Uh, really glad to be here today, and we're going to talk about Prisma Cloud, uh, our cloud security solution, and we're going to uh, dive into really you know, how we can take a holistic approach to cloud security journey. So as far as our agenda, we're going to first touch on some of the latest cloud threat research, and uh, then we'll dive into some of those oversights in the cloud and why a holistic security approach is required. Uh, then we'll dive into Prisma Cloud, which is a CNAP, which if you're not familiar with that term, is a cloud native application protection platform. And then we'll hopefully have some time for some key takeaways and Q&A at the end. All right, so first we'll start into looking at some of the cloud breaches observed from our latest uh, threat report. And uh, this just came out the last uh, month or so. And uh, what was really interesting is, um, it was really, again, holistic approach, you know, looking at, you know, all the different, you know, risks and issues, uh, quite a lot of data that was analyzed. As you can see here, we got uh, over a thousand organizations uh, that were um, analyzed, you know, over 210,000 cloud environments and 70,000 repositories. And in this too, there were uh, two incident uh, response um, uh, examples provided uh, in the report. Uh, the data was anonymized, so we didn't, you know, risk, um, you know, showing who those breaches happened to. But uh, really interesting information that we'll kind of go through the next uh, section here. So incident one uh, was a SIM swap scan that um, that led to a data leak on the dark web. And as as you see this incident and the second incident, there's some common things we that we noticed. Um, first, right, that the attackers are looking at. How do they get the initial access? So, uh, number one, you know, in this case, they um, they they basically took over an engineer's account, uh, their email, their GitHub accounts, and uh, quite a lot of repositories that this uh, user had access to. Right, over 600 repositories. So they downloaded all this information, including source code, you know, uh, that source code that contained cloud credentials. Uh, from there, now then they were actually able to create a couple users uh, in the cloud account. 
Um, they're able to grant them quite a lot of access, which gives them quite a lot of privileges. And from there, they're able to exfiltrate you know, data and unfortunately um, was led to a ransomware attack. In the second incident, um, again, some similar things, right? So they're looking for initial access. In this case, they took advantage of a vulnerable web application that was exposed to the internet. And again, they stole cloud credentials. Um, this, this case uh, was ex exfiltrated from a VM. Um, from there, they moved laterally. They were able to escalate the privileges. Again, more you know, cloud credentials found in source code. Um, and then in this case, uh, they, they launched a cryptojacking attack. And so some additional data that was, again, analyzed throughout all these, these cloud accounts that we looked at, um, some pretty big numbers here, right? Um, this first common security issue uh, regarding hard-coded credentials, 83% of organizations um, were found to have hard-coded hard credentials in their source control management systems, right? We found this to be the case in those two incidents. Um, the second one, um, similar data, but this case, you know, found in uh, virtual machines user data. And so, you know, recommendations here, right? You want to make sure that you're enabling <clears throat> secret scanning and source control management systems um, as early as possible, and especially, you know, pre-pull request if you, if you can. Because um, unfortunately, when this stuff gets into the, to, to, you know, Git repositories and so forth, there's a Git history there, and that can um, sometimes be left there forever uh, unless you have some other tools to clean that up. Um, and so, you know, attackers know this, they're looking for this information. Um, so, right, if, you, if it reaches that point, it could be out there. Um, you might not be able to, to clean that up. Um, secondly, is the same, you know, scan secrets, obviously, at runtime. You know, the second incident that we talked about, um, this stuff was uh, pulled from the VMs themselves. Uh, the next common security issue is over permissive access. Um, our data shows, again, really big numbers here, right? 66% of organizations are using access keys for longer than 90 days. 99% of permissions are granted or not used. Those are huge numbers, right? So um, think about how you can, you know, you know, clean up your keys, enforce, you know, rotation policies as possible, and then, you know, definitely adopt KIM, which is our, you know, which is uh, cloud infrastructure entitlement management capabilities to really look at what's the proper usage of those permissions and then right size those things and move to least privilege. And then we've got, you know, unpatched vulnerabilities. Um, this continues to be a major issue. Um, you know, again, some of these numbers are pretty big, um, but just to highlight that, you know, make sure you have scanning capabilities across, you know, your, your environments. You want to obviously start that as early as possible, catch these things before they're committed to code, before they're uploaded to repositories and obviously onto running uh, instances. Um, so if you can, you know, scan again across the whole life cycle, um, we got much better you know, capabilities to find these issues and make sure that they don't get into production. So the question is then, right, how do we protect ourselves against all this? Uh, and, you know, Palo Alto, it's really simple, right? We want to take a holistic defense in depth approach. Um, this is really for any security solution, right? This doesn't, this isn't a, a new, you know, idea for cloud security, right? This is tried and true best practices for any, any security solution. So again, the same applies when we're thinking about cloud security. And when we look at Prisma Cloud, its capabilities, um, there's quite a lot that we can do. Uh, we're not going to cover everything today, but um, just understand that, you know, we are taking, again, that very holistic approach. We're thinking about, you know, things from the cloud, you know, threat actors perspective. How are they breaking in? How do we, you know, look at all these different types of issues, the ways that they, they move laterally, gain access to, you know, sensitive data, all that stuff. And then again, taking a holistic approach, thinking, you know, backwards, how can we start to, you know, provide protection, you know, capabilities to scan, give you visibility um, across the whole life cycle. And so we're going a little bit deeper into some of those, those points. And again, thinking back to these, these incidents um, and how we can protect against those issues. All right, so mitigating these attacks. Again, defense in depth for the Prisma Cloud. So uh, first we'll start with some visibility, uh, sorry, visibility and control issues that, um, Looking at machine learning and uh, you know user you know, anomaly type of information, um, there's a whole bunch of policies that we have out of the box um, that look at anomalies. Um, these are just a couple sample ones, but in this case, you can see an example here, right, where we see um, uh, somebody's logging in from a very distant place. Obviously, that's not normal, right? So this might be an early indication that. Uh, somebody's cloud account has been stolen and, um, right, they're logging in with this. Uh, we can alert on these things right off the bat. Uh, another, you know, common thing, again, right, MFA, you know, uh, access key rotation we mentioned earlier. 
Um, these are things that we're looking at that metadata, so we can see right off the bat if they're misconfigurations, uh, right? We're going to alert you on these types of issues. Uh, you want to make sure that you get this stuff cleaned up. And so, again, we're giving you that full visibility across your entire cloud estate, right? Whatever your major cloud providers that you use, um, you can find these issues really, really quickly and help to mitigate these problems. Uh, the IM piece, right? So we have, you know, again, a lot of policies that analyze all of the IEM data that you have in your, your cloud environment. So we can look and see, you know, what type of maybe risky permissions are being used, um, access that's, again, uh, over permissioned where, you know, we don't see um, uh, certain permissions being used. We can help you help identify those type of things and then um, help you remove that, right, with some of the auto remediation capabilities if you're interested in um, that helps, again, get you right size, get you moving to least privilege access. Um, talking about our exposed credentials and, and secrets, right? So we have uh, capabilities to find the stuff at runtime in this, in this example here, right? So we're finding these like private keys stored in serverless functions, images, containers, right? Um, again, these are definitely things that you want to be able to surface pretty quickly, right? Uh, these are, these are things that the, the threat actors are going after, right? They want to find those secrets uh, wherever they can find them. Uh, so make sure you're scanning this stuff and, and, and uh, surfacing those so you can help clean those things up. And then we give you a full audit and alert history. So, you know, we're, you know, giving the, the capabilities to, um, you know, uh, see, you know, a full history of, of maybe risks and, and issues that you have with your assets and, you um, as you can see on, on this page here, the pretty long history of alerts. Obviously, this you know should have been uh, highlighted uh, in this example you know early on to a team if they were looking at this stuff and, and hopefully fixing these problems. Uh, but as you can see, right in this case, you know uh, these things were kind of left unchecked, and um, over time, more problems surfaced and some pretty critical ones near the top there. Um, further additional, you know, audit capabilities. Um, drift detection is extremely important. So, you know, thinking about, you know, how things might be created in your cloud environments, especially if you're using infrastructure's code, um, we give you that the drift detection capabilities. So, you know, in case somebody made a change outside of that infrastructure's code policy, maybe they went, somebody went to the console, made an adjustment. Um, in the case like here, right, an attacker is adding themselves to a, a certain high privilege group. Uh, we're going to flag those kinds of things, right? So you can automatically see that, hey, this is something that, you know, wasn't intended, um, potentially even auto remediate these things so that um, that's not left that way. <clears throat> and then the attack path policies with data context, right? So starting to really stitch all this information together. Um, so, you know, you know, we know that it's, it's a very complicated environment. So having the ability to take <clears throat> different pieces, right? You have you know, your vulnerability issues, you have your, you know, IM issues, um, uh, all sorts of different potential problems, um, building those into the attack paths, right, that align to these incidents that we were, we were reviewing earlier um, gives you, you know, much higher priority then so you can understand, okay, what are my biggest risks in my environment? And then you, these are the things you can prioritize and help to, to mitigate as, as, uh, as, as best as you see fit, you know, again, based on priority. And just to give you like you know a visual here too, um, this is a, our new attack path graph that's coming soon, um, and this will give you you know excellent information you know as I was just kind of highlighting, um, and and really a couple of things I want to highlight here are uh, right we mentioned vulnerabilities, mentioned IEM, but we also have things like our network uh, information right. So this is definitely a differentiator because we you know we're ingesting our network flow logs. We can see you know what type of information is exposed to the internet, but also Right, as we see kind of on the top there, some anomaly activity that could be happening, right? So if this uh, this asset here in this page is an example, is um, uh, we're seeing activity from suspicious IPs, uh, that's certainly an indicator that um, you know there's 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 some problems here. We want to investigate this, you know, as soon as possible. And you know, without that kind of you know visibility, that type of information all brought together in context. Um, you're really going. You're really going to really struggle to prioritize and understand like what your real risks are. So, uh, again, this is super important to be able to have all this data, pull it together, have it a great visual information um, to help you prioritize your risks and to tackle these these issues um, as a prioritized basis. Uh, some additional things on our vulnerability management. So having 
um, that end-to-end agentless vulnerability capabilities. So uh, again, it's not just enough to have you know the scanning capabilities at runtime, right? You really want to see the source of this uh, this stuff, right? So going all the way back to to code, um, seeing where those vulnerabilities may be surfacing, right? If we can help to uh, um, surface those problems, help to you know inform our, our developers or whoever's creating this code um, that hey, you may have some critical or you know high vulnerabilities. Uh, if we can fix those things there, then we're not going to have these things going out to production again. So right, having again that full end-to-end visibility to these issues really really helps our customers to mitigate these problems and, and again take that risk-based approach and, uh, and and take care of those high-risk uh, problems. Help our developers learn. Uh, by giving them the tools as well to mitigate these issues themselves. And then when you're ready, right, you've kind of handled the visibility and control. Um, now you can start thinking about shifting left, right, with a risk prevention approach, right, as we kind of just started to touch on with vulnerabilities. In this case, now we're thinking about secrets exposure and, you know, misconfigurations, right? So if you're using um, these scanning capabilities all the way back to, like I said, the developer's IDEs in the rep- repositories, now you're able to flush out these issues really, really early on. Maybe you know prevent these these um, these things getting into your repositories. Where you know again, as we saw from the incidents earlier, um, these are the things that, that that the attackers are looking for, right? They're scanning these repositories, trying to find this exact type of information. So um, be able to have that risk prevention capability uh, again on top of the visibility control gives you a much you know better chance at preventing. Um, these, prov- these problems getting into your environment and, and from you know actually having a cloud breach in the first place. And then you know to further you know uh, in our customers when they're really ready for you know those advanced run- runtime protection capabilities, this is going to give them another layer of protection at their most critical workloads, right? So this is beyond agentless. This is now thinking about you know uh, maybe web applications or anything that you might have that you need to have publicly exposed, but you want to really make sure you protect, right? Um, in, this exa- in this example here, you know, we're adding that, that agent-based capability. So now we can actually stop, you know, the, uh, the one incident that we talked about earlier where right, they're, they're accessing those credentials from a, a running VM. Um, we're actually blocking that from happening, right? So we can actually stop the threat actor right in their tracks from even be able to grab those credentials um, in case, again, they were to get in. So again, another layer of defense here. Um, this helps to, to give you far more protection, uh, again, for your most critical workloads. And so, right, when we start to summarize all this up, right, uh, again, kind of t- taking in the perspective of this risk-based approach is, uh, this is why we built Prisma Cloud in the first place, right? And this is why we have this code to cloud story because Again, we're not, you know, we're not just thinking about things at runtime. We're not just thinking about things in the left-hand side. We're thinking about things holistically, right? So, you know, as we kind of touched on some of these capabilities, right? We want to be able to scan for vulnerabilities, uh, infrastructure's code, you know, misconfigurations, secrets as early on in that that life cycle as possible. Uh, we continue to scan through the the deployment phase uh, through CI tools. We have you know a whole bunch of integrations and so forth to. To, to make sure that that you know as those things move along the pipeline, right, that we're scanning the you know uh, for for continued problems potentially, right. This is also uh, you know how malware gets in if if a CI tool is is compromised or a source control you know uh, system is, is compromised, right. There's all sorts of different ways that attackers are trying to to get in there, right. So we continue to scan, continue to help set those guardrails up. Um, through that life cycle and then further right to the runtime, right? As you have all those those assets, workloads running in the cloud, um, looking at your your also IM data, your web application API security, which we didn't really touch on today, or the data security, but um, these are all these additional capabilities to give you again different layers of protection, um, give you that def- defense in depth, all the way again from code to cloud. And if we could also just, you know, you know, mention to the size and scale here. Um, you know, we've been in business for quite some time, and it takes a lot when you think about all of the data that's been moved to the cloud um, to be able to scale to these, you know, to these largest size companies. Um, and you know, it's also all this data helps to give us, you know, what our research team has been able to to reflect on and, and help us understand again how these threats happen. Um, so super important as you think about, you know, you know, looking at different options that. You want to make sure the tool can scale to the to the level that you need to, uh, so you don't run into any problems.
And then to, just to kind of conclude here, right? So understanding the cloud attack surface um, is really, really important, right? Making sure you understand the threat actors are, you know, obviously getting smarter and more powerful. Uh, make sure you create a risk-based strategy that takes a holistic approach. Um, point three, don't repeat the same mistakes, right? End-to-end -end security across all app stages is really, really critical. Uh, and then fourth point is that the industry is definitely seeing a move away from point security solutions to CNAPs, as they really kind of explained, right? Um, if you're if you're just looking at point solutions, you're not going to have that full end-to-end -end ability. So you know, definitely look at the, the kind of the CNAP categories and understanding that you know, again, we're taking a very holistic approach to to solve these problems. And as far as taking you know um, uh, the product you know in your journey, uh, we always recommend to take a phased approach. You know. Start where you're comfortable. Um, you know, visibility, visibility and control is typically where most customers start. Um, get comfortable just getting an understanding of what your environment looks like, all those different issues and threats that you might have. Um, you know, vulnerability uh, management, uh, agentless capabilities, all that. And then when you're ready, or if you're ready now, fantastic, right? You can then move to to left and think about risk prevention, right? You want to start making sure you're preventing these issues from getting into your environments in the first place. And then also for the for the added protection, the runtime protection, uh, again, where you want to make sure you're protecting your most critical workloads. And then just to kind of summarize, right? Um, these are key points for Prism Cloud, right? Again, we talked about our code to cloud story, right? End to end. Um, second point is continuous real-time visibility, making sure we're scanning these things um, all the time, taking a prevention first approach, especially in your strategy, even if you're just not, you know, if you're not ready for it today, you know, that's okay. Um, adopt the, the, the platform as you best see fit, but then always think about, okay, what's more, more critical workloads? You want to, you know, be planning for that approach um, to protect those when you're ready. Um, having that security choice, right? We have uh, the capabilities across uh, all the major cloud providers. And then again, scalability is also really, really critical. So with that, um, thank you so much for your time. This has uh, really been, been wonderful to have this opportunity to talk to you today. Yeah, John, thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Uh, really interesting to kind of see. I, I love the way that you sort of uh, took us through a point and then showed us the real world applications. And, and uh, I think that always really helps when we're talking about a solution is uh, not just the what, but also how it, it makes your life better. What is the problem that it's solving and, uh, and why that's an important problem to solve. So uh, I think you walked us through that really well today, John. And, and I can see that that was impactful for our audience because they have a lot of questions for you. Uh, so we're going to get to as many as we can. John, you ready to dive in? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm going to start with this one here because I think this is a really interesting one. We, we have an audience member maybe looking for uh, potentially use cases uh, in greater detail or, or just in what you've seen. But what they're asking here is how are customers typically adopting Prisma Cloud today? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and honestly, you know, we see the gamut of customers, um, you know, and, and it really just comes down to their maturity level, right, mm -hmm. in the cloud. And, um, you know, there's customers that have, you know, been uh, used to working in the cloud for five plus years, you know, those types of customers are typically, you know, more comfortable with kind of taking, you know, more of the platform on. But we also see customers that, you know, are much earlier in their cloud journey and they're just, they're just not ready for that. So um, really, you know, it just, you know, think about where you're at um, in, in, in your journey at your company. And like I said, you know, take, um, take a phased approach, right? Start with visibility control if, the, if that's what you need. You want to make sure you can actually understand, again, what you have in your environment. Mm -hmm. We find a lot of customers that sometimes they don't even realize what's going on, right? The risks that they have. And all of a sudden, you, you know, you turn this on and it's like, oh my gosh, like you realize that like, <laughs> yeah, I've got some real problems here that I didn't even know about, right? And and so you definitely want to start there. But like I said, as you're ready, you know, you, you take on more. Um, but it's really, really important to have a strategy in mind to think about, okay, you know, where you want to go in this journey, you know, and then you know, phase it in. And, and I'll just I'll also just lastly say is that a lot of customers that, that started with Prisma Cloud, you know, maybe two, three years ago, you know, they, they, they were earlier on, right? So they started with maybe just kind of some of the, the, the visibility capabilities. But, you know, two years later, they're like, okay, now I'm ready, right? So they're taking on more of the platform. And that's, you know, natural to do. Oh, that's awesome. And that and that scalability is so important. And I think there's a lot of organizations out there that are constantly thinking of that they need the tool to get the growth and then you outgrow the tool. And so it's really wonderful when the tool can kind of grow and breathe with you and allow for that. Um, but that actually fits in really well with our next question, because we have a question here wondering about customization. Uh, and I think that is an important part of that scalability and growth. Um, so question here, can you create custom policies to match tags or conditions for policies both at runtime and in IAC? 
Yeah, it's an excellent question. And um, yeah, and actually, it's a question I kind of get excited about because it's it's um, it's definitely, you know, one that, you know, early customers may not be ready for it, but um, but it's it's what I see, you know, as, as customers are starting to mature, because if you think about, you know, um, every customer's environment is going to be unique, right? right. So, um, you know, one thing that we definitely strive on is making sure that, that, that we can adhere to, you know, again, that whole journey, right? So, um, so yes, we can definitely, you know, have the ability to create both custom policies at runtime and build time. We match conditions, we look for tags. And, you know, if you just think about, you know, what that means is that, you know, if you have a, a security strategy, you know, um, in your environment where, you know, maybe there's things like, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, dev, you know, has certain policies, production of certain policies, right? So maybe use tagging for that, you know. Um, obviously, the production, you know, uh, workloads are going to be really, really critical. So, right. So ha having the ability to then look up the tags and apply different security policies uh, for those, you know, it might be different than what you want to allow for dev, right, as an example. And so, yes, we definitely look at all those things and it's pretty easy to create those custom policies on the end-to-end -end basis. So, yeah, great question. Thank you. Perfect. John, we are running low on time. I'm going to sneak in this one last question uh, because I do want to see if we can get through this. I, you know, the question here, wondering, uh, we're hearing a lot about time, everything being time and that being the key differentiator, especially with ransomware. Um, and so question, uh, how often is your tool actually scanning and can it auto remediate high risks or anomalous activity quickly? Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, I'm really excited to say that um, we uh, we used to have about like, you know, one to two hours. But um, over, uh, earlier this year, we released uh, event based driven um, scanning capabilities. So we see changes happening in the environment in real time and we're 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 on it. So the platform sees, you know, a configuration change or some other anomalous activity and uh, Prisma Cloud reacting to it. So, um, it, yeah, with, it's within minutes, I can actually undo a change that just happened, right? So uh, really, really important because you think about, you know, you know, just simple example, right? You've got cameras set up for your house or a building, you've got something that you want to protect, right? If you only can scan 12 hours, 24 hours, that's not going to help you any, right? So uh, I definitely, you know, something we pride ourselves on that's really important to have that real-time visibility so you can understand what's happening in your environment. And, and again, if you're comfortable with auto-remediating, um, you want to do that again for you know really critical things so that uh, you're not allowing those threat actors to, to do more damage or get further into your environment. So, Well, amazing, John. As I said, I wish we could keep going because there's obviously so much more to dig into here and lots of questions that we're not going to have time to get to, but we are going to make sure that those get sent on over to your team. Before you leave us, though, uh, if somebody out there is really excited, they want to jump in with Palo Alto Networks right now, what do you recommend as that first step? Yeah, definitely. I mean, visit our website. Um, there's tons of resources, information that you, that you can find there. You know, you can definitely uh, find ways to can contact a sales specialist if, if uh, you don't have one today. So, yeah, just just go to palosnetworks.com, look for Prisma Cloud, and um, plenty of information to start you on your journey there. Nice and easy. Yes, lots of great information. Definitely recommend going to check that out. Uh, John, thank you so much for being here with us today, for uh, giving us such a wonderful walkthrough, sticking around to answer some questions. Uh, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, and the fun doesn't have to stop here because now we've got the poll up. And the poll is how you can let Palo Alto Networks know what additional information you would like. So John was just giving us some great ways that you can follow up, that you can reach out. And here's one easy way. You just click right on the screen there uh, and let the team know what information you would like to get. And then they will hand it right over to you. It could not be easier. Uh, so I'm going to leave that up for a second, let you guys take some time to click on the poll. I'm also going to remind you that the handouts tab just chock full of information for you today. And if you click on the Palo Alto Networks link, you can download the report, uh, Navigating the Expanding Attack Service. This is actually it's a report from Unit 42, analyzing 210 thousand cloud accounts and these researchers basically found that of these 200,000 plus accounts uh, many of them were unknowingly giving footholds to adversaries in the cloud so obviously this is something that should have sparked some interest there it's a little concerning everyone wants to avoid those unwitting footholds to the adversaries so download that report read a little bit more about how that happened and how you can avoid it uh, and make sure you've got that saved for later this afternoon all right, I am also going to give away a prize. I do want to say I, I see some high fives coming out there from the audience. David's 
saying he's really enjoying the lineup so far. I'm really glad to hear that. And John sending a high five to John. So I like that. I like that. John squared. Uh, and I'm, I'm loving all the questions. I'm loving the good vibes coming in from all of you today. So thanks so much for being a part of all the fun that we are having. And speaking of fun, what is more fun than prizes? Uh, well, besides all the great info we're getting. So let's do a Kindle scribe and a $300 Amazon gift card because you guys are so extra awesome. We'll do one of each of those. Uh, now, a quick reminder that you do need to be here alive and present at the Megacast in order to win. So our next winner of a $300 Amazon gift card is Sam Kadar of Iowa or Kadar? 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 Kadar or Kadar? Sam, you message me and tell me how to pronounce your last name. Sam Kadar of Iowa, you have won a $300 Amazon gift card. And uh, our next Kindle scribe is going to Von Alan Gilan. Oh my goodness, you guys are really challenging me today. Alan Guilan. Alan Guilan. Von Alan Guilan. Wow, that's a great name. Von Alan Guilan, you have won uh, a Kindle scribe if you are from Illinois. That is you. Uh, all right, well, congratulations to Von and to Sam. And uh, as always, we will be in touch about claiming your prizes after we wrap the webinar. Don't forget, there are still more chances to win. Plus, we have that best question gift card from each session, so keep those questions coming in hot. Uh, now, folks, we are about halfway through the Megacast today, uh, just about, and that means we are still really rocking and rolling. There's lots more to come. So if your attention has wandered, if you've opened some other tabs, now's a good time to close those down. Come on back. Uh, if you got up to go get coffee or if you haven't stood up in a second, stand up right now, stretch it out, jump around a little bit, and then sit back down because you are going to want to be here present and focused for this next presentation here. So let's move things right along in our mega cast. You can see that we are in for a great chat because we have the Gigamon crew here with us. I am excited to introduce you all to our next expert speaker, and that's Bassam Khan, VP of Product and Technical Marketing Engineering at Gigamon. Bassam, thank you so much for being here with us at the Megacast today. Uh, I know that you have an exciting presentation lined up for all of us. Uh, we've got some Q&A to get into, so I'll see you for that in a second. And uh, in the meantime, take it away, Bassam. Hello, everybody. And welcome to our session on cloud strategies. And we're going to look at something that is a new innovation in the space. Now, you might hear that a lot, new innovation, innovation. We're going to actually see what this is about. And I can almost guarantee that you've never seen anything else like this because there's no other technology out there like this. So we're going to tell the story uh, over the next 20 or so minutes with pictures. I have one slide that's just the intro slide. Then we're going to look at three different pictures. Then the rest of the sessions is going to be demos. I'm going to all tab back and forth from the pictures to actually showing you this new innovation, this new capability. The three takeaways, I always like to start with what are we in for? We're, today we're in to look at what's called deep observability. Now, that's a mouthful. There's quite a bit of uh, capabilities that this technology can bring to you. And that's the newness. That's the new stuff here is deep observability. What it is, in a nutshell, is this is network-derived intelligence. This is intelligence pulled out from network traffic um, that's sent over to cloud tools. Now, in some cases, this, this just might be network traffic that's sent over. In other cases, it might be through deep packet inspection, metadata, intelligence about the traffic that's sent over to your security and your observability tools. That's one takeaway. Number two, this is truly something new. Now, there's a lot of technologies out there that use deep packet inspection. That's nothing new. What is new is Gigamon's approach, this whole notion of deep observability's approach to share that data, to, to be able to distribute that data to any number of tools out there. The reason we do this and the outcome of this is that this allows our customers, the network operations team, network engineer, network architect, to be a lot more proactive with cloud projects, with hybrid cloud projects, whether it's on-premises, VMware, Nutanix, or pub, any public cloud or multi-cloud. Another capability that we find uh, that this brings is it allows the security function to be almost democratized across multiple teams, particularly people on the left side of the spectrum, which are the cloud operations people, SREs, even over to the DevOps team. And again, we're going to talk about this, but we're also going to see this in action. The third part of this 
Uh, the third group of users are cloud ops. These are the cloud operations people, again, SREs. Now they have a new superpower uh, to be able to gain intelligence, gain a lot more context beyond what logs are telling them. So this is getting deep level information derived from network traffic, not into a brand new tool that they need to learn about into their existing tools. So ultimately what this leads, what we find with our customer base is much better collaboration across the different functions, whether it's DevOps, cloud ops, InfoSec, um, network operations. Uh, there's a common baseline that we're building that deep observability brings to all of this audience and that's the power, that's the innovation of the system. So we're going to look at the past. Before we look at the current and the future, let's start off with networking past. Um, this is where Gigamon started about 15 years ago, in the 2000s, really. We would walk into an organization, we'd see a relatively complicated, I'd say relative because nowadays it's even more complicated, but a complicated infrastructure that's uh, really ba based around network and all about connectivity. And there are a number of tools that our customers deploy that do their security functions, monitoring functions, application performance functions based on network traffic. So what would happen is we found when, whenever we'd go talk to a customer, they would have to plug in these tools into every single element of the network, every single leaf, spine, branch office, remote office, uh, and then cloud was obviously introduced, so any kind of cloud workloads as well. As a result, you end up hard coding the tools to have to go fetch the data. Is the network static? No, that's, it's never static. By the time you're done drawing a network diagram, it's already changed. And that's where Gigamon came in. What we did was we said, hey, let's simplify this whole process. So rather than taking your tools to go fetch the data, why don't we have Gigamon, one element, fetch the data one time, so now your tools have one place to go to to be able to access all of the data in motion for that organization. So it's a very simple proposition, and this is where Gigamon started. We innovated this space. We we're the first uh, what was called network packet broker at that time. There are other options out there, obviously, right now. Um, so we would tap all the data, we'd aggregate it, we'd send it over to the tools. Now, once we've aggregated, we find that we could actually do a number of um, uh, functions to clean up the data, like taking out duplicate packets, taking out irrelevant packets, and, and so on. We can also centralize the decryption function, so the tools on the right-hand side don't have to decrypt over and over and over again, one, one by each tool, which is a very compute resource-heavy uh, function. We can actually centralize that based on uh, on, on, on these tools coming in. Uh, let me shut this window very quickly. Based on these tools, uh, based on the data that's coming into these tools. That's the good news. Uh, but the world's changed, right? Um, so, so we're not in a on-premises perimeter centric data center anymore. So let's look at where we are right now, and where we're headed right now from, from here. So this is Gigamont's uh, vision of where things are headed. This is based on this picture I'm about to build out is based on almost a hundred different customer conversations we've had just over the past year, year and a half on us finding out where things are headed from a customer perspective. So there are a lot of hype cycles, technology trends out there. We took a really unique approach rather than looking at technology. We looked at people that's responsible for building, deploying, securing, monitoring hybrid cloud applications. We looked at the tools that those people use to do those functions and the telemetry, the data ingestion for those tools to function so that the, the teams can do their, do their work. There are two basic types of telemetry that's coming into all of these tools. On the right-hand side, we've got network packets. That's the diagram we just saw in the previous uh, diagram in the, in the previous slide. And there are a set of tools that have access that can process network traffic which is very low level, very granular, and get a really low, deep level of context behind the data itself. It's great for security purposes, great for troubleshooting purposes. Tools on the left-hand side were pretty much born in the cloud. They're much more application-centric versus workload-centric or infrastructure-centric. 
And their biggest ingestion mechanism is MELD, metrics, mean, logs, and traces, logs being the number one ingestion methodology. Um, the challenge is that the, this kind of a telemetry siloing leads to tools being siloed, leads to functionality being siloed between these, two, these different organizations. So for example, even though a cloud ops person might want to do a lot more around security, block, be able to view unmanaged hosts, not just managed hosts, they're not able to because the network packet ingestion would be would just over, overwhelm them. It's just too much data in there. And the tools on the right-hand side, the, the folks on the right-hand side, they would love to get visibility into cloud workloads, into what's happening in public cloud environments, multi-cloud environments, but they're not able to do that because it's hard to access public cloud traffic uh, there's no agent or no way of doing that. For example, for Azure, container traffic is really hard to, to be able to ingest. That's where deep observability pipeline comes in. This is a, simply put, it's a notion of being able to access all of the traffic based on the previous slide that I showed you, send it to the tools that can access the traffic, that can deal with traffic, that can, that can work with raw packets. And it's also being able to ex uh, extract out intelligence of so metadata about the traffic and be able to send it to the tools on the left hand side which cannot ingest packets now this is a concept but we're actually going to show you an actual demo before i get into demo i did want to share want to share one double clicking of what i just showed you so what does deep observability do number one it makes sure that it's accessing no matter where the workload's running it's able to access the traffic from the bottom tiers and be able to send it to all of the tools that you see on the top of the picture here. So it's workloads running in the bottom in any of these platforms and being able to send it. Now, when you look at the simple function of being able to access traffic, and for any of you, any of you with a networking background, you'll know it is not easy to access traffic in the different environments. Every environment is nuanced in the way that you access the traffic, in the way you do packet mirroring, uh, the way you scale that automate or through our automation orchestration, container traffic is really, really hard to access. With this kind of a technology, the access mechanism is not on the developer, not on the DevOps team, not on the cloud ops team. Gigamons is, for example, our approach with a single tap is able to access all the traffic and be able to do a number of transformation based on um, uh, whatever the local supported methodologies are. Um, be able to optimize the traffic, which is really important because you don't want to send all raw traffic and all raw metadata to all of the tools. You want to be able to optimize this whole set of functionalities built around that. And then be able to send that to the tools in a very controlled fashion in the sense that it's load balanced. So the traffic is seeing only, the tools are only seeing the traffic that they need to see. So what does this actually look like? So I'm going to all tab over here go into this um, tool, it's called Fabric Manager, it's a Gigamon's tool. So the way this, this traffic looks like is if I go into my AWS workload, for example, uh, oops, uh, I can say, um, show me uh, the traffic coming in. So the way Gigamon works is that <clears throat> we automatically draw this picture on the right-hand side. So it's ATS, so it's something called ATS, Automatic Target Selection. So as soon as a VM pops up, an instance pops up, a container pops up, a pod, a node, Gigamon automatically detects that and is able to collect the traffic coming out of that new node that popped up. And of course, you can say, I want to look at these 10 nodes. I don't want to look at this 11th node because that node is credit card processing, hit by something. You may not want to do that. Great. You have that option using, uh, using the product. But the key point here is as workloads scale up, scale down, we're automatically able to access the traffic from, from that workload. And that comes in here. In this picture, we're sending the traffic to some tool. What I would also like to do is, let's say I want to use uh, an NDR. So I've got extra, extra hop here. And I can just grab the traffic from extra hop and send it over. Um, I'm sorry, grab the traffic from all traffic, send it over to extra hop. But let's say I don't want to do that. I, there's going to be a lot of high volume traffic and it's going to go across my availability zones. Uh, that's going to be a lot of traffic coming in. So I want to deduplicate the traffic, and that's simply all we do is drag and drop a line. Uh, I could also say, you know what, I want to do some masking out of PII data, personally identifiable information data. I might want to, might want to packet slice the data. Whatever we, uh, tool we want to function we want to put in line, at that point, we just send it over. And boom, that's it. Now, 
the extra hop sensor running on premises and in, in any of the cloud modes, however you choose to deploy, is automatically seeing all the traffic, not just right traffic right now, but traffic as it scales up, scales down. So it's in this whole notion of being able to send the traffic over super important function. This is sort of our heritage, but we've taken that much further. If you look in the tools on the left-hand side, they cannot handle traffic. They can't handle raw traffic. So we're also able to extract out metadata elements from the traffic, be able to send those over to, to those tools. So what does that look like? So when I come into our own tool, what that looks like basically is application intelligence. Oops, sorry, uh, this one here. Um, and so using our application intelligence, we are performing uh, deep packet inspection on the traffic. And um, I'm going to pull up the right one, which is this guy right here. And um, I'm able to see what kind of traffic is, is um, traversing my network. And if I just do an edit and I'm able to go, go in here and just in about a second or two, I can filter out some applications if I wanted to from tools. So for example, an application could be Spotify. I don't need to send Spotify traffic to be inspected by all of my tools. I don't need to send, uh, have my Windows updates, which are really large files going around the internet, uh, going around my network. I don't need to send that to all the tools. In this case, what I'm saying is that uh, I'm going to export some met metadata. So that's this picture on the left here to these tools. Uh, one export is going to logarithm. One's going to another SIM. One's going to an observability tool. Fourth set of data is going to uh, elastic. And not only um, what kind of data is going over, we extract out over 5,000 5, metadata attributes uh, related to applications. So what type of attributes? So for example, here, we're sending out uh, DHCP related information. We're sending out TCP related information. Again, there's a super set of over 5,000 attributes. We can send out web information. We can send out HTTP information. Um, for those of you that are a little bit nerdy on the call, um, I'm going to get a little bit nerdy with you. Um, so these are HTTP attributes. There are 156 of them. We're choosing to export 50, uh, 47. So if I come down here, let's say a user says, hey, my application is running slow. What's a typical case? The cloud ops person is going to pick up the phone, call up NetOps and say, hey, network's running slow. My app's running slow. It's running fine this morning. Something's wrong. So what we allow is the ability to export out round trip time from HTTP right here. We also allow uh, you to send out round trip time from TCP. Now, if Munce's data goes into your Splunk or whatever the tool might be that the people on the left-hand side are using one of these tools, they see that the TCP round trip time has stayed flat, but there's a spike in HTTP round trip time. Guess whose fault that is? Is that net, net ops? No, that is a, an application issue. So what does this data look like in these tools? So we are completely tools agnostic when it comes to tools. We are, um, we are completely agnostic. So this is uh, the data coming into New Relic. This is the same data coming into Dynatrace, same data coming into Datadog, same data coming into a timed out Sumo Logic, same data coming into Splunk, same set of data coming into uh, another instance of Splunk. What type of data is coming in that really varies. So here we have, depending on how our partners, like in this case, um, uh, New Relics built out the dashboard. So what's encrypted, what's not encrypted. Uh, we can look at TLS insights. So for example, um, what traffic, you know, what ciphers are being used out there? Are there any weak ciphers uh, that are out there? Are there any, um, uh, SS, any TLS certificates that are about to expire. So it goes you know, anywhere from TLS information to troubleshooting, as I talked about, the um, round trip time performance. Um, and we talked about some of the other um, capabilities around um, uh, crypto mining, for example. That's actually another popular one where, um, right here, where there are about 17 different crypto, crypto mining activities that Gigamon can detect out of the box. Um, so the use cases are quite a few it's related, related to zero trust, related to uh, suspicious activities. So for example, what's called um, non-standard port use. So we can detect that this connection, actually what logs will tell you, what AWS CloudWatch, all the tools will tell you is IPA connected to IPB. And it was over SSL port. So it's this traffic port 442, don't worry about it. What this tells you, what Deep Observer tells you 
is that it actually inspects the traffic and says, yes, this is port uh, 443, but the traffic was SSH or the traffic was, um, was, was uh, let me have to pull that up here, or the traffic was DNS going over 443. Now, is that a is that a, um, a, a vol- is that an attack? Uh, not necessarily. However, that is something to keep an eye on. So here we have SSH. These are all sessions that's connecting over. It's it's actually the SSH traffic, but it, it, but for some reason it's being sent over four four three. That's a little bit of a concern, and that's the type of capability that deep pack um, sorry deep observability pipeline brings. This is new. Nobody else is doing this right now. Uh, Gigamon's the only company else is doing this right now. Uh, Gigamon's the only company that's providing this capability um, of being able to not only do the deep packet inspection, but be able to share that across the board to any of the tools. Why is this important? Again, this is important because now the people on the left-hand side, typically our customers on the right-hand side here, are now able to provide value, provide visibility, provide power to to the tools on the left-hand side, to the people on the left-hand side. So they get some of the visibility, some of the grunt work that we would do on the right, uh, being on the right-hand side. So this is Deep Observability Pipeline. Hopefully this was um, helpful to you. And um, at this point, I was wondering if there are any questions from the audience. There are, we've got lots of great questions coming in. I, but first I wanna say thank you so much for that awesome presentation and all of those demos. It is so exciting to kind of get in and, and get to explore a tool a little bit together. So I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to walk us through that. Um, so I do wanna get into these questions here. Uh, we're gonna be a little short on time, so we're gonna get to as many as we can. You ready to dive in? Let's do it. Let's do it, okay. Uh, let's try this one here. How do you handle encrypted traffic? Great question. So um, if it's okay, I'm going to go back to my uh, trusty slides and sometimes it's good to show um, uh, rather than just tell. So here the traffic is coming in and acquisition would be on encrypted traffic. One of the transformation functions that we provide is decryption. Hmm. So we're able to decrypt traffic all the way up to TLS uh, 1.3. So PFS, for, for those of you um, that are in the space <laughs> and in the business, um, so we're able to decrypt the traffic. And why is that important? It's important for two reasons. Number one, decrypted traffic works much better for security purposes, for troubleshooting purposes than working with encrypted traffic. Mm-hmm. It's like working with a Amazon package that's you know not trying to figure out what's inside versus actually having and knowing what's inside that box. So working with the box itself. So what we're able to do is decrypt. So that's step one is being able to decrypt. But decryption is not the end goal. It's a means to a goal, a means to a goal and, and, and the goal being inspection. However, as soon as you open that packet and there's all kinds of uh, compliance related issues, PII related issues that pop up, that's what Gigamon is really good at. I showed you masking a second ago, a few, few minutes ago. Yep. Yep. So to mask out PII data. We, we can make sure the tools get exactly the right data that they need. So that's a really other important part. It's not, not just about decryption, it's about sending it over. And the third point I just want to close on, which is um, because you're centralizing that decryption is a very compute resource heavy function. So having each one do it, you're losing 30, 40, 70, 80% of throughput for those devices. Centralize it once, all of a sudden you retrieve almost like double the capacity of the existing tools. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we have some very smart cookies out here in the audience today. Uh, speaking of smart cookies, let's try this question here. Does Gigamon, Gigamon offer a zero trust product? Um, great question. And uh, that's a that's a loaded question. And I feel like <laughs> a little bit because um, there's a lot of vendors out there saying, hey, we do zero trust. But I imagine the person asking the question does have some zero trust um, uh, projects underway. So if any vendor says, oh, yeah, we are the zero trust product, use us and you get zero trust, uh, huge grain of salt. Um, we provide visibility to make zero trust possible. Mm. Zero trust is about understanding what communications are taking place, setting policies to say, Jess can talk to Bassam and here's the application that she can access and here's what she can do, but there's things that she can't do. If you're not seeing all the communications, if you have blind spots that are east-west lateral communications, container communications, um, that you're not getting visibility into, it is impossible 
to uh, deploy any of the zero trust model, no, no matter which model you're looking at, because of visibility is needed. So are we a zero trust solution? Uh, we're not an end-to-end, -end. Nobody, nobody's an end-to-end solution. However, having network visibility without blind spots is foundational for any of the zero trust models. Mm, I really appreciate that response because I think it is important to differentiate that it's not, you know, we talk about this all the time, zero trust is not just a tick and got it. There's a whole right. approach. And, um, yeah. Okay, but some, we are right on the edge of time. So I'm sneaking in this question if we can keep the answer a little on the short side, uh, but I do think it's a good one. And, and uh, so I'll, I'll get to it as quickly as we can. Do you support the new AWS security lake? Uh, short answer is yes, absolutely we do. We provide, so that's one of the items that needs to be added here. Um, if you want to learn more about it, there's actually a blog that has more information. Go to gigamon.com, look at the blog. And uh, Security Lake should have been added here. Thank you for bringing that quite <laughs> In fact, we're on the engineering partners, worked with Amazon uh, on security, getting Security Lake out there. So just look at the blog, look at the blog and look for more info. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, before you leave us, Basam, if somebody out there is really excited about Gigamon, they want to jump in and get started, what do you recommend? Contact us. Um, there's a lot of new material, super powerful uh, capabilities that we that will that will for sure make your lives easier. Contact us. What I showed you is skimming the surface of skimming a surface of skimming another surface. <laughs> lots of capabilities. So please do get in touch with us. Um, go to gigamon.com and just get in touch with us. We'd love to talk to you. I love that. That's such a great point. We are we are skimming the surface of the surface of the surface here, and there is a lot more to learn. Uh, speaking of which, I know there's a lot of questions that we did not get to, so uh, we are going to make sure that all of these questions get over to the Gigamon team, so you will get answers back from Basam, from the Gigamon team. So stay tuned for that and keep those questions coming in. Um, Basam, thank you so much for taking the time to come and join Keith and I here today. It's been so much fun chatting with you. Likewise, yes. Thank you. All right, and now we've got the poll up for all of you. And what we are wondering is what additional information you would like to get about the Gigamon solution. So take a second now, fill out that poll, let us know what additional information you would like to get. And then the Gigamon team will follow right up with you. How handy dandy is that? You get all the info you need right in your email inbox. All right, so while you're clicking on the poll, I'm going to remind you again to head on over to the handouts tab. Now I know because you're all great at following directions that you've been doing this every time after every session, you're visiting that handouts tab, you're getting those handouts. But just let's say that you forgot for a little while, I'll remind you to head over to the handouts. And while you're over there, make sure you get the Gigamon handout. It's actually an IDC report on network intelligence and insights, driving performance, protection, and productivity and observability. It is such a cool read. It's going to explore cost-effective digital infrastructure, staying well protected, but also moving quickly, and how observability can really enable all of that. So lots of really great info in there. Definitely worth a read. Be sure that you've got that downloaded and hold on to that for after we wrap today. But folks, we've got a little bit of a ways to go still because uh, as I said, we're just, we're right at the, the summit in our, of our uh, midway point here. And so I'm gonna hand things on over uh, to my wonderful friend and fellow moderator, Scott Becker, who is here to give away our next prize and take you down the rest of this wonderful Megacast Mountain. Scott, thank you so much for joining us here today. Happy to be here, Jess. Thanks for uh, bringing us uh, through the, the first few sessions of this, this uh, Megacast. It's been fantastic, so informative so far. Um, yeah. You know, everything from a great keynote, you know, to, to all these great sessions. So uh, oh, great yeah, job. It's been uh, go, great. Go take a <laughs> Go take a well-deserved rest, and uh, I will take it from here. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. All yours. All right. So, of course, we have come to our next prize drawing. As Jess mentioned, this one is for the $300 Amazon gift card, one of the, the ones that we're giving away every half hour. And the winner of, of this gift card is Chris Sense from California. So congratulations to Chris Sense. We'll be in touch about claiming your prize. And now... Um, I'm going to use a trick that, that Jess was using earlier. We are going to close down this poll. So I'm going to give you a, a five count to get down. Uh, and uh, if you haven't, you know, entered any of the assets that you want here, you've got a five, four, three, two, one to click on them. Okay, time is up on that one. Thanks to everybody who uh, filled out that poll. And now it's time for our next presentation in the Cloud Strategies and Solutions Megacast. 
And this session is coming from Cisco Secure. And presenting for Cisco, we have David Gormley, who's a cloud and network security leader. David, take it away. Hello, and welcome to this webinar in the Secure the Enterprise series. Today, we're going to be talking about security resilience, securing the edge with enterprise first SASE. So let's dig right in, and I'll explain what we mean by that title, what's going on in the market, how you see vendors responding to these trends, and then what Cisco is doing to help our customers in this space. My name is Dave Gormley. I'm a member of the cloud and network security team. And this is a very hot topic with our customers, your prospects, customers, analysts, uh, the rest of the market. Many of them are seeing disruption and they're noticing that it's happening faster than ever. And this is not just a security issue, this is business in general. So when we're talking to people in organizations, right down from the CEO to the CIO to the CISO, they're talking about resilience. We've been through a very difficult two or three years. So organizations are trying to prepare for, you know, things that they expect may happen and even to be in a better position for major changes that are unpredictable. Companies are trying to do this in a financial way with their operations, their supply chain, and just with their organization in general. But what we notice when we go in and talk to people is that there's a realization there that cybersecurity and security in general has an important role to play across all of these. So you've got your organization, you've got a group of financial people that are trying to make sure that they're gonna be resilient, but if there's a cybersecurity attack with regard to ransomware and the organization has to pay out a whole lot of money or they have to pay millions of dollars for remediation from that attack, that's gonna hurt their financial resilience. Operationally, it's the same thing. If there's an attack on a specific location or certain equipment, that can become a huge operational issue, hurt the resilience there. And again, this attack can start or be fundamentally a cybersecurity attack. Supply chain, we've seen some of the largest data breaches and cybersecurity issues come through from a third party. So the organization does a lot of security, but they have third party relationships and that's where the attack starts. That's how somebody enters and gets into the organization. So supply chain is huge as well. And then organizationally, if you look at the last couple of years with the health issues, uh, with inflation, et cetera, there's lots of things going on that's affecting the organization. One of the major ones is hybrid work, remote work. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, one of the things it does is it increases the attack surface. Therefore, it makes it easier for cyber criminals to get in unless you make sure that you have security resilience. So ironically, you know, this security aspect affects all of the others and is of you know the utmost importance when we see people see people making plans going forward. So with that in mind, we want to talk a little bit about security resilience. You know, what is it that people are trying to do and what are they dealing with in the market right now? What's making this a difficult challenge? And I referenced this a little bit in the, the previous slide. There's the ever expanding attack surface. So if you look at these bullets on the right, the boundaries of business are blurred with, with the movement to the cloud and with specialization. A lot of organizations are outsourcing where they house their data. They're outsourcing their marketing campaigns, some of their sales activities with partners, et cetera. So those business boundaries have blurred. Sometimes there's co-opetition. It's a competitor, but you're, com you're uh, cooperating with them in certain other areas because of the way the market wants to consume your products. The other thing we see happening is a huge increase in devices. People are, the organization itself might be creating IoT devices, but even in dealing with their employees, they have their personal phone, their work phone, laptops. There's just so many different starting points and uh, it's actually just moving into the billions with regard to the number of devices that you need to provide access from in an intelligent and secure way. And then the last one is, is what we just addressed in the previous slide, remote, hybrid work. You know, 100% of people working remotely. Uh, some people coming back to work, some wanting a ongoing hybrid type environment. That sounds good in some ways, but there are challenges there with regard to networking and security. So that's what we're gonna dig into today. We're gonna take a look at this increased complexity and what we see as sort of a new environment out there. And so if you look on the left here, 
I just mentioned the, the number of remote users, the number of devices. We also see IoT devices, which is again, just starting to mushroom. But again, this is gonna explode the number of endpoints that need to be supported and monitored and secure. And then you look over on the right and you see this transition to cloud and SaaS type offerings. And you know, there's the general web activity. We're starting to see that in some organizations, traffic to the web is 70, 80, 90% of their traffic when it used to be all within their network. Not only is it to the web in general, but there is, you know, SaaS applications out there. These are productivity applications, sales, HR applications. These are critical to the organization. So it's not just out on the periphery. If it's Office 365, your productivity application, you know, people need that and it needs to be high performance, responsive. They don't want to be sitting around waiting for things to update. So that's putting some challenges on corporate IT. And then there are still private applications. And as much as we do in the cloud, we need to remember that there's data and applications that are more private, that are custom maybe, that we need our users and maybe some partners to, to get access to. So one way that I've heard people describe it is it's a big challenge because there's been an explosion on the left side, which is where people are coming from and how many people there are. But then where they're going to has expanded as well. They're not all coming to the corporate data center. They're coming to the web in general. They're coming to SaaS apps. They're coming to private cloud. They're coming, you know, even into your data center maybe for access to certain applications or data. So once you have multiple dynamics that are both getting more complex, the starting point and then where they're trying to connect to, and it makes for a complicated uh, challenge. And the result that we see from this is we keep hearing from executives and specifically from leaders of security and networking that they're struggling trying to connect all these users from anywhere, right? So during the pandemic, people are connecting from home, from a coffee shop. Some are going into the office one day and home the next day. There are more threats out there. And so as soon as you see the attack surface widen, you know, these attackers are looking for the easiest way in. And so they're trying new things. So we are seeing, um, you know, more and more threats, some of them getting more sophisticated as they try and find these gaps in the organization's security uh, systems. And then the last one on the right is as organizations move to the cloud, you know, it sounds good. They do a test with one office or in one country, and then they roll it out globally and they start to see that, hey, Office 365 or Salesforce, one of these big apps, you know, it's great, but they run into performance issues once they put a high volume of people on it or people are coming from all around the globe. So these are three major challenges they're facing. And one of the things that comes out in this is you can see in the title, we're mentioning both security and networking. And those have traditionally been separate departments and, you know, connecting how the network wor works and who can get where and all that has been a, a specialty in and of itself. And then security has been this evolving space as well. And what we're starting to see with these transitions and trends that are happening is that the two are becoming more interconnected. And so we're seeing a reaction in the market and, you know, this has been happening for several years. You know, just a couple of years ago, one of the analyst firms uh, created a term, the Secure Access Service Edge. And what they were doing is recognizing the fact that not only were the organizations moving a lot of their applications and data to the cloud, they were also starting to consume security and some networking functions as cloud services. Okay, so one of the ways to deal with this expansion is to do two things. One, start to consume elastic services from the cloud so that you're more flexible. And there was the need to combine networking and network security together. They were realizing that, hey, just sending the packets in a certain direction and connecting them wasn't enough. You needed the security. And that these two were intertwined as individuals or the organization went about its business. So it would be much more efficient if they could combine the networking functions and the security functions, and you see this convergence on the slide here, and then deliver it as cloud-based services, and they coined the term Secure Access Service Edge. And the idea of edge is at the edge of the cloud. So you get your traffic, no matter where it's coming from, to the cloud edge, and then you do the correct networking activity and security activity to make sure that it's a good experience for the administrator and the user uh, and that it's secure. So this has gained a lot of steam over the last couple of years, gaining more and more momentum. The market 
is growing quickly. The forecast is for it to expand quite a bit to double or triple over the next few years. And, you know, that first slide just talked about the concept of them coming together. This slide goes into a little more detail. And I'm not going to go into each element within a SASE type architecture, but I did want to provide a little more detail here and explain that there still are those two set of uh, use cases or goals for an organization with a SASE architecture. And if you look at this, you see the networking on the left. So most of these functions are now included within an SD-WAN type solution. So, you know, the items you see in green there, uh, the SD-WAN fabric, the unified threat management, some of these different things, performance-based, routing, uh, some of those used to be separate, but they've been kind of converged under SD-WAN type solutions. So that's what you see happening over on the network as a service side of things. And then there's the, uh, there's been a, a you know, SD-WAN is the name obviously of a product area. There wasn't that specific name on the security side. So now just recently in the last year or so, the term has come out security service edge. People refer to it as SSE and that's on the right here. And that's, the convergence of multiple functions of cybersecurity coming together. And so, you know, that's sort of a, a newer angle. Organizations have been doing it, adding some functions together over time. But this larger group coming together and all being delivered from the cloud is an evolving concept. And people are aggressively, vendors are going after this. And that's the way we see more and more organizations wanting to consume their security. So as I mentioned, some people... Uh, want to go right at SASE. If you're a smaller company and you haven't made commitments to uh, an SD-WAN solution yet, and you haven't aggregated your security, and you're in a position where you can jump to a more complete SASE architecture, that's great, and you may want to do that. You know, some organizations are ready for that. Like I said, they don't have existing commitments. They don't have a super complex environment, and so they're able to do that. And what you see is solutions like Cisco Plus Secure Connect. This is the name of our SASE offering. It's very simple. We've unified the networking angle and the security angle. We've converged those functions that you saw in each of the boxes. And so what you get is a simple solution. It's very easy to deploy because this, this integration is built right into a single uh, service. It's very secure, and I'll show you some proof points later. It leverages what we call Cisco umbrella or Cisco's umbrella of security functions within this uh, Secure Connect solution. And then it's very intelligent. By intelligent, we mean when you combine the information that you get from networking and what's going where and how much traffic with all of the destinations people are going to and what they're sharing, you've got a lot of information. And if you combine that correctly, uh, it allows you to predict and understand uh, what's going on and block the right things, but also to investigate and remediate if there is an issue very quickly. So this type of a unified turnkey solution is built for speed and simplicity. And so we see a bunch of smaller companies that are ready to jump right into SASE doing this. We see other organizations that want to be very aggressive about consuming their networking and security from the cloud uh, going in this direction as well. So that's one group of the market. But what we're going to focus on right now for a little bit is that security service edge. So it's the right side of the, the right half of this equation. And as I mentioned, these services, unlike on the SD-WAN side, they haven't all been combined in the past. Because security keeps changing and there's different types of threats, what a lot of organizations did is they just layered, they created a security stack is the concept. So they, you know, bought into a proxy or a secure web gateway. Oh, then they needed a cloud access security broker because they were using these uh, SaaS apps widely in their organization and needed protection. Oh, they wanted firewall as a service for the non-web traffic and to do IPS and IDS. And then there's zero trust network access, uh, you know, a different way to get back into your private apps. So there's a lot going on on this security side of things. And that's what we're going to dig into a little bit more here, because for organizations that have, for larger organizations that have complex environments, that have already made a commitment to a certain SD-WAN provider, et cetera, they can't just jump to SASE in one step. They want to evolve and they want to converge services together and move towards a SASE architecture, but do it in a way that works for their organization. 
And so what we've done is there is the Cisco umbrella solution. And what that does is it builds a, a SSE foundation or a security service edge foundation for you. If you want to move towards SASE, if you want combined security and you have your own SD-WAN or you're not ready to, to merge it all just yet. And so what we've done within this solution is we started with DNS layer security, which is a great way to prevent 60 or 70% of the new attacks that, uh, that arrive on the market. Uh, but we've added to it not only firewall as a service, secure web gateway, uh, remote browser isolation for risky traffic or for certain scenarios that you can define, cloud access security broker or CASB capabilities. So you don't need to know the details of all these security technologies, but just know that you know, with regard to the promise of the cloud, having all of these in one dashboard, in one cloud service that's elastic, so that if you, certain times of the year, have a lot more traffic, if you're in retail, or if you're a widely distributed organization, and it's hard to get all of this security for your remote users around the world, this is the kind of solution that can be very valuable to you. And then if you look at the bottom left here, Cisco Talos Threat Intelligence, I talked about when you aggregate information together from all these different services, you can paint a good picture. You can get context on what might be happening in your environment. So it's not just convenience and efficiency uh, with regard to bringing these together. There's also a security win because once you're reporting on this stuff together, you can start, an analyst can start to see the whole picture and understand in one console what's going on, what type of attack it may be, and how to stop it or remediate and they can do that a lot quicker. So this is a very attractive solution in the market. We do at Cisco offer zero trust network access services. What we're doing right now is building them right into the umbrella interface. So you'll see that soon uh, where we can just add that as another function within Cisco umbrella. Now, again, I'm not gonna go through all these bullets and details, but I did want you to get the feel of how this works. You've now got each of these functions. This is a layered security model but we're doing it very efficiently. We're saying, just get your traffic to the cloud edge, and then we will run it through the appropriate, depending on your policies and how you have it set up, we will run it through a whole set of security functions, and we'll do that efficiently. And so it's a win with regard to security, but it's also a win with regard to performance. And so, uh, and, and the other point that I made is it's elastic, right? So if your organization's traffic goes up or down, it's not like the old days where you had to buy a new box or you had to expose some traffic. Now, this can grow with you and expand and contract as necessary. The next thing is as you move more and more functions to the cloud and as your users are more distributed, performance and reliability are very important. And we started this whole session by talking about security resilience. So, you know, if the last couple of years have taught us anything, it's that it's not predictable, right? Whether it be health, infrastructure, wars, uh, financial status, et cetera, there are a lot of things that uh, are in flux. And so when it comes to resilience, what you wanna do is you wanna set up a strong network. And so if you look at some of these bullets on the left here, you wanna set up an architecture that's somewhat interchangeable. It's containerized, it's a multi-tenant architecture that's focused on delivering scalability and reliability. Um, when you're moving traffic across the internet, peering relationships are very important. And so we've got two, three times as many as uh, many of our competitors. And what this means is, you know, peering relationships, uh, strong, efficient connections to some of these largest traffic providers. And you can see some of the names down on the right. Um, you can also see some things here about augmented routing, um, our own carrier neutral data center. So in other words, having your own data center so you can tune it for certain networking and security aspects. Uh, you'll see compliance standards here. All of this is making it a robust, reliable, scalable, and in the end, resilient environment. And so Cisco with the networking background that we have and the, the large security base, we've got these data centers at a variety of places. You can see this map just kind of showing the coverage areas. Um, but it's a pretty broad spectrum of data centers. Again, we've got control over a lot of that infrastructure and we've fine-tuned it to provide good performance. So we've covered security, we've covered performance. Those are the major items. The other question that I get a lot around complexity and bringing all this together is, 
oh, how difficult is it to get value? And what would I have to do to, to bring this into my own organization? And so I'm not going to read through each of these items, but I think it's important for you to realize that if you go with the umbrella secure internet gateway system, you can apply different aspects of it and implement it over time. You know, it's up to you. You can get important value right away. So even within the first few minutes or hours, you can turn on that DNS protection, redirect your uh, IP address for where you're sending your DNS, and you can start to see all this security and blocking happen. Within the first day, you can turn on other elements. You can start to tune uh, different policies. You can see information in SecureX, which is an XDR that you automatically get when you purchase Umbrella. So there's lots of value coming in in the first 24 hours, 48 hours. Within the first week, there's additional things where you can get into finer detail. And then within the first month, you can start to apply other layers, tunnels, you know, more sophisticated aspects of this solution. So it can grow with you over time. But the important message here is that you can get value right away. So with that in mind, I did want to mention a couple of the things that go beyond just this one product or these couple of products that I've mentioned today. And this is if you're going to commit to somebody in a space, you want to make sure that they have the background and the strength to do this for you now and that they have the runway, the experience, the uh, backing to do this well over time. And so if you look at Cisco as an organization, you'll see that you know, we're involved with about 80% of the world's internet traffic. It goes through our routers or our firewalls, et cetera. And so we are, you know, very in tune to traffic patterns. Uh, we've got experience dealing with high volume. We've got over 300,000 customers worldwide. You know, you see these other startup companies talking about, oh, 2,000 customers or 5,000. A, a very different scale there with regard to experience. Um, very different scale there with regard to experience. Uh, you can see that 100% of the Fortune 100 are working with Cisco secure products. And I think that tells you a story. These organizations do a lot of research. Um, you know, they're looking for the best of the best with regard to solutions. And then the raw volume of what we look at, the amount of traffic we handle, the amount of, you know, the example here is malware samples that we scan daily and it's over a million every day. And so you start to add that up over a quarter or a year, and you can see that there's massive coverage here. Um, you know, we talk about aggregated solutions and a variety of products from Cisco, but you are always going to have other security elements. You're going to have other infrastructure elements, networking elements. And so we don't do this as a closed system. We have integrations with over 400 different vendors. So we don't come to a prospect or customer and say, hey, you need to commit to us and then we lock you in or, or anything of that nature. We know that we need to work within a larger uh, ecosystem uh, and help solve the problem that works best for you in your current environment. So that's the overall message. And I think if you simplify it, like why go with Cisco Secure? Why look for your security resilience from Cisco? You can combine many of the items I just talked about or sort of concentrate them down into three areas. And one is to uh, run your business and act with more confidence, to have visibility, context, and threat intelligence that you need uh, to be secure. The middle one is to protect the integrity of this complex environment. One of the things we hear from organizations is they're not a single cloud stack. They want to use uh, you know, Google, Azure, AWS, they're kind of a multi-cloud environment, and we're built to support all of that. We're not saying, hey, you have to lock into one for us to provide you this protection. So we're sort of a little bit neutral with regard to the cloud infrastructure that you use, and we can be flexible and help you protect all of that traffic. And then the last one is, you know, never go it alone or go with a global partner that you can trust. And so this is something where I think I've shown a few stats earlier about the size of Cisco with regard to our networking, our security, our organization support and services. And that's a very compelling argument. And it's nice to know that there's not going to be, you know, with the next little shift that uh, we're going to be out of this business or something that can happen to smaller, uh, less dedicated companies. Um, so I think these three sort of point the picture or paint a picture about why uh, you might want to go with Cisco with regard to providing you the security resilience that you need. So with that, I'd like to welcome you to find out more. Take the next step. Go to 
Cisco.com, Go Security Resilience. Dig into some of the ways that we can help you, how you could get started today, and how you could do uh, security or SASE your way. So thank you for your time today. I appreciate it, and good luck in your journey. Okay, yeah, it looks like we had a lot of questions that we can't get to right here, but David Gormley and the Cisco team will do their best to respond to all your questions. We do have the usual poll for you. We appreciate your feedback on additional resources that you'd like to see from Cisco. And I'll leave that poll up there for everybody to respond. Um, we really appreciate your feedback on that. Um, be sure to check out the handouts link as well. Cisco is providing volume three of their security outcomes report in that link. Based on responses from more than 4,700 IT and security pros worldwide, and it's a great resource. So check that out. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and leave that poll up while we do our next prize drawing. So this is uh, another twofer. We've got a $300 Amazon gift card, and we have another Kindle Scribe. So the winner of that $300 Amazon gift card is Simon Luo from Michigan. And the lucky winner of our Kindle Scribe is Therese Duquames from California. So congratulations to Simon and to Therese. We'll be in touch about claiming your prize. And as a reminder, you do need to be in attendance um, to uh, to be eligible for the prizes, and one other thing that I'll that I'll mention, we like to remind people of this uh, uh, all the way through, which is that each session has its own fifty dollars gift card for the best question. So, um, you know, there's there's one for the Cisco session. There will be one for the session coming up. Each one. So, um, you know, keep those questions coming. If, if if there's some pressing concern that you have, type it in there. Um, and uh, even if we don't get to it live in this, this session, um, we'll uh, we'll share those questions with the uh, with the presenters, and uh, and they'll get back to you. Okay. Well, thanks to everybody who's filled out this poll. I'm going to go ahead and close that one down. And now it's time for our next presentation in the MegaCast, and this session comes from HPE. And uh, this session is especially exciting because HPE is breaking some news here. As a Megacast attendee, you're getting a sneak peek of something that HPE isn't formally announcing until next week. So I'm going to turn it over to James Gallegos, <laughs> excuse me, James Gallegos from HPE to give you the scoop. All right. Thanks a lot, Scott. Hey, everybody. My name is James Gallegos from the storage product marketing team here at HPE. Today, I'm going to use my time to help you think of new ways to approach building and managing your hybrid cloud environment. Uh, this is based upon feedback from many years and many conversations with our customer and partner community. So let's get right to it with some exciting innovations coming from HPE Storage and our GreenLake portfolio. It's becoming increasingly clear that customers are embracing hybrid cloud solutions. In fact, a whopping 92% of enterprises have already adopted a multi-cloud approach. But what are they actually developing in the cloud? Well, it turns out that 70% of customer applications are actually located outside of the public cloud. This tells us that customers still have a need for on-premises workloads and applications. And also VM administrators, I mean, we, we have heard this loud and clear, um, are facing a tough challenge trying to keep up with the fast-paced needs of the modern digital business. Uh, not like they had it easy in the first place, but it's certainly continuing to escalate. So they're finding themselves tangled up in a complex web of infrastructure that takes up time and resources, often struggling to solve unexpected problems with, with, uh, with the infrastructure and even trying to keep up with new application demands. All of this while feeling the pressure to balance costs and budget concerns. So guess what question I always have coming up? VM, VM admins are not looking to have their job outsourced. We've designed this platform to be able to have the operational benefits of the cloud, but with the ability to have the self-management of on-premises platform. Now, not only does not everybody need a fully managed service, 
But for those who maybe need a managed service for one part of the environment and the rest of the environment you want to have your, your hands on, um, here's a cool idea. What if you could have all of the benefits of the cloud, but with a system you can manage yourself? And I'll, I'll use the saying, it's like having your cake and eating it too. We're excited that it's going to actually be possible to do something like this. And now it's time to get ready for this new HPE GreenLake for Private Cloud offering. So this is a new offering that's being announced on June 20th, 2023 at HPE Discover in Las Vegas. And we're really excited to bring this new solution to market. Um, this is structurally how it's, how it's going to look. With this new offering, you're going to be able to easily manage your VMs across hybrid clouds, build your self-service cloud where you need it and when you need it, whether it's on-premises, in a data center, at a co-location site, or even at the edge. You'll be able to take this GreenLake service and be able to drop your private cloud where you need it. And there are three things that we focused on optimizing around. The solution first and foremost needs to be simple. It needs to be resilient and it needs to be as efficient as possible from how you manage and order to how you upgrade and operate the global environment. HPE GreenLake for private cloud allows customers to streamline their VM to infrastructure management across hybrid cloud, covering both on-premises VMs and AWS EC2 instances with ease. And thanks to automation and AI managed service options, you'll be able to save valuable time solving issues that come up even after day two with one click multi-site upgrades, making life cycle management a breeze. Take advantage of the self-service agility for increased speed and efficiency, and it's time to finally enjoy a simpler hybrid, hybrid cloud protection and mobility. And we've created this private cloud specifically, uh, this private cloud offering specifically for running essential workloads and virtual machines that need to be reliable. This means that we're going to be offer, offering a data availability rate of six nines guaranteed. This is going to have also have consistency, consistently low latency and high performance and can operate smoothly alongside important data services like VM-centric data deduplication and encryption. And additionally, one-click intelligent lifecycle upgrades, including ESXi, firmware, and storage, you can have all easily automated um, to save time and, uh, and hassle from your teams. And when you're running a business, you want to be able to focus on your work without worrying about potential disasters. That's why built-in resiliency, data protection, and DR are so important. By using these features, you can reduce costs, lower risks, and simplify operations. Plus, by providing a superior to total cost of ownership, these features help keep your business running smoothly. And this is especially true if you're dealing with a virtual workload between, let's say, tens of VMs to hundreds of VMs that need to be backed up and, re and replicated and recovered. Not only is this solution cost-effective, but it's also super simple to manage and all available from a single console. Finally, HPE GreenLake for private cloud gives you the best of both worlds. The agility of the cloud combined with the performance, reliability, and the self-managed control of an on-premises infrastructure. This means that you can use the latest technology while customizing and adapting resources to meet your needs. Need, need extra storage for performance sensitive workloads? No problem. Need more computing power for intensive applications? We've got you covered. And you can even create and handle VMs easily from a VM level. We're excited to tell you more. Find out more on hpegreenlake.com and also check us out at HPE Discover in Las Vegas on June 20th, 2023. Thank you. Okay, James, great stuff. That's going to be an exciting announcement next week. Uh, are you are you ready for some questions? Hey, Scott, yeah, I'm ready for some questions. All right, super. Yeah, and great. And I'll mention that we've got a poll up here for everybody. This is your opportunity to get more information from HPE. But let's get into some of those questions. So I guess, James, first off, we know some of the details need to be kept under wraps for uh, for Discover next week. So if any of these questions get into things you can't talk about, just say so. and We, we completely understand. 
Um, but uh, you know, so as far as deliverables, this this HPE GreenLake private cloud includes some hardware. So it, it, it's a unit that's delivered to your site or, or to your own data center. Yeah, that's that's right. So being uh, being a private cloud is a service offering. What what we're really delivering is the you know the private cloud stack, really where and when the customer needs it. So this this could be in their main data center and colo data centers and even in the edge. Um, more details, like you said, of course, to come in just a few days. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's I should answer that. Yeah. Okay. Super. Um, and, uh, you know, you mentioned that ability to be, you know, or the, the ability to sort of expand capacity. So is there extra disk or other resources in the box that, that you're not charged for until you elect to turn them on or do you need them? Yeah, what's, what's really great about this offering is it's going to give customers the ability to actually adjust and scale resources on the fly and as they need. So in other words, if, a, if an application has a lot of, uh, storage requirements, it's really storage heavy, um, you know, then you can scale storage independently from the rest of the rest of the of private cloud. Um, if you have a lot of processor and memory requirements, you can scale that as well. So a lot of flexibility with respect to how we can scale. And kind of the best part is then you only pay for what you use. So you can scale as you need and you only are going to pay for, for the resources that you're actually going to consume. Oh, that's really cool. Is is there a sweet spot in terms of organizational size? You know, like that ability to to go up and down. You know, do you, do you sort of have to be at a certain scale? You know, or or you know, does, are there private cloud offerings for you? Yeah, I I would say at at the lower end, it it actually has a really good small uh, initial footprint capability, um, to where, you know, you can even consider. Uh, this this option as you know as something for one of your edge deployments or a, a remote office um, or even across across the globe, so it gives you a lot of capabilities um, you know in, in respect to that. Gotcha. Okay. And one last question for me before I get into the the real questions from the audience and stuff. But I'm I'm just really intrigued. Um, you know, also that that six nine guarantee that you were talking about. You know, how is that working? Is that happening with, with replication to a cloud, or is it is there fault-tolerant disk within the box? Is it a local thing? What's the, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's a really good question, too, Scott. Um, so with, with respect to how we're going – or how we're getting to that 6.9 uh, guarantee, it really is due to the, to the redundancy that's included within, within the infrastructure stack that we deliver. So we're confident enough that that data is going to be available. Um, and there's more details uh, that will be available actually on the data sheet um, that, you, that you'll be able to find in, uh, on the 20th. Um, there'll be a lot of uh, lot of details in in regard to the guarantee because we feel like that's that's it's pretty special to be able to jo to to um, provision you know and get the SLAs that you want um, so you can truly get the best of you know the best of both worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. There's a question here uh, it's a, uh, about verticals. Um, they're asking, what makes this private cloud solution the best option for security-sensitive industries like finance and healthcare? Yeah, so what's what's great is the infrastructure we're using um, has the capability of, of, you know, a lot of resilience type of features, um, such as, you know, the memory and crash consistent snapshots, um, fault tolerance, uh, Technologies to be able to make it so there's no single point of failure, um, you know, throughout throughout the stack, um, and you know, and, and that's and that's pretty much it. Um, and then we also offer the additional capabilities of um, of integrating with you know backup as a service from GreenLake, and the new disaster recovery um, from GreenLake as well. Um, so those those things also natively integrate. So um, you know everything through your GreenLake console. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's another question here about uh, they're they're wondering how does this private cloud um, as a service solution offer improved scalability compared to traditional infrastructure models? Yeah, I I would say the well compared to traditional, um, really what you're getting is you're getting that operational um, value from it being really a, a GreenLake offering, 
you know, you, you can provision and scale as you need to and as you grow. Um, and you don't have to worry about, you know, interoperability, you know, which, which server OS am I running, you know, what type of storage do I need, you know, what type of performance can my storage or network handle. Um, we take all of those headaches, you know, off, off of the table and just, you know, just make it so you just really have to worry about what you're provisioning. Okay. All right, great. Um, we had a question from, from Chad also who's wondering if you could elaborate on the unique value propositions and benefits uh, for the GreenLay for private cloud uh, that it offers in terms of cost optimization and resource utilization, simplifying the management. Yeah, there's a the lot cloud. of exciting stuff coming that's in. I, I, don't know, Chad, if, I don't know if Chad's yeah, an HPE ahead. employee, but that's a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I uh, know what – so what – so the be the benefits here is really that GreenLake um, cloud portal, the, the GreenLake console, being able to have everything, being able to provision your resources, and specifically for this offering, you'll also be able to manage individual VM provisioning um, and VM policies from that same cloud management portal. So that's the big differentiator, um, and and from that portal, you can manage, you know, data that's that's on premises, that's uh, in a public cloud, um, or you know, across uh, across the data center and other places. Okay. Um, oh, Chad says I do not work for HPE. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> good, the clarification, good. Chad. Uh, question here from from Holden: um, What is HPE's approach to supporting organizations in their AI and machine learning initiatives, including hardware acceleration and optimized infrastructure for AI workloads? Holy cow, another great question. Um, this one I can't even tease to you guys other than there's a huge announcement around that topic, around, um, around I, you know, AI machine learning and, and high performance computing that will also be um, presented on June 20th at, at HPE Discover. So you can check that out online or if you're going to be there in person, you know, make sure and go check out that storage spotlight session. Okay. James, I think we're going to probably have to leave it there, but uh, I, I will mention to everybody that in the handout section there is a, a link uh, to the Discover Conference um, registration. Uh, it sounds like uh, you know people should stay tuned, and, and there will be a lot more detail uh, available next week. Okay, well, James, thanks so much. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. All right, and thanks for everybody who uh, filled out the poll. Go ahead and, and shut that down. And we'll move into our next prize drawing. So the, the winner of the $300 Amazon gift card is Abdul Qadir from California. So congratulations to Abdul. We'll be in touch uh, about claiming your card. All right, and let's move on to our next presentation in the Megacast on devising cloud strategies and solutions. We're going to hear from Lacework, and presenting for Lacework is Galen Emery, who's a Senior Manager for Solutions Engineering. Galen, welcome. Take it away. Hey, folks. Uh, I'm Galen Emery, Senior Manager of Solutions Engineering here at Lacework, and today I'm talking about security as it relates to quality. Um, and there's a whole lot of things we can talk about as we go through this. So the first thing I want to say is this might be a little argumentative, but Quality and security are the same. And what I mean by that is that quality is not an add-on. It's not a thing that you can look at at the end of a product and go, yeah, I'm going to add some quality to that, or I'm going to purchase that as an additional feature of, of the thing I'm buying. Um, you know, This comes from the Zen and the order motorcycle maintenance. But the basic structure is what we're saying is that, look, if you're going to build a product, you build it with quality or you don't. Right, those things are kind of true or false as you as you come out of the process, and some parts may have quality, some parts may not. Right, but as we think about quality, as, as it relates to how we build products or build systems, it's not something we can add at the, at the end of the day. Right, so why do we think security is any different? Right, I think that's the first question we have to ask ourselves as security uh, professionals here: is that, oh, what what is it that would make security different? Than, and I don't think that it is. When we think about how we secure software, we think about the ideas of shift left, we think about you know securing the code or securing runtime. Like those are all things that have to happen kind of throughout it. When we build a product, when we build software ourselves, you can't have insecure passwords, insecure uh, hashing, right? All those kinds of things. We've seen plenty of examples of that in, in the wild. But the basic structure is to say, when we want to build quality 
or security into our products, it has to be built in from the very beginning. And this is true when we're thinking about all of the things around security outside of just our products and all the infrastructure around them as well. And so we're here talking today a lot about the cloud. And some of you are cloud native, right? You've been doing this thing from the beginning and you're like, yeah, I totally get this. Other of you are coming out of the data center or coming out of you know Colos or or even managed services like things like Rackspace, right? We can get into a whole bunch of components about uh, uh, what changes, but one of the biggest changes that I experienced as I went through this is the walled moat or castle goes away, right? When I walked into my data centers, I had five layers of security. I had the front, uh, um, the front door, which required me to badge in. I had the elevator, same badge. I had the floor itself, which required me to sign in on a, a checklist with the colo. And then I had the uh, cage itself, which was a key. And then I had my actual credentials to log into a system. So I had five layers of security to get to that. When I'm sitting here right now today on my computer, I can tell you that I can hit any, anybody's AWS account with a single API call. Right. All I need are the credentials for it. So I've dropped anywhere from three to four layers of security when we go to the cloud. And so the control plane, the structure behind how we manage and 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 secure our systems is now connected to the internet. It's just not possible to secure in the same way we did before. Right. And so one of the key things we we lost in this process is that we used to be able to control the fiber. We controlled the line in and out of the data center and we could put proxies in it and we could be confident they're always there and we could inspect things and we could do what we want. And like, you could still build a lot of that today um, as, as we go forward, but, but to think that that's the only way that things are going to change in, in your environment or the only way we're going to be able to represent things in the environment is frankly ludicrous, right? I think I think we we cannot make those same secure assumptions, secure by default assumptions that we've made, right? And we see this not just in cloud security, but you can also see this in IoT and how they approach things with their scalar systems. The list goes on and on and on, right? So we understand like, hey, we got to change this thing. So if we can't secure it by looking through a choke point, what do we do? Well. We got to think about it through the every stage of life cycle, right? Again, thinking about quality, would you think about quality only in production, right? So think about it all the time, right? When people talk about shift left, they're not talking about saying, don't think about it in production. They're saying, let's go think about it earlier in the process. Let's go educate our developers on how to build secure code. Let's go make sure we do some code security scanning. Let's go make sure that we go look at how our infrastructure as code is developed. All those things are really critical to helping us secure things early. We also know that the faster you can fix a defect, the less cost it's going to have to you. So all those things make sense. So we should be prioritizing a lot of our work into that left-hand side of our pipeline, that early stage, getting things into the developer's hands and getting it to where they work. 100% agree, right? But that's not the only place we can look at. We can think of that as a risk reduction component, which is really important. But ultimately, there's a runtime threat that we're going to have to go visualize and understand and manage and, and go through. And if we don't look at that, we're really missing really the actor threat, but the most critical component of the problem over on the right-hand side of our pipeline. So when I think about this, right, I mentioned the word pipeline. It's a CI/CD uh, term, right? But the idea here is that we have tools that inform our processes and processes that inform our tools, right? And what I mean by this is that if you went to go buy a horse, that tells you one thing about how you're going to get to and from work. If you buy a you know, electric car, it tells you a different thing, right? The tool that you bought and the process of what you're going to do with the tool matter, right? So when we think about things, when we think about cloud security, I don't think about my EDR tools. I think about cloud native tools, things that are built around the structures of those things, not things that are designed from endpoints. It's a very different problem to solve securing someone's laptop or workstation as it is to solve a cloud native server or a Kubernetes cluster or serverless or any of those things that we have in the cloud, right? So we wouldn't use these same tools, right? Again, the example I have on the slide is your house's plumbing tools are different than the car's electronics. They're very different things we're going to look at and very different processes that we're going to use to troubleshoot or solve problems within them. By the way, again, uh, thinking about this from a kind of DevOps or you know intrinsic component, we talk a lot about this in the DevOps and Agile spaces, right? Again, why are we leaving security out of the space? We see this a lot with DevSecOps, but I think we're still only paying you know, mostly lip service to, to the idea, we really need to get security involved in the conversation earlier and earlier. And the way we do that is by focusing on the business, right? It's no surprise, top tier companies and their teams are intertwined with the outcomes of the business, right? We see this from KPIs, we see this to performance bonuses, we see this to, uh, you know, how they operate and think as, as organizations and as teams. And so we as security professionals, we need to pivot from the sky is falling. Right. Too many times, the reason why security is not involved in the room is because someone's going to sit there and go, oh, my God, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. Why? Because there's risk. We can't do that because there's risk. Well, here's the reality. There's always going to be some risk. 
if we want to have systems that work, uh, we have to have uh, 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 things that happen here. If we don't want systems that work, we can take our servers, we can drop them in the deep, uh, the deep end of the bay, right? That's great. We're secure, but we're not functional either, right? And so we always have to think about here are the clear things that most reduce the risk for this business, for our business, right? The more that we as security can come to the table with that structure to say, hey, here's the highest priority of your risk. Here's the things that are most important. And here's how I can catch active threats. All of a sudden, we can be part of the conversation. And people want us as part of the conversation because we're an enabler and not a blocker. So with all that in mind, we can start focusing on migrations, right? We can say, okay, we as a business understand why we're going to the cloud, when we're going to it, what our goals are, what our what our uh, aspirations are. And we can start looking at those specific risk factors directly, right? The way we think about privileged user access, the way we think about uh, handling communication internally, the way we think about applications spinning up, all those things are going to be different than how we handle in, in on-prem. And by on-prem, I'm really like, the difference here, I'm not so much talking about on-prem versus data, uh, data center versus cloud. What I'm talking about a lot of here is the structure of high velocity organizations and lower velocity organizations. As you're transitioning to going to higher and higher velocity, we are needing to build more tools and process around that support that, right? And so what we're looking for here is to say, hey, we know how to go fast. Our security tools know how to go fast. Our cloud or infrastructure knows how to go fast as well. And we can all go fast together, right? But if any part of that lags, then we have a problem. Right now, with most of the world, what we see is that the cloud and infrastructure and engineering sides are going really fast but security is not going as fast with them. And so we have a big gap and we're getting more and more hacks, uh, longer, longer detection times, right? That's not what we want as an organization. The only way we can solve that is by security catching up, not by those sides slowing down. The other sides are not gonna slow down. We've seen that for decades now. We see that from the FANG companies. We understand that like, this is going to be going faster and faster as we get better and better as, uh, honestly, as, as a technology industry. So how do we do this? Again, focus on the right tools and processes for you. These are the things that should be designed around agility and speed. That speed is not going anywhere. It's going to get better from a speed perspective, not worse, it's not gonna get slower, right? This is the thing that businesses care about. We care about getting our features to market ahead of the other people. We care about getting our customers the bug fixes that they want quickly, right? We care about being able to A-B test features to validate if, uh, you know, if things work the way they want them to, right? Meta is a really good uh, player of this. They have hundreds, if not thousands of different web pages that each one of us hit and they collect data on each one of them, right? That's only possible because they have a very high speed culture, right? Amazon measures its, uh, you know, its output in, in, or it's, Amazon measures its ability to get value out of its engineering teams in the millions of dollars, right? By, by per percentage output uh, changes. These are the things that we can go ahead and do when we are all working together. And security needs to be part of it. Security needs to understand why the business cares about these things, why the business cares about these, these application stacks, and which ones are really critical. Which ones uh, hold consumer data? Which ones hold privileged data? Which ones, if they were taken down, would be painful to come back up, right? These are the questions that security can reliably and responsibly answer in conjunction with the business. And this is the thing that we want to go ahead and select. And so thinking about those problems, we need to make sure that the, the security tools that we select focus on the same agility and speed components that the engineering and infrastructure tools do as well. So think about this, what are we talking about, right? So as you go through the development side on the bottom, the technical drivers, we talk about things like continuous integration, continuous development. We talk about containerization, going to Kubernetes, developing infrastructure as code, asterisk as code, right? Everything is code, right? You're really getting into anything can be built by code at any moment in time. On the business side, we think about agile development, think about autonomy for development teams. We think about skills, resources, and standards, right? You know, uh, centers of excellence. We think about multi and hybrid clouds who best take advantage of the particular strengths and weaknesses of the various clouds and, and structures we operate in, right? These are the things that we do as we go uh, through the development lifecycle. And as we go through these things, they are increasing the total amount of risk that we have, right? We don't do anything to secure them. There's a lot of pieces that have to happen in order for us to be secure and confident. And with developers moving to the operate in, the traditional structures are just saying, well, we're going to say what's going to happen every six months or every three weeks, or we're going to have a change review board. It doesn't happen, right? We want developers to ship code dozens of times a day in large scale organizations. So we really wanna make sure we, we allow for that to happen safely. And the problem is that what we have right now fails, right? 
breach times are getting longer. Last I checked, it's like 125 days and counting when from when a breach happens to when uh, the defenders uh, uh, hear about it. Oftentimes they hear about it through outside sources. Like they don't even figure it out themselves. Somebody externally says, hey, we found your data uh, sitting on the dark web and here's, you know, here's the information about it. And they had to go figure out what, what, what happened. And the reason for this is straightforward. Existing tooling, right? If we think if we buy like an EDR tool, we buy a CSPM tool, we buy you know a, a workload protection tool, we buy a, a code security tool, all that stuff is limited and fragmented. Nobody has really built the ability to take all that together and put it into a holistic risk picture. So as a result of this, your attacks can propagate undetected. There's a huge component of attacks where they're trying to get wider, they're trying to figure out what they have, they're trying to get access to things. That's all really visible information if we know what to look for. Uh, but it's hard to build rules around because it can be really close to exactly what's uh, uh, happening in, in, the, in, in the existing environment. As a result of this, we have a very high cost and complexity curve to manage, to understand, and, and, and resolve these structures. I have a firm belief that over a couple thousand servers, maybe even a lot less, no single individual can really understand the full complexity of the environment by themselves. Like there's not like we used to have this idea like, hey, we can go talk to Joe and Joe has the full understanding of what's going on in the environment. And that's just not true anymore. It just it just it's too much complexity for a human to handle. And then as a result, you run into a situation where we don't know what's going on effectively. When your auditor shows up, you end up with a very manual, very painful audit where they go, show me the system. Uh, that system died and that we, we killed it. That's it. That's a cattle. Oh, show me this system. OK, that one's here, but it's out of compliance in these ways. Show me this other system. Oh, that's, you know. And we end up this really long, really painful cycle where nobody really knows what the whole thing looks like, so nobody can really attest to it in a, in a compliance or audit situation. So when we think about how do we solve this problem, what are we thinking about, how do we do it, what do we, what do we care about, there's four things I think we really care about. First is prioritize the cloud security risks. Like we have to understand which things are important and which things are not. There's too many items that we're going to see from uh, a CIS perspective, from a PCI perspective, from any sort of you know lens into what matters, what doesn't matter in an environment, or what's critical, what's not critical, is that we just we, there's too much information to sort through it manually. Something has to help us prioritize those risks. Then we got to think about how do we find the known and unknown threats. One of the biggest problems we're running into right now is the speed at which the attackers are propagating. Uh, we've actually seen that our customers have experienced log4j attacks before the vulnerabilities were uh, officially announced. We were able to catch some of those things as a, as, a, as a clear result of that because we're really good at catching unknown threats. Um, but we have to find good ways to do that that doesn't create noise. Because if we create noise, then we don't increase the operational efficiency. And as we get security tights, uh, security budgets are getting leaner, it's harder and harder to find good security talent, right? We, we know there's a, a massive uh, skills gap right now in, in the industry, and it's getting worse. So we got to get more efficient than what we have, right? The teams that will succeed, the ones who are best at making really good use of their people's time. And guess what's not good use of your time? Sitting down and writing hundreds of rules or sorting through hundreds or thousands of alerts. That's not a good use of your time. That's very rote uh, work. But sitting there and, and working on operationalizing, um, you know, getting security into your into your development processes, or operationalizing your ability to uh, uh, do active threat hunting or or red team testing of your own environments, right? All these things are really really beneficial from a security perspective to both the engineers in question and to the organization at large. That's all available if we are operationally efficient about how we handle security alerts and security concerns. And then all those things together allow us to get to a spot where we can get to continuous cloud compliance. This is a weirdly a personal pet project of mine. It's one of the things I really care about a lot. I come from the DevOps side. I care about uh, you know compliance as code. We can really start showing who did what, when, and where. Uh, who did what, where, and why. And what that allows us to do is to really attest. We know what happened to our environment. We know who made those changes, and we know that they were authorized, right? So when we think about these things together, when we think about all these, these four problems we really need to solve, there's a lot of tools in, in the space that, that do things from code security to vulnerability to CSPM. Right now, the, the industry standard we're talking about is CNAP, right? We need a cloud native application protection platform, right? This is the structure of all these things fit into these buckets, probably a few more things as well. But realistically, these are the things that exist. And we are the only vendor uh, who we believe to, to solve all those problems. So. How do we do it? What's the method that we're going to use to solve this problem as we go forward, right? It's really straightforward, right? It's the same thing your, your operations teams have been doing on observability data for, for a while now. Um, we collect the data we care about. We care about our cloud accounts. We care about infrastructure's code, to our application uh, containers, code packages, host data, et cetera. And we comprehend it. 
we take the data and we run it through the structure of uh, looking at what's important from a security perspective. Okay, network connections can be important. Which types of connections are important? Why are they important? When are they important, right? What processes are important? What was important about an application launching? What about calls externally, right? Those are the kinds of things that we at least would comprehend for you to determine what's important and what's not important to look at in the data set. And we empower you with an event. The event says, who did what? What did they affect? When did they do it? Where was this? And even potentially a, why did this happen? Or was this authorized uh, as, as a question? Those are the things we can start answering uh, once we have that event to look at through the, the through the noise of the data. So when I talk about this, like it's all great in the abstract, let's talk about an actual practice, right? So when we're thinking about this thing. I think the first thing we look at here is like, hey, what happens when an attacker accesses a host over SSH, right? So the first thing we can see here is the person logged in from Mumbai. Maybe that's normal. I don't know yet if that's normal or abnormal by looking at this, but that's an important component that could matter as part of my investigation. SSH provides access to a bash session for them. That's all great. Again, this is how operations does it already, right? This is nothing crazy or nothing exciting from a visibility perspective in terms of our behavior on our systems. We see that they then use sudo to go ahead and uh, escalate privileges. Okay, again, I operate like I do that all the time. That's honestly one of the first commands I would run when I logged into one of my boxes was sudo just to get to the shell and have to stop worrying about it, particularly when, uh, uh, you know, particularly when I was doing a bunch of work on a server for the day, right? But now I can start seeing things that might be different. I'm running app git and I'm installing an application called Hydra from GitHub. Well, that's not a thing I'd expect to see. That's something I can go ahead and alert, uh, alert upon and say, hey, look, not only did like run app git, which may not be a thing that I normally run, but like grabbing a thing from wgit and GitHub is definitely not where I'm expecting to see that, that come from. I should be seeing that coming from Debian or Ubuntu, right? I don't see that here. So that's concerning to me. And then we can see that we run Hydra to try and brute force their way into the MongoDB instance, right? This is the structure of what the actual things we care about on, on the box. And what's important here is that if we try to write rules for this, it becomes very hard very quickly. If you write a rule around sudo, then you catch every operator who actually uses sudo to solve a problem in their day-to-day -day life. If you run around apt-get, then you have a problem with every time you're running a, a, an update on your box. Uh, same with HTTP calls or wget. Again, you're going to see a lot of noise in those things. So the only thing we can care about is what happens when things are new or novel in the environment and how do they apply to a security context. In this case, Hydra is new, but it's also security important. That's the kind of thing I'm going to send the high alert on. Everything else can be uh, might be noise or otherwise lower uh, lower importance to me from a regular basis. So. When we think about this, what's the actual result we have, right? We talk about business outcomes, right? That's what I talked about earlier. So here's some things we, we see in our data. We see a 100 to 1 alert reduction. You get one alert for every 100 you get from traditional security vendors, which allows you to focus on the risks that matter the most. Our investigations are 80% faster. We give you way more context as a core structure of the actual uh, alert itself, rather than just saying, hey, user SSH into a box. It's user SSH into a box, ran these commands in this order, and this is what we saw. Here's all the things that might have touched. That's a much better investigation than just here's the alert about the messaging in. And we see about a 90% reduction in manual efforts. So as an engineer, I really care about understanding, you know, where my time is going and making sure I, I make best use of my time. And this really helps me solve that problem. So the four things we care about, again, focus on the risks that matter the most. Understand your cloud to find your unknown threats, those unknown unknowns that are really tricky to find. Make sure we operationalize our tools at scale, right? Really having clear, fast cloud native development processes to make sure that we're, we're actually getting these tools deployed and, and operationalized. And then lastly, a single platform, right? We want a single source of truth, or at least very close to it, from a continuous security integrated experience across our clouds, right? If we have multiple tools, multiple uh, uh, dashboards, multiple view sets, it gets very difficult to really understand the entire scope of the environment. Thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like to learn anything more about Lacework, you can go to lacework.com slash demo. OK, Galen, every great presentation today. Thanks so much for educating us on Lacework. And unfortunately, we're not able to take questions live right now for Lacework. But uh, looks like we did have a lot of questions that came in. Um, so we'll uh, we'll pass those all along to Galen and the, and the Lacework team, uh, so they can get back to you on, on your questions there. We do have that poll question for you. We appreciate your feedback on additional resources that you'd like to see from Lacework. Um, and I should also point out that uh, 
in your handout section, Lacework has a link to an on-demand demo on a page with a lot of other resources. So uh, Galen closed his presentation there with a, with a, a, a link uh, pointed to that demo that, that's available there um, in your handout section. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this poll question up while we roll into our next prize drawing. So we're giving away $300 Amazon gift cards every 30 minutes, and we've got one of those as well as one of our Kindle scribes to give away right now. So the winner of the $300 Amazon gift card is Marcus Harris from Michigan. And the winner of our next grand prize, that next Kindle scribe, is Nick Rakakis from California. So congratulations to Marcus Harris on the gift card and Nick Rakakis on the Kindle scribe. We'll be in touch about claiming your prize. And of course, uh, you do need to be in attendance uh, to, uh, to qualify for the prize. Okay, thanks to everybody who has uh, filled out their preference for additional resources from Lacework. I'm going to go ahead and close that poll down. And we'll move right along to our next to last presentation in our Cloud Megacast today. And this session comes from Okta. And presenting for Okta is Jen Vaccaro, who's Senior Product Marketing Manager. I'm going to turn things over to Jen. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jen Vaccaro, Senior Product Marketing Manager of Okta Workflows and Osiro Actions. And I'm joined today by Mick, who is a Senior Product Specialist on our team, formerly an IT admin and doing a lot of the work I'm sure you all are doing and now has joined us on the product side. So we know that in this day and age, you and your teams are forced to do a lot more with less resources. And in the midst of that it's cutting spending, there's also these major innovation pressures that we're seeing and a rise in security breaches. So today, what we're really excited to talk to you about is how to help get ahead of the curve on some of those big areas through identity automation with products like Okta Workflows. So just to set the stage a little bit, we know that there is a tension right now of needing to deliver great and secure experiences for your employees, for your company, for your customers. And at the same time, we know that there's a lot of complexity involved when it comes to building out your identity and making sure all of those aspects are as secure as possible. So many of our customers, and I'm sure you included, have just a sprawl of applications that you're using, SaaS apps, you know, web HR integration systems, et cetera. And not only do you have this explosion of applications, but also different user types that you have to manage, whether it's your full-time employees, your vendors, contractors, you know, a broad remote workforce. There's a lot that you and your teams have to manage and frankly get right because of the implications can be so drastic if identity is not managed in, in really the most secure way. So how can we start to grapple with all of these forces across the market and across our own internal teams and you know, rises in, in data breaches? So a real key to that is around automation and doing a lot more with less resources, less funding, less spending that your teams can manage. The way Okta has been thinking about automation is very coupled to, of course, identity and managing a complex system with automated responses and triggers so that your teams can manage a lot of the same tasks without having to write a line of code. So our product, Okta Workflows, is identity automation and orchestration platform that is no code. So you and your team can use this basic drag and drop interface that you can see here in the right hand corner. We're seeing a lot of value that our, our customers are, are driving from this. The first being accelerating that time to market. 
we have a lot of pre-built templates and connectors so that you and your teams can get up and running really quickly when it comes to automating your, your tasks. At the same time, we're seeing a lot of value for our customers around improving security. We know that whether you're using PowerShell or just manual coding or manual scripts, those are really error prone and they're only as good as the human that is writing them, maintaining them and managing them. That's where we're seeing a real need for automating your security and automating the integrations and the triggers from your vast, uh, your vast system of applications. And we'll talk more about that automation of security as well. Another big area we're seeing customers getting value around this automation is through reducing costs and helping integrate the tasks that may have taken just tons and tons of resources in the past. And last but not least, we're seeing a real need for simplifying those complex tech stacks. So really unlocking the ability to integrate triggers and responses across a wide range of applications that you're using, which you can do with the Octo Workflows drag and drop interface. To double click and give you a picture on how Workflows is really running, Workflows is based on a simple if this, than that type of logic. Here you can see an example of what that looks like in the real world. So this may have been in the past written through you know, PowerShell or some sort of scripting. And here you can start automating that in workflows. So an example would be, let's say you have a new employee who's joined the company and you know that they're on the sales team. You want to give them access to Salesforce, but then you want to take even smarter, holistic actions around that new user. So let's say you know that they're on, on EMEA's team, the sales team, and you want to then assign their territory in Salesforce. So they have their quota and anything else attached to them. You can then add them to the right distribution email list or the right Slack messages, and then even send them uh, their manager a notification before their first day and a welcome notification to them when, when they join. So it's really that ability to integrate across multiple different applications and start adding that holistic view in a no code way that will just run automatically so your team isn't having to manually configure each and every piece. And it's not just us who's talking about what uh, the power of workflows is. So before we get into all the real meat and use cases, just worth highlighting here that we have had a lot of customers on different segments, different industries, extracting value from automating with workflows, whether it's Slack that saves hours and hours with uh, workflows automation or customers like Wyndham Hotels that were able to reduce their ongoing development costs by 85% due to using workflows and no code platform instead of uh, PowerShell and, and scripting that they were using in the past. Now we'll go into some examples here on really streamlining, automating some of those complex or operational IT aspects. So here are two of the, the big ones that we're seeing from customers. One is really around catching and fixing identity conflicts. So this could be maybe you have a merger and acquisition. Maybe, you know, you have just a huge influx of new employees because it's Black Friday, what have you. Being able to go and make sure that there's not two, you know, Jen Vaccaros on the same team is really important from an identity perspective and giving the user their correct email address, their correct identity is a real common one that we're seeing customers leveraging. Another one which Mick is going to show us a full demo on is being able to take action on inactive accounts. This is super, super important. If you don't remember any other use case I talk about today, Remember this one. So discovering and taking action on inactive accounts is so important because not only does it pose a major security risk if you have, you know, contractors, former employees, etc., leveraging access to resources that they shouldn't that can, you know, cause breaches. But also in this day and age where we're trying to be really mindful of spending, 
you don't want to have licensing costs that is going towards people who aren't leveraging that application anymore. So we've seen a lot of customers take uh, use workflows to manage a dynamic licensing process, understanding who has access to what, suspending them if they haven't logged in in let's say 30, um, 30 days or however you choose to configure it. And we've had some customers save up to 72% on licensing costs particularly for managing Google Workspace licenses. So this has been a really, really hot one for us. And because of that, Mick is going to show us a demo and walk you through how this looks like to build from the IT and, and engineer perspective. Thanks, Jen. Uh, again, my name is Mick. And um, you know, before I hop into the demo, what I wanted to do is um, you know, stop at the Workflows homepage just to show you some of the different resources here that are available. And so here at the top, um, you know, for those of you that are new to workflows, uh, we've got some, some videos here, some workflows 101, some of the basic components that'll get you comfortable with the platform. And then as you progress, uh, we've got some more advanced videos that'll go through, um, you know, some, some more uh, difficult use cases uh, that you'll be able to leverage, you know, some of the knowledge that you've built on from, from uh, building these flows. And as we scroll down, uh, these are some of our popular use cases that come around. So we've got IT operations. Um, those can be related to lifecycle management, um, onboarding, offboarding, um, auditing and reporting, um, Office 365 integrations, as well as security operations. And then here at the bottom, uh, as Jen was saying earlier, these are our um, pre-built workflows. Um, these are going to address a number of use cases and you know, what I like to say about these is uh, it, it's it's more of a blueprint. Um, and just because not every um, problem or use case is a one size fits all scenario. And so you're allowed to modify them, add to them, remove them, you know, really make them your own. Uh, we've got our uh, free workflows training uh, foundation for flow grammars. Um, these are going to have um, a bunch of different modules, starting with uh, some of the relatively easier things, you know, how to leverage uh, text, um, manipulate text strings, um, and then, you know, moving into more difficult uh, components of workflows as you progress along the way. And it's all self-paced. And again, I want to reiterate that this is a free, uh, free foundations for workflows. And then here we've got our new features and connectors. Um, these you'll see in uh, the release notes, but uh, you also have another spot to come to to see you know, what's coming out as far as features and functionality um, that's going to improve upon our, um, you know, our, our workflows platform. And then uh, we've got some great how-to guides and videos uh, that um, our, our community is, is, is building and these are a little bit different than our templates. Uh, these kind of go into some different use cases around, um, you know, how to notify when a user suspended. It, it's it's similar to what a template is, but um, it, it they're just not built into templates quite yet. So it addresses a number of use cases that don't exist in our our template catalog. And um, with that being said, I will go ahead and um, go over the first demo. So. What we're going to be doing here is identifying inactive users. There's a number of reasons why you may have stale accounts in your Okta org. Lots of times admins will create test users for a certain project and forget about them. Or sometimes customers won't use their direct resource such as AD or their HR system to provision contractors. And once their contract's up, human error can occur and that leaves these users active within your Okta org. So that's the what, how about the why? There's a number of reasons why you'd want to remove these stale accounts from your org. The most important piece is security. If these Okta users still have access to resources, but are no longer with your company, that can pose security risk. Another reason is cost saving, not only for Okta, but for any downstream applications these users may have been provisioned to. And so let's dive into uh, this flow. And so this is a, a scheduled flow, um, which is very similar to uh, if you're familiar with a cron job, uh, you can set different uh, durations for this flow to run. If we take a peek here, we can see, you know, this one, we're just running it a couple times a week. Um, you can set it to a different number of frequencies, minute, hour, day, week, month. Um, you can set it to the time zone you're familiar with, and, and then, you know, different days of the week. 
And um, we'll, we'll come to this in just a moment. And what we're doing here um, on the right is we're listing users with search. And what that does is we're giving some inputs and some, some conditions around what we're, what users we really want to look for. So in this, in this card, we're looking for users that have the lifecycle state status of active. And right here, this is the helper flow that we'll be using to iterate over the number, over the users that fit that, um, uh, that status. And then below that, this is going to be, this is, and this is very, you know, interchangeable. Like I was saying earlier, you can set it to 30 days, you can set it to 60 days, 90 days, you know, whatever fits your particular org. And then this one I, I find particularly important, especially as you're starting to test out some of these solutions. Um, streaming records allows you to um, stream up to you know, a million records. And as you're testing things out, you may not want to go through your entire org to find that out. So, you know, what we can do is we can limit that amount. We can set that record limit down to like, you know, 10, 100, what, whatever makes sense for your org. So for mine, I'm just going to set it to 100. And let's go ahead and open this helper flow. And you'll see on the left here, uh, some inputs that we have or some outputs. Uh, the record object, this is going to be, uh, this will contain user data. So in this flow, we're grabbing the user's ID, uh, their last login and their login, or it's also their Okta username. And so here we have a conditional branching this flow will continue to the right here if the last login is not empty. And the reason we're doing that is because if we get that last login and, and it's empty, that means that user's never logged in. So we're, we're, we don't really care about that um, for this threshold of inactive users because maybe it's a user that hasn't even started yet. And then if we keep going to the right, we've got a date and time card. And so that's grabbing the date and time of, the, of when this uh, this flow is being executed. And now we're going to use that date and time and subtract the, uh, time, uh, the, the, the threshold that we're using to determine if a user is inactive or not. And the type of units that we're using is days. If we keep going, um, you know, we've, the user's logged in. And now we're looking at is that last login. Um, you know, uh, measuring up to that inactivity cutoff date, so that, that threshold that we defined. And sometimes, you know, we'll get um, either decimals or a, a, some additional, um, you know, syntax that, that we don't necessarily need. So we're going to go ahead and round that number up. And right here, we're writing to a workflows table. And what we're doing is, and if we reach this point, that means that we've, We've, um, you know, we've reached all the conditions. We hit all the conditions that we care about. Um, they, they, they've logged in and they haven't logged in in 30 days. And so once that happens, we'll go ahead and write that user ID, uh, that username, the date checked. Um, so when this was executed, uh, their last login date, and then how many days it's been since they've actually logged in. And so we'll go ahead and by pressing this test button, we're actually executing this scheduled flow. So if any, at any point you wanted to run this flow outside the normal cycle of when it's supposed to run, um, you can always leverage that test button to do that. And so we've got three records streamed. I, this isn't a particularly large org, um, so we won't have a whole lot of users coming in here. But if we look at the flow history, we can see this, you know, this is the current time that it's been run. Um, we're clearing the table that we were writing to in this flow because each time we run this, we wanted to have clean data. So we don't need to know because we, we don't want duplicates of users. We want to have a nice clean uh, table each time we run this. And now if we take a look at this flow, we can see here's the user, um, the user record. So you can see that we've got a number of attributes that you're probably used to seeing in the, the Okta admin console, um, nice and laid out. And then there's some additional data here that we can always click into if, um, you know, if that's something that you're looking to parse out uh, from this, um, from this record object. And so it looks like 
here we've got um, we're not continuing because they haven't logged in and here we go we've got Luke Skywalker um, it looks like he has logged in we're grabbing the time but it looks like he um, doesn't reach that threshold so it's not going to continue on here and it looks like this user is the same hopefully um, you know that makes sense with um, you know how we're scheduling that flow uh, the conditions we're trying to meet and you know how the parent flow and, and the helper flow are interacting. It's iterating over that list. And if we take a look here, we don't have any records uh, written here, but um, this is, if, if we had someone breach that threshold, this is where we would uh, write those users to the table. And if we head back, I just wanted to quickly, you know, show you how, you know, if you wanted to add some additional functionality to this, uh, let's say we wanted to download uh, the table to a CSV. So we're going to go ahead and choose the table that we have here as inactive users. Go ahead and click Save there. We'll give it a file name. So user inactive users.csv. We're going to grab um, every row that's in there. And so that's going to generate a file for us. And then let's say we want to, um, you know, send an email with an attachment to uh, to our IT team or our, our security team. And so we can write it to um, whomever you'd like to, whether it's IT security or yourself. Um, we've got the file name, and then we drag the file content into there. And so that's kind of what I was talking about is how this is, uh, it's more of a blueprint, these templates, and something that you can really make your own and, and, and help whatever your business process uh, is currently, you know, you can prove upon it, automate it, and, and really make it yours. Um, and that's all I have for this demo. I'm going to go ahead and hand it back to Jen. All right. Thanks, Mick, for walking us through that demo and give folks a chance to see what it really looks like to work with workflows. Just closing up on this general theme of using workflows to automate those operational tasks when it comes to IT. Two uh, examples I just want to quickly touch on are one is now you're able to leverage workflows for really highly time sensitive use cases that may uh, require inline hooks, for example. Or another one we see is really popular is automating your reporting with workflows. This could be running reports on who has access to MFA or who has 2FA enabled, et cetera, and using those for uh, compliance. So after talking through some of those big use cases, let's share what are some of the new uh, resources that we've recently launched with workflows and features and product areas? And then what are some upcoming items we have on our roadmap? We now unlocked the ability for our customers to use a product such as delegated flows, which really allows you to have non just super admins run your flows, but instead empower other admins to run specific flows that you want. We've seen a lot of value through uh, customers being able to reduce the ticketing and all of the, the management from the help desk by having these delegated flows to run workflows. Another big area that's worth calling out is low latency flows. So we recently unlocked the ability to run really time sensitive use cases with workflows, such as the inline hook example I, I briefly mentioned. Another call out here is our connector builder. This is exciting and is innovative in the space. It enables the authoring of new workflows connectors within our no code flow designer. So this is really important because it gives you access to be able to use more pre-built connectors faster and build on that ecosystem. So if we don't have a pre-built connector for you, you can very quickly um, make a connector to your own maybe personal system or just a, an application that we don't have an, a pre-built connector for. You could of course do this through APIs as well if you want, but this connector builder enables you to build that out really quickly through a no code way. 
We have some other big areas and one that I'll mention is we're working towards becoming a FedRAMP uh, moderate. Today, we do not have that for workflows. We don't have that, um, uh, that authorization, but it is something we are actively working to become ready for that audit. And we hope to have more news in the later half of this year or moving forward. And please stay tuned for that. We'll also be looking at more ways to integrate workflows with our customer identity. So all of these that we showed you today are really focused on our workforce, your employees, and, and really being able to automate your processes around those employees. But in the future, we hope to have similar capabilities that you can do for your customers and uh, customer identity use cases. All right, so with that, we're bringing us to the conclusion of this talk. And just to walk through a quick summary, we talked through a lot of areas today. So hopefully you are walking away with this presentation with a few big takeaways. The first is that the time is really now to embrace on an automation journey. Whether you're trying to keep up and scale in the midst of rising security breaches or trying to do more with less resources and funding, automation and particularly identity automation is a really key piece in that journey. Workflows as a product enables you to automate so many different areas of your IT and your security stack. One of those areas is simplifying the lifecycle management and customizing and extending that process. Another is being able to automate those IT and operational processes, whether it's audit and reporting or identifying inactive users like Mick mentioned. And the third big bucket is really around unlocking that automation around security, preventing responding to potentially suspicious behavior is something that we're really seeing value that customers are receiving with workflows. So what workflows and automation can really help you unlock to scale your business and your team? Okay, Jen Vaccaro, great overview of the challenges around identity that the cloud has really accelerated there and appreciate all the details about how Okta is addressing those issues with automation. And thanks to Mick for the demo and to both of you for educating us on Okta. Unfortunately, Okta is not able to take your questions live today, but uh, Pamela, Chad, Holden, will pass your questions along to the team. And Eric, thanks for the high five uh, to Okta on the, the demo. I agree, it was uh, that was a great demo. Now, as you can see on your screen, there's a list of additional resources that you can request from Okta. You can click on as many of those as you'd like, and the Okta team will get them to you. I'll also point out a great PDF in your handout section. It's a quick five-page security automation paper about securing your company with identity-first automation using Okta Workflow's uh, no-code platform. So be sure to check that out if you'd like more detail. And we will leave that poll up for another minute while we conduct our next prize drawing. We're giving away $300 Amazon gift cards, of course, every half hour, and we're up to the next one. So the winner of this card is Trey Morgan from Texas. So congratulations to Trey. We'll be in touch about claiming your prize. All right, I'm going to give everybody uh, uh, three uh, countdown to uh, to fill out the poll. I see some responses coming in there. So three, two, one. All right, we're going to close that poll down. Thanks to everybody who responded. And now it's time, believe it or not, for our final presentation in the Megacast. This has been such a great session, and we've got one more great uh, presentation to come. This session comes from Precisely, and presenting for Precisely is Tana Talavia, who's a sales engineer. Tana, welcome, and uh, take it away. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tanha Talavia, and I'm sales engineer here at Precisely. Today, I'll be talking about how you can take advantage of Precisely's geocoding and data enrichment capabilities for effective decision making. So to get a better idea of data related issues in today's market, let's begin with a recent survey conducted by Drexel University. It was found that 77% of the businesses consider data driven decision making as their top priority for data programs. This indicates a widespread recognition of the value that data holds in driving informed decisions. 
However, organizations are facing significant challenges in achieving high quality data necessary for effective decision making. Approximately 55% of the respondents identified the lack of skilled staff as the primary challenge hindering their ability to attain high quality data. This shortage of expertise prevents organizations from fully utilizing the potential of their data and maximizing its value. Another significant challenge reported by 41% of the survey respondents is the poor quality of data. Inaccurate and incomplete address information possess a major obstacle in deriving precise geographic coordinates, which in turn adversely affects decision making based on location data. These findings highlight the, the pressing need to uh, address the issues of data quality and accuracy. So clearly there is a substantial amount of work that needs to be done in this area. And that's where our company comes in. So we are committed to helping organizations overcome these challenges by providing solutions that enhance the quality, uh, address accuracy, and enable data-driven decision-making at its fullest, fullest potential. So these are the things that we'll be discussing in today's presentation. We'll talk about the root of the challenges of the location data, then how precisely can assist you by verifying and geocoding addresses, then we'll also talk about how precisely does this by a unique and persistent precisely ID. And finally, we'll talk about how you can use the results in cloud environment of your choice and get the most out of it. So starting with the challenges of the location data, the main reasons why companies are struggling is because the data itself is the most problematic part of data analytics. Even if a business has all the data in the world, but if they can't get it to the right people at the right time and ensure that the people trust the data, they won't be able to make data-driven decisions with confidence. So if we look at these challenges in detail, first thing we see is that the data is often incomplete. There are many factors for data incompleteness. It can be different third-party sources, and so the companies might have data collection limitations. Then other constraints like technological restrictions can hinder the collection of complete data. In some cases, data collection may be limited to specific geographical regions or demographic groups, which leads to incomplete insights. Then there, are, then there can be uh, data integration challenges because data analytics often involves integ integrating the data from multiple sources. Then incompatibilities in data formats, schema, or quality can lead to missing or incomplete data during the integration process. Data inconsistency and gaps can hinder the ability to draw comprehensive insights from the integrated data set. There are several reasons, but the, reason, but the result is the same, that users don't trust the data. Then the other thing we have is more and more companies are embracing the power of location to add context to their business, but that can have challenges. Location data can be complex to work with, Multiple data sources, signal interferences, drift correction, privacy concerns, and the sheer volume of data contribute to its complexity. So understanding and addressing these challenges are vital for accurate and responsible use of location data in various industries. So on top of these challenges, computational intensity of processing this data adds up another layer of complexity to an already intricate domain. Real-time processing, data fusion, spatial data analytics, machine learning, scalability are all factors contributing to the computational challenges of handling location data. So understanding and addressing the, these computational complexities are crucial for organizations and researchers working with location data to ensure efficient and accurate analysis. So on the same side, the properties we are working on are also incredibly complex. Extracting meaningful insights from the property data involves tackling several complex challenges. Determining which parcels are associated with a given address can be a complex task as well. So properties can span multiple parcels or have multiple addresses associated with them. So establishing a reliable connection between these address data and parcel requires accurate data matching and integration. So understanding the relationship between buildings and parcels is essential for various analysis. Buildings can span multiple parcels and conversely, multiple buildings can exist on a single parcel. Identifying these relationships accurately requires robust spatial data management techniques and parcel level information. 
And determining whether a parcel falls within the boundaries of a building is another challenge. Uh, this information is crucial for property valuation, zoning regulations, and land use planning. Determining the ownership of a property that contains a specific address or building is a complex task as well. Property ownership can involve multiple entities or individuals. So these are some of the property level challenges on top of the data challenges that we already have. So in conclusion to the first topic, complex data have significant impacts on various industries. The decision-making process can impact business revenue. So it is important to resolve this issue to, derive bus to drive businesses. So in response to these issues, Precisely has developed a set of easy to use capabilities to help businesses validate their address data, help them gain confidence to improve decision-making. So these are the three main precisely solution which we'll focus on today. First is geo-addressing. Our geo-addressing capability provides a comprehensive solution to address related challenges. We verify, standardize, cleanse, and geocode address, ensuring data accuracy and consistency. By harnessing the power of accurate geocoding, businesses gain value, context, and enables more informed decision making. So whether it's real estate transaction, urban planning, or logistics optimization, our geo-addressing capability unlocks the full potential of address data. And we also add a unique identifier to the data to ensure tracking and managing data. Then our data enrichment capability goes beyond basic data by enriching your business data sets with expertly curated information. We provide access to thousands of attributes from carefully selected data, data sets, offering a wealth of information for faster and more confident decision making. By integrating this enriched data into your existing systems and processes, you gain a deeper understanding of properties, their owners, co-tenants, adjacent risk, and more related to the property. Then we have spatial analysis. Uh, it is a powerful tool to derive and visualize spatial relationships hidden within our data. Our spatial analytics capability uncovers critical contacts that may be overlooked in traditional data analysis. By leveraging advanced techniques, we help you identify patterns, correlations, and insights that can transform your decision-making process. Visualizing spatial relationships empower you to optimize land use planning, risk assessment, and identify opportunities that were previously unseen. Our solutions empower businesses with the tools they need to make informed decisions, mitigate risk, and optimize operation. Now that we saw how we can power decisions with the help of trusted data, let's have a look at how we can leverage that unique ID which we assign to our data to quickly enrich our location data. So precisely ID, and we call it PBK, it's a unique and persistent identifier that may be used as a substitute for an address. The Precisely ID facilitates joining or linking multiple internal databases. The problem with using address to link databases is that they are multi-field label for an address location. These fields uh, in the label are owned and changeable and even referenced by different authorities such as postal services, municipal governments, and building owners. So using a single entity as an identifier is more efficient and less error prone than using an address. Thus, you can simplify enrichment, enhance the depth and uh, quality of data, and thus deliver valuable insights for your business. This unique ID is going to give you an in-depth view of uh, properties with different attributes. It helps you to enrich data with property attributes like number of buildings, subunits, parcels, etc. Basically, understanding the complexity of a property enables you to make more informed decisions regarding valuation, development potential, and risk assessments. Our comprehensive attribute database includes uh, geocoding information, location names, accessibility details, neighborhood characteristics, and information about natural hazards as well. So we just go beyond basic geocoding to offer a holistic understanding of the property's location. This knowledge empowers you to evaluate accessibility, proximity to amenities, and potential risk associated with the property. The neighborhood demographics includes income levels, disposable income, and purchasing power, and also spending patterns by category and employment status. So access to such data helps you assess the market potential, target specific customer segments, and understand the socioeconomic landscape of a property's neighborhood. 
We offer a wide range of property specific attributes as well to enrich your data. These attributes include employment count, years in business, business type, and financial information as well. Incorporating these details allow you to gain insights into the business ecosystem surrounding a property, evaluates its stability, and identify potential opportunities or risks. By leveraging these attributes, you gain a deeper understanding of properties and we can form decision and thus we can unlock new opportunities for growth. So now I'm sure that you'll have an idea of what, how, what and how precisely can help your business improve the quality of your address and really start leveraging them for decision making. So now let me show you how we can geocode code and enrich data. So so this is a cloud native website uh, cloud native space is unique in that there are an infinite combinations of environments platforms and applications so as okay. i discussed earlier precisely offers scalable geocoding services to the customers so this can be done in two ways one is on-prem solution which is done using kubernetes manager in which customer can architect their workflow within their own cloud with services or hardware system and the other uh, is SaaS based offering, which is data integrity suite APIs for geocoding. And this is also auto scaled both horizontally and vertically. The product though will be the same in both these approaches. Now in this demonstration, we'll show you how starting from a geocoding perspective, how we can attach thousands of attributes to an address and how we can show the relationship of a particular address business associated with it and the parcel and building associated to that particular address. So basically to one address, how you can attach all the entities and enrich your data. So if you go to geocoding in our geoaddressing module, and if I start entering an address, here you can see that you'll have a list of suggestions based on what you have entered instead of entering the entire address manually. So when I select an address, so this particular address that I've entered has subunits in it. So in the address line two, we'll give you an option to select the subunit of your choice. In case you want to just go with the base address, you can just select no unit. Here I'm selecting an, an apartment and I'm clicking on the submit button. So when I hit the submit button in the back end, it will hit our data Int integrity suite geocoding API and it will come back with a geocoded response. So we are geocoding, right? So we have lat long fields and what precisely here adds is a precision code. So this precision code will basically tell you how accurately we have matched an address. And as I mentioned earlier, we add precisely ID to each and every address. So here is the precisely ID. So to enrich this particular address, we basically use key lookup where key is the precisely ID or we call it PV key. Here is the address information. And if I click on the address fabric, you'll get more information about that particular address. Here you can see we have a different parent PV key. So the PV keys we assign for the base address and the subunits within that address are different. If you click here on the DPV, we'll give you information about whether the address is deliverable or not. So here DPV confirms says why, yes, that means the address is deliverable. Then we have risk related attributes. So we have fire protection data, we have distance to coast, we have flood, we have wildfire risk data. So the risk related attributes usually help companies like insurance companies, telecommunication and retailers to get a better idea about the risk factors about that particular address. Then we have boundary data too. So if I click on parcel here, it will show you the parcel boundary of that particular address. Now, if I click on the PV key here, it will redirect me to property graph for that particular address. And so in property graph, we basically have all the identified relationships for that particular address. So we have the parcel boundary, we have building related information, we have property attributes. So this property attribute will give information about like owner type or the square foot of the selected address, etc. Then we have something called points of interest. So the points of interest is basically business data if there are any businesses running within that parcel, any of the buildings within that parcel. So, 
So here we also have a documentation section for data integrity suite. So if you want to learn more about our DI suite APIs, you can visit the documentation and learn more about it. So uh, hope you now have a clear idea about the geocoding and data enrichment capabilities that Precisely provides. Now let's talk about the numbers that we discussed earlier in the presentation. So if you recall, 51% of the respondent reported lack of skilled staff as the biggest challenge keeping organizations from achieving data quality, and 41% recorded location data quality as the major roadblock. So now you can see how precisely geocoding and geo-enrichment capabilities can help customers overcome both the challenges. I hope this presentation has been helpful and you feel equipped enough to talk to your customers about leveraging precisely solutions. Happy to take any questions. Okay, great. Uh, Todd, a great presentation. Uh, really interesting demo, too. Um, and, uh, and while we take a look at the questions that have come in here, I did want to put up the, the poll for everybody, just about additional resources that, uh, that you'd all like to see from Precisely. Um, but, uh, but Todd, are you ready for some questions? Hey, Todd, are you there? You might be on mute. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Yep, super. Uh, yeah, so the, the first question that I've got for you, how often is the data updated for geocoding? So our point level data is updated monthly or quarterly based on the data. Okay. So it's oh, quite it's frequent data. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and uh, how many countries is the data available for, or is it is it just U.S. data? So uh, precisely, if I say, so the data is available, so the point level data for geocoding is available for 12 countries as of now, and the street level data is available for like 250 in total, which includes countries and uh, union territories and disputed territories yep. as well. Okay. Um, all right, great. Uh, another question here, what are some different ways we can deploy this SDK that you, you were showing today? So, uh, depends on your requirements. So we, so we can help you deploy your, the geo addressing SDK on prem in your local system via Docker or Tomcat. And uh, we can also provide the SaaS based solution with our data integrity suite geocoding APIs. Okay, excellent. Um, you know, and, and uh, there's a question here from Chad just wondering about, uh, you know, core benefits and advantages of uh, Precisely's data integration and data integrity solutions. Um, that you guys bring to organizations, I guess you know when you when you net it out, what are what are sort of the the, the top the top benefits of of using you guys? So, firstly, like precisely provides persistent and reliable data. So, along with this point level geocoding, we do enrichment also, which adds like thousands of attributes to your uh, address data. So, which can help you make uh, better business decisions. Okay, super. Yeah, and uh, you know, last question for you, just you know, if somebody wanted to get started with with precisely, what do you, what do you recommend? So, uh, you can contact our marketing team to get started with, so they can like brief you with how you can like start with geocoding or what, like you can discuss your requirements and we can give you a good solution. All right, excellent. Well, thanks so much for uh, for coming on and uh, and uh, bringing us up to speed on on precisely. Really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for uh, joining the presentation. Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to leave that poll question up here for a minute, um, and uh, I'll also point out that in the handout section there is a uh, a three pager about precisely's data integrity suite. 
um, and Snowflake. So some of the, the integrations there, how they can be used together. Um, interesting, interesting paper. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and close down the poll. Thanks to everybody who's uh, responded to about additional resources they'd like to see from Precisely. And of course, it's time, uh, believe it or not, for the last prize drawing of the day. So we have uh, the winner of our final $300 Amazon gift card is John Abalencia from California. And the winner of our final grand prize, the last of the, the Kindle scribes, is Anna Waddell from Utah. So congratulations to John Abalencia, to Anna Waddell, and of course to, to all of our other winners throughout the day. We will be in touch about claiming your prizes. So were you watching the event today and thinking this type of event would be the ideal platform to tell folks about your platform or your solution? We'd love to hear from you to help you determine which of our hundreds of events each year would be a good fit. Just contact us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. And of course, we have events going on all the time, several per week. And our next one coming up is uh, next Wednesday, June 21st, that we just want to call out. Um, this is put out there by ransomware.org, which is our, our sister site. Um, and it's about exploring the tools and solutions that comprise a comprehensive ransomware strategy. We've got a great lineup of companies presenting on that one, the SUNY, ID Agent, Rapid7, and Palo Alto. So don't miss that one if ransomware is important to your organization. Well, with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, um, I just want to thank all of our presenters for uh, putting together such great presentations and demos uh, and, and all their Q&A insights today. I want to thank all of our participants for making this event possible. We have Rubrik, AppDynamics, Nutanix, Palo Alto, Gigamon, Cisco, HPE, Lacework, Okta, and Precisely. Uh, what a great lineup this has been. I hope that you've enjoyed the event as much as we've enjoyed uh, you know, providing it. Um, and uh, we'd just like to thank you all for attending um, and for all of your great questions. Those questions, of course, really drive these events. So that's going to conclude today's event. Have a fantastic rest of your day.